Good morning. So, final day, we've got a fantastic session lined up, and both our surgeons are in theater. So we're going to start with HM with the surclage, no implant, bone block procedure for glenoid bone loss. Ideal patient, so we'll start showing you the patient details, followed by Hachem is ready in theater, he's ready to get going. Alex Leatherman has also reached there and he's going to do a DAS procedure, which is what we have been wanting to see. And both of these are absolutely big ticket procedures. And then we'll get into our usual uh, stream with the lectures coming in. Some very fascinating lectures today, which are going to cover a lot of stuff that has not been discussed before. And the afternoon session, we've got Ashish Gupta doing another augmented reverse shoulder replacement, the Biomet one, and he's going to share his planning with that. And then post that is our final eighth case. The showman Basam is going to do a fantastic lower trapezius transfer for us. So we're going to see that. I wouldn't want you to miss that because he's the kind of designer surgeon for that surgery. And then, of course, the best we keep for the last. Promise you, I have some fantastic case scenarios to discuss with you. And for good measure, we are going to grill all our faculty, get their opinion on how to handle these complex cases for us. So without uh, wasting any time, let's get going. Let's get into uh, theater now. And can we have our moderators on stage, Sundarajan and Deepak Chaudhary? Let's go. Good morning, one and all. We start kicking off with case number one. We have a 28-year-old gentleman, a wrestler, right shoulder dislocation about 40 times. First dislocation in 2019 during wrestling. Sleep locations, total 12 episodes, mostly self-reduced, no history of epilepsy, no ligament laxity. On clinical examination, the ARM was 180, 180, 40, L1, with a modified row score of 25. Evaluating the cuff, the cuff strength was known to be good, all were five. The anterior apprehension was positive, crank jobs was positive, mid-range instability was positive, jerk negative, O'Brien positive, and modified row score of 25. So that's the crank jobs. And this is the mid-range instability. He had about 10% reduced sensation in the deltoid, excellent enough. And these are the x-rays. You can see a wild little sacs. Double cortical sign is positive. Uh, the MRI T2 axial shows uh, anterior glenoid bone loss with uh, wild hill sacs. T2 sag showing similar images. And this is the uh, CT analysis. You can see massive uh, glenoid bone loss, the hill sacs. Now uh, going over to Dr. Hachim for the planning with Akuna. Okay, out. Yeah, good morning, Ekam. You are live now. Out. We are live now. We are live? Ah, yeah. uh, Dr. Hatcham, we are going to show you the slides for the planning. You can see it on the television and talk on it. What is the television? I can't see. Okay. Ah. Yeah, yeah. This is good morning, everybody. And uh, first of all, I would give a thanks to Ashish, who is a good. Uh, uh, good team, good preparation. So, uh, good conclave shoulder course. This is a big, big bipolar bone loss. This patient is hyperlax and uh, he presented more than 50, maybe should have the location. It's very easy, easy, and uh, without any effort to produce uh, with under anesthesia the patient, this location. So, uh, this is we are inside now. We started in the posterior portal. Standard posterior portal, we are in lateral decubitus. 
we use three point traction, vertical one, as you can see here, to, to have access, full access to the auxiliary pounds. And from uh, anterolateral superior view, I am behind the biceps. This is the biceps here at my left side in the screen. So at the, the this, is a, this is a view from superior. We right side, it is posterior portal. The posterior portal is gonna be in the middle of the defect. This is a huge defect, straight defect. This is Alpsha lesion. And uh, we have measuring, uh, did, could you see the recording, please? Yeah. We measuring the defect. Uh, it's going to be 25 uh, millimeter of the length of the heel sac lesion. Could we see a recording? Yeah, yeah. Fast forward. Fast forward. Give me a couple later. For this, this sector. This sector. Holding, holding your son. Now I try to to release all the capsular complex while they are preparing the <coughs> recording. I want to show you this technique for remplissage, how we can do it. I Going, I introduce my first anchor for the remplissage. This is a remplissage bridge with tape bridge, without any any knot. So look at this. What is here is very important when you feel the tension of the scar anterior labrum, because. Hakim, did you uh, check, okay. the, check the bone bone okay. loss intraoperatively as well to validate your CT scan findings? Yeah, this is a, you, you, you are seeing now, you are seeing now the graft is one centimeter, 26 the length, and tricortical, and I try to a little bit avoid the anterior superior spine iliac crest, and I will put the curvature of the uh, interior cortex of the iliac crest to the, to reproduce the shape and the inconcavity of the, of the uh, glenoid. So, let's go to the second part, please. Scopic, yeah? Go faster, please. Yeah, until the school. So, I can't, I don't like to stay, uh, stop. So, while he is still, I try to remove, release, mobilize the anterior capsule labral complex until we can see Okay, now look at this. What's happened here? It's very. Look at it. I can't separate very well the, the, uh, the complex, the anterior complex. I'm very close to the bone here, very close, always. And I try to separate the capsular labral complex. As you can see now, if I feel very difficult, very very tough, very. So look at it. What we have here, we should cut here. Look at the tension here. So we should cut here. The labrum, this is this is subscap here, this is at two o'clock. So at one o'clock we should cut this labrum here from one o'clock to avoid any uh later, please. Cob later, please. So how come how how much is your release? What is your end point for the release? All the anterior glean dream. From one o'clock to six o'clock to expose all the glenoid anterior defect. So I cut it here. So when I cut here, do you have the uh, the uh, suture lasso and PDS yeah. prepared? So he here it is. I'm above the subscap. Look at see. Look at here. There's a subscap. I cut at one o'clock. I release it. So now uh, no retractor. Retractor. Clean the retractor. Yeah, this one. The rasp. 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 Please. This one. This one. So, I check my, look at this now, it's perfect. Now I see the subscap. I, when I cut it, this one here, I could remove perfectly the pounce and now I'm going to, could I, we see the uh, remplissage, the first recording? 
Yeah, I want to show you how is the big the, the heel sack. So needle, please, needle. So this is what yesterday I explained. Uh, do, you, do we have uh, external view? Yeah, this is the cannula here. So a little bit, three centimeter and lateral. So we go through the subscap percutaneously. This is here. I have a little bit. Well, this is known. Skin. Ah, uh, yeah. Remove, please. So lasso, please. So through a percutaneous portal here, what we do now is to penetrate in the upper part of the subscap to keep away our capsule labral complex. Uh, please, Kingfisher, Kingfisher, without needle. Kingfisher, Kingfisher. What level do you take this bite no, through lasso? Kingfisher, Kingfisher. Dr. Heckem? Yes, please. At what, what is the level uh, at which you take this uh, bite with the lasso? Yeah, look at this, almost two finger. Two finger, and sometimes two finger or two, two and a half. is in the same line with the rotator interval uh, cannula and a little bit lateral. So hold this one, please. Hold this one. I need to hold. So now I try to pass around the suture lasso. Let me meet the moment, please, here. Okay. No, from here, from here, please, man, from here. Okay, thank you. Look at this, what happened. If we go above the subscap, we will have a trouble. I prefer to go a little bit through the subscap percutaneously. Put it here, please, here, here. I'm going, I'm should, I should go there. Okay, now, as a suture lasso is at four, four o'clock, and now, pull now, please, pull, plow. Ah, this is what I need, Kingfisher. We don't have Kingfisher. The Kingfisher is with teeth. Yeah, this, hold, hold this one, please. So now, PDS future, please. I come, what do you feel PDS. about the quality of the uh, labrum which is present? Yeah, it's good, it's good, not bad. Because he suffered more than 50. So we pull back now, and from the same portal, from the same portal, Okay, uh, shoot your retriever. Hold this, hold both, hold both, please. Again, through the same entry point, through the subscap. We remove, give me another, another shoot retriever, please. Another one, please. Don't have Kingfisher man, Artex guys, Artex guys, Artex guys. Not have Kingfisher? Well, uh, answer me, please. <laughs> outside, outside this one. Outside, outside this one. Hold the camera. Okay, please. Okay, hold this, hold this. Perfect. Mosquitos, mosquito. So look at this now. What, what now from this portal, percutaneous portal, we have a PDS suture, monofilament. So when I pull and keep it, the mosquito against the skin, no, our, we keep the mosquito against the skin with attention by pulling. And now we have a big hole here, perfect prepared. Uh, Coblator, please. Coblator. Could we see, could we see the anchor in of the remplissage? We didn't see it. So now we have a flat surface perfectly. Let's go to, look at this, what we did here, this is a huge remplissage. Could we see the recording please? So I put two suture tape 
1.7 knotless loaded in a 3.9 peak anchor. So now, uh, uh, completed, please, completed here from here. So now, hold this one, please. Measure it, measure it, rule. So we measuring before the heel sack lesion. It was a little bit uh, huge, and now remove this one a little bit, two centimeters. Okay, exactly. Let's go to measure the anterior defect. So this is here. This is at five o'clock. This is 25. Oh, okay. So now we are going to uh, mark the center point of the guide for the guide. So hold, hold the camera, please. Hold the camera. Could you hold the camera, please? So now this is we have 25. So we could the hook is going to be here. Yes, enough. It's good here, perfect. So we remove now the... Hold the cannula, please. Hold the cannula, please. At what point do you keep your scale lower down? At 6 o'clock or 5 o'clock? Where do you put your scale while measuring? Are you mean measuring? Yeah. Yeah, it's all the, all the, yeah, it's at the end of the defect. From here, at the end of the defect. It, the defect is now at 5 o'clock. Uh, switching stick. So now here, look at this now. The first of all, I checked my, my entry point in the posterior portal. It's gonna be centered in the defect. Look, it's perfect for the, for the hook. So now, hold this one, uh, skin. We're gonna enlarge the incision from posterior to have a one finger almost enough. So then, scissor please, scissor. We split the skin and split the infraspinatus. And then we touch the posterior glenoidrim. Remember, the infraspinatus is going to be parallel to the posterior skin. So my incision is very parallel. I touch with my finger the posterior glenoidrim perfectly. So now, half pipe, half pipe. So to avoid any damage to the cartilage, I introduce the half pipe above the Bissinger road. Outside, outside, oh, hold this one, please. The hook, remove the, the hook, remove the hook. Okay, now we slide the hook above the half pipe, outside half pipe, please. So now, this is the two laser mark here. This is determines the exit point. And here we have two laser mark for the five offset and the seven offset. I always prefer to put the five offset, so now, it should gonna be here perfectly parallel. So now, come here, please. The camera out, please. Change it. Come here. Oh, come one, one of you, please. Hold the camera. I change it now. This is. I want to see this view, please. This view perfectly here. So now, let me this one. This is a drill bit here. You can see five millimeter and seven. I my choice is always five. I try to put it without. In the beginning, touching the posterior wall, then I try to slide it down. Uh, retractor, small retractor, please. The short one, short one, short drill. Right angle. Small retractor, please. Small retractor. Okay. So now, follow me, please, here. So it's our mark. this is my mark. Look at this. I still, if I put, I, I, I put my, my hook and my flat guide not parallel, I, my exit point is going to be too medial, more than five and seven. So I should put my posterior flat guide very parallel to the posterior glenoidrim to have perfectly exit point. And we can check always. So this is one here. Perfect. I introduce my hook here. I put it down. And now we can measure the length of, we have laser mark here. Now we know the glenoid distance is 22 millimeters because my hook is, is perfectly with my exit point here. A little bit change it here. I check my exit point here. Yeah. And the V 
V, look at the laser mark, the V, it determines the exit point of the tunnels. So now, I like it now, I put it inside the, here, exit point five millimeters, so I'm gonna be down, put it down, I pull and push, now, now pull and push. So it's perfectly 22 millimeters, uh, drill bit, a short one. So I try to do it with the first one. Show me, please, uh, posterior rim, posterior rim. Okay, look at this movement. So you be sure this is parallel to the glenoid. What is the, what is the level of this zig? Is that the center of defect? Yes. This is what I put it, the center of the defect was measuring before. And this is my exit. Follow me, please, follow, follow. Perfect. Chuck. My exit one is perfect. My guide is precise. Second one, please. Now we, in the new jig of, of Farmartex, we have two lengths of the, of the drill bit. So, second one, this is the second one, this is long, exactly. Now, we still, no, 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 here. Here, this is laser mark, so. So look at this one, go to the posterior rim, please. We still go, we can do this one, this movement. So be sure again, you are very parallel to the glenoid. Keep it there, please. So look at this, this is, this is two medial exit point. And this, in this, this moment is perfectly parallel. So let's go. Okay, now we remove the drill bit. And this is, this is open here, we laterally and take out, perfect. And now we should measure again the exit point. Come here, please. This is a three millimeter drill bit. So uh, measuring, please. I need a sitting about 20, milli, 20 yeah, cc. Ready. And cut it, please. Ready, ready. Cut it. Ready. No, 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 no. Ready, not ready. No, no, it's out, out, out. Remove this one. And cut it a little bit oblique, please. This one here, oblique. So now it's very important to measure, to measure the from from the inferior tunnel to the end of the glenoid, this is a five o'clock. So almost, look at this, is seven millimeters, seven, eight, okay, from the center of the exit point. Remember, the shape of, we don't need go uh, to the south because this is, we are at five o'clock, 5.30. So it's enough to start it here, the graft. So seven millimeters is perfect, seven, eight. And then the distance in between is 10 millimeters in between the tunnel and then here, and the upper part is maybe five circuits millimeter. So this is my graph, is 25. And now we should take into account this distance. Push, uh, yeah, no, pull back, pull back, pull back. The, exactly, now. Now look at this here, the exit point, the center exit point to the, to the cartilage is almost five millimeter, it's perfect. And the, the superior tunnel, little bit more, six millimeter. So we should, to have this flat, Flat surface, six in the upper part and five in the lower part. Well, what's happened because uh, from the superior view, look at this, the shape of the cartilage is a little bit, we have two, two curvatures, the distal one, the inferior one, and the superior inferior one, intermediate. This is what happened because the exit point is different from distal to superior. So now let's go to remove this cannula. We need, please, the uh, skin, enlarge the skin. My tip is to introduce our finger. So hold the camera. If your finger is, could be introduced, is it perfect to introduce the cannula and the graft? Perfect, this is perfect way. I can touch, look at this, I can touch 
the anterior, this is my finger. Could I have a marker? Marker, marker. So this is the most important thing. It's kind of out. So now, perfectly done. So now, give me a, mm, a switching stick. Switching stick. Yes, this one. And here. Oh, that's perfect. So, uh, yeah, enough, 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 oh, enough. Uh, blue cannula. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we don't have the. No, 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 no. no. Give me a, a, a no, no, not scissors, not scissors, please. A knife, big knife, big knife. This now, give me this one, this one here. No, no, no. Aye. No knife. Twenty-three, please. I put, I put. I've been twenty-three. I put it here. This here. Second, you have already opened the uh, rotator interval. Yes, I open it. I open it with my finger, and before I cut at one o'clock, and I try to clean it. And Dr. Heckel, please, yeah, not with not no. We need a 23. I ask for. I put it. Yeah, it's because it's it's it's, it's very clean. Yeah. Dr. Heckel, I try to cut the. I try to cut here, this syringe uh, yeah. in in a shape with a shape with a. a as an arrow. Dr. Hakam, you have a question from Dr. Sundar. Yes. So what is the size of that uh, cannula which you are going to use it for your passage of the graft? Yes, 20 cc. The, the cannula is, the blue one is 825. Yeah. Uh, with, uh, with obturator. Now I cut it. Now this is why I cut here. Okay. Cannula, cannula, blue cannula. I use a uh, obturator, but we don't have it now. So I remove, remove this one. This is 20, no? It's a little bit big. <laughs> it seems b m bigger than, than Spain. Do we have uh, f uh, 15? It's, it's, yeah, do you have 15? It seems, uh, in some time, when you introduce again, I, we should cut a little bit the ACL ligament. Uh, give me a operator. Have, have you done without cannula, passage of your graft? Uh, uh, have, you, have you passed the graft without any cannulas? Yeah, in the beginning I pass it without cannula, but now yeah. it's very easy and useful. Yeah. And it's gonna pass in, in, in three seconds. Yeah, because always it's a struggle when you pass it. Yeah, this, this is, is my tip now. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I touch here the ACL ligament. A little bit a uh, small cut to avoid to stuck. Okay, it's quite perfect now. The problem is we don't have, I ask for the obturator. Give me a, yeah, this one. Metallic one, metallic one. Yeah, but the metallic one is short. Not, not bad, not bad. Okay, so uh, give me a wishing a road. Not bad, okay. So now the cannula, no, 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 this is not this one, this one, this one. Yes, this one, this one. So now I change the cannula with another one. So is it 15? Yeah, this is short one. Yeah. Remo a little bit, remove a little bit, uh, the bishing gear, be careful. Yes. Ah. 
Hi, here I am. This is the canal now, perfect. My, so hold it, all the, yeah, I got it, yeah. The problem is I use a blue one because it's a long, but we can't hold it, please, here, this position, all, all time, perfectly. Now, let's go to exchange the knitting all wire now. Now, from the back side now, we remove the knitting all wire and we introduce, help me, please, help me. Yeah, one loop anteriorly and another one posteriorly. Kingfisher. Blue and blue, combo. And prepare uh, fiber link, please. Blue one. No, 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 that's not, not, not this one. Shoot your retriever, yeah. There are one with, with teeth, another one without teeth. So we are in the inferior one. So, introduce it, see, please. <coughs> Sometime we'll release this one again. Okay. Introduce it, please. Introduce it, introduce it, introduce it, please. what we need. Give me a... We don't have teeth here. It's very small. I can't... Help me, help me, help me. Okay, enough. Okay, now... Driver, driver, remove this, this one. Motor, please, motor. One should take the decision. Driver, please. Okay, now we remove our drill and we should exchange. Put it inside here. Keep the camera here. Keep the camera here, please. We should exchange. Good morning, sir. Sir, uh, right now this camera is in which portal, sir? Do you have outside camera? He, he, he wants to know the, uh, which is your working, your camera portal. Your Sorry, I, I can't, didn't hear you. What is your viewing, viewing portal right now? Superior, superior, all the time. From antero superlateral. It's antero superior portal. Antero superlateral portal behind the biceps. This is the first. Uh, now we're going to go to introduce our second knitting all wire with the loop posteriorly. Loop posteriorly, it doesn't matter now. We can change it. And shoot your retriever, please. So you can see the outside view. So it's viewing through the antero superior one, portal. The all is drill is from the posterior one, portal one, Only and exchanging the wire from the antro inferior portal. Now this is, uh, this is the second drill bit. So he introduced the tunnel. Look at what's happened if you don't put outside from your field yeah. the, the capsule around complex. You saw, yeah. Yeah, because Not you are it. using the big cannula, there's a lot of water is leaking out. That's yeah, it doesn't matter. No, yeah. it doesn't matter. You have, you have a pump. So, to care now, to, uh, this is important tip also. Correct. Look at this. Uh, you, before introducing the second uh, fiber link to transport the tapes, you should keep it very tension to avoid any twisted in between. No, uh, mosquito. Mosquito, keep it here to avoid any twisted inside the patient. So now... We remove this one. We remove the second one. So now, please, and now, second fiber link with the loop here. Loop is on. Loops outside. Okay, so, no, no, little loop posterior, keep it here. So. Okay, now, perfect. Now, we pull from the superior. Show, show us, show us here. Okay, now we have two suture link for transport the tapes and the graft. Mosquito, please. And now we are going to, uh, to put the tunnel in the graft. No, we put it here now, this one. So this is, I meant, I, exactly, keep it there. Now, let's go to the graft to prepare the graft. 
I need this table here, please. Follow me with the camera. So forceps. What is the second one? White one? What is the white one? OK, put it here. So this is the first, the first anchor. And now forceps, this one. So we should introduce our graft. Look at this. Do you, could you see the graft? Yes, we could see very So well. this is the shape of the oblique and curvature of the iliac crest. I try to put always the biggest area from the graft in the, in the south, in the, in the, in the, in the uh, inferior part of the glenoid, because this is what happened. The instability occurred between anterior and inferior. So the biggest distance, I keep it inferiorly. I never try to to hold the graft in between the cancellous surface. So now hold this one, this here. So our first uh, tunnel marker, marker, please. So from distal end of the glenoid, it was seven millimeters. So this is seven millimeter here. And then from the articular surface, almost six, six five, six. So here it is, it's perfectly here, in the middle of the cancellous surface, and then one centimeter apart. Perfect. And then from the articular surface, from the upper part, upper tunnel, it's a little bit more, so it's a little bit eccentric here. This is what happened. This is because I should follow this surface, not okay. the middle of the graft. I know. Catch it? It's okay. So that was 5 mm, and the superior one is 6 mm. Exactly. Okay. So now, the same same uh, drill bit. Okay. Okay. I try to go perpendicular and little bit, I can little bit diverge our exit point. Okay. So now, again, I recheck my one centimeter because from some time you, you lose one millimeter as what happened here. So I'm going a little bit proximally. It doesn't matter in the in this sponge, in this in this in the cancellous bone. So now a little bit eccentric, as I said, here and now a little bit diversion no. to avoid breakage the tunnel. So are you using the same drill which you used from exactly. the post year post? Exactly. Okay. Same drill. Yeah. Now perfect. Uh, with, with the antibiotic and the vancomycin and water. Okay, here, perfect. I try to clean it. So now, this is, we should mark, this is mount. This is distal, this is proximal. Okay. So this is the first tunnel here. Okay. Was it in an antibiotic solution, which you are soaked in now? Just yes, now? vancomycin. Okay. This is the first tunnel, and, and this is a mark the surface, a current surface, so. Okay. Now we have perfectly now, it uh, goes, clean goes, here goes, small one. And now let's go to show you, this is the two tapes, circlages, but in one system. Okay, here, closed here, and the end is one, but some two tapes. So we put both together yeah. with the same length. You have mosquito, please. Dr. Hakam, yes. we have another 10 minutes to go, uh, but you do it, uh, you take your own time, but we can switch the theater and we can come back at any time after 10 minutes. Now we have another 10 minutes uh, relay live broadcast for you. Okay. I didn't get this, what, what do you have? So 10 minutes. Uh, relax. 10 minutes for what? Uh, mosquito, mosquito, please. Sí. Okay. Okay, now, perfect. Let's go here. Uh, okay. See. Sí. Now, they still see, seeing us? They still seeing us? Okay, okay. We're still live, no? So, without, okay. So, now it's very important now to transport. Okay, here. We 
that line, no? Hold this one, please, please. So let's go to transport the suture from here. Outside, out, out, out. Okay, hold the candle, please, hold this one. Hold this one, please. Keep it with it. Out, out. So keep it here. Shorten here. Short here, please, now. So graft. So this is the distance point. This is, we are in the upper tunnel. So now here. And now, back to back, exactly here. <laughs> so now, suture retriever, suture retriever, be careful to be sure we don't have any twisted. We didn't twist here perfectly, so. Now we keep it out this one and here. And now we get transport this one to upper part, to posterior penodrine. Hold this one, maintain, maintain please. So hold this one. So now, yeah, now pull. Push both at the same length. Push, push, slowly, 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 slowly. Just a minute, just a minute, just a minute. Uh, shoot your retriever, shoot your retriever. Shoot your retriever. No, it's perfect, it's perfect. Shoot your retriever. I want to check without any twisted. Now look at this, what happened, ha ah, ha ha. This is what happened in, in soft. It's very important to check any difficulty. Ah, yes. From the back. Just a minute. Keep it with tension, small tension. No, no, no tension, no no tension, no tension, small tension, small tension. Separate it, separate it, separate it, separate it, please. Uh, water, water. Push this one, push, push. Inside, introduce this, this one, exactly. Hold the camera now here, hold the camera, the camera. Again. Again. Look what's happened here. What are you trying to do? You are trying to take out that muscle tissue in between the threads? Yes, no, yes no, it's not enough. Yeah. I try to take out uh, any soft tissue in between yeah. and to be sure mm. the tapes is without any twist, it's perfect now. Yeah, so, that, that can be cleared even after graft exactly. goes instant, isn't it? Now, so. we, now we started to pull from back, a okay. little bit, and slowly, 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 go, 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 slowly, up, upper part. Now, perfect, so we remove a little bit here, uh, shoot your uh, uh, hook, hook, please. Very smooth passage. Yeah, this is what, the, if you put the syringe, it's very easy. Very easy, correct. Yeah, and now, look at, the, look at the curvature of the iliac crest. Yeah. So now, okay, now it's gonna be here perfectly. Pull from back, and again, again, pull. Look at the curvature here, it's different from the but happy, okay, go a little bit, go slowly, slowly, slowly. Just a minute, just a minute. 
Give me a shooting stick. So always we can play around to make it flat. Yeah, exactly. It's better to be a little bit proud than uh, medial. So now we look at this here. This is perfect. Give me a uh, here. Yeah, give me a uh, shoot your retriever from back. Shoot your retriever from back, yes. I try to put it a little bit. This patient have very, very big capsule and synovitis here, on this one here. So now, give me a probe. Probe, please. Okay, pull from back, pull. Man, keep it, keep it pulling. Okay, keep it pulling. Perfect. Little bit, the surface is not uh, the surface of my graph. Little bit, a small gap is less than here, less than one millimeter. Because if we look at, uh, this is a proof. It's a little bit here. Here is contact. It's not here. So this is because uh, the shape of the glenoid is a little bit. But this is perfect now. So, uh, hold this one, please. Hold this probe here. Hold it. Keep it there. Okay. Hold the, hold the camera. Hold the camera. No, 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 no. He, he, no, this one. This man. This hand. Okay. So now here. So I'm going to show you now how we manage the suture. Outside. So we have here. Put it here, please. I need some help. No, you, you might yourself, yourself. No problem. Hold this one, hold this blue one. Yeah, just uh, the outside uh, view, can you zoom it so to see the passage of the, how to loop it around? Hold this one. Do you have outside view? Yeah, we have the outside view. So I try to introduce, interconnect the blue one in the white one. Correct. It's very useful. It's lacking heat, it's not pre-made. So now the blue one is inside. Correct. So the second one, hold this one, please. Hold this one. And the second one. Yeah. Hold, hold this one. It's very, is pre made not, so it's very easy to introduce. So now, another tip, important tip, put your finger here, please. One finger here, no, no, from here, to see the camera. Could you follow the camera? So now, I try to, from back, by pulling, but never win one, win each other. So now hold this one. When I pull in this one, in the, in the blue one, I introduce the second one. Look at what's happened now. I keep it always the same length. So here it is. We have same length, same length. And slide down the nut. Keep, keep your finger there. Perfectly tested. Perfectly. Now out the finger. <laughs> I tap the finger of my assistant. Sorry. So now, hold it. You feel the sliding not against the posterior wall of the glenoid. And enough, I can't go farther. So this is, the, another tip is to keep all the, the tapes with good tension to avoid any slacks. This is what happened now. Okay. By hand, by hand, we test this, uh, and in the lab, we reach almost 20, 125 Newton. So okay. now, give me a tensioner, tensioner. So I think it's important to that not sliding up to the posterior glenoid surface. Then you make it a ten, using the tensioner. Now I used four times the tensioner. Why? Because it's the first two times, to be sure, we don't have any slack again by tensioner. And uh, then I make my first nut and then I go for the second, second tape system to tension and lock it the system. Hold this, please. 
So now I introduce here in the tensioner to be sure we don't have any slack. This is by checking two times. This is the first time here. Look at this. We, we have now 40 pounds is enough. 30 pounds enough. Load it, please. Again, the second one. Introduce here, please. Come, there is a gap between the graft and the glenoid. Yes, so, in this case, yes, but this is a small, small gap. If you, if you realize there's a gap under view, now I introduce my finger and you can't feel this gap. And CT scan also can't, because sometimes you, because to, to, to be honest, to have it very, very flush, our graft should be going to be, must be very, very flush to this surface. And sometimes adapt, adapting this uh, graft to the, linear surface without, uh, without uh, touching, I mean, without having both surface under the table is difficult. So in this time, it doesn't matter. I mean, it's, it's a little okay. bit. Dr. Hagam, are you going to do any uh, repair of your labrum? Yes. After this? Yes. Okay. No, no, I show, now I, I want to show you how you block the system. We yeah. cut here. Cut, please. Now both tapes come uh, together. And now we cut. We cut. I'm not here, God, please. I'm not pushing now. So, we make one half hitches. Yeah. And uh, needle holder, please. And the needle holder, this is my post. So, my post now is here, but I introduce again, hold it, please. No, uh, yes, not pusher. Hold it, hold it. My post, I, it's gonna be my post. I put it with not pusher. I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure now I'm against the posterior wall. This one, please hold it. And now my tensioner, tensioner, tension, tension, goes in the half hitch, not in the post. So I, I feel the posterior wall into this here, please this hole. So now I reach all again 30 pounds, 30 pounds, 35, 40. Perfect. And now I, lo I locked my, my first circlage with two half hitches, three and fourth. And now before cutting, I keep it Distance, the same, cutting here. The same, hold it please. Same, half hitches, slide down the knot. Needle holder, tensioner. I feel posterior wall, hold it please. Introduce it here. Uh, so, Dr. Dr. Hakam, yes. I, I think you are in the end of the procedure. Okay, is, it, is it okay that can we switch over the, the broadcast to the next theater and we may come back to show. Okay, perfect, you perfect. Can, you can go, show go. You are what you are done for your level repair Go, please, end. go, oh. please, perfect. Okay. Yes. Thank you, thank you Hakam for your wonderful show. So you can see the big applause from the audience. Thank you. Thank you very much. There's a big round of applause for you, Hakim. That's uh, very finely done. Now we move on to the next OT. Thank uh, you, and uh, thank you for everybody here, for the team, wonderful team. A little bit uh, uh, facilitate everything. Well, thank you very much. For this one. Moving on to case number two. We have an 18-year-old young gentleman with right shoulder pain and instability for eight months. Uh, there were no history of dislocations. History of fall in March 2003. Uh, Batons was 9 on 9, uh, with the range of movement being full. Cuff strength is not to be 515, uh, with modified row score of 40. Anterior apprehension is found to be positive. Crank jobs was positive. Posterior apprehension negative, with jerk test being negative. Raju. Raju Iswaran, yeah, I request Raju Iswaran and Raghavi to moderate the next case.
X-ray showing hill sacks and GBL. So we have the T2 MRI, which shows our bank cards here with small hill sacks with a GBL of roughly about more than 5 percentage. So the T2 axial images, which is similar. So uh, this is the calculation for the glenoid. So we have a glenoid bone loss of about 8.6 percentage with effective glenoid track measuring 18.66 millimeter. The HSI being 14.52, GT more than HIS, so on track. So this is an anterior instability with the 8% glenoid bone loss. Now we'll go, have, uh, go on to Dr. Alexander Laderman with the live surgery. Over to the moderators. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Can you hear us, Alex? Perfectly, sir. And you? Oh, we'll be loud and clear. Uh, so Dr. Raghubir Reddy and myself, uh, Raju, will moderate uh, your surgery. It's really a pleasure. Thank you so much. So, you know, it's, it's always difficult to do live surgeries for several reasons. First of all, it's not always your patient. You are not used to uh, the team and so on. You don't have everything you want. And in this case, we have absolutely everything. It's the perfect indication. We have the perfect team and they bring me everything that I, I needed and I wanted. So I really would like to uh, congratulate all the team because uh, they did a fantastic job. So you, you heard about this story and honestly, this is the perfect indication for this surgery. So I'm talking about DAS for dynamic anterior stabilization, meaning diluting the long head of the biceps to try to create a sling effect and to stabilize the shoulder. The patient has not too much bone loss. He had the consequent uh, labral lesion and we did a good release before the, the labrum completely healed medially. And on top of that, can I have a, a hook, please? The superior labrum is not so well attached. So I don't really believe in slap lesions, but you see that this labrum here, the superior labrum, is not perfectly well attached. So this is really the perfect indication for this type of surgery. You, um, young patient, hyperlax, labral lesion. Uh, Alex, can you show the portals where you are? Yes, so very good point. So we only have three small portals, a posterior one, an antero superior lateral, and this portal is done with uh, from a outside in technique and I want simply to be parallel to the upper part of the subscap that you have here, upper subscap, I need to be parallel. And then I have an anterior portal uh, that has been created here. So that penetrates anteriorly just in a window that is between the conjunct tendon and the coracohumeral ligament. Do you see it? So what we have done for the moment is quite simple. It's Usual, we prepared, so we did a release of the, la of the labrum. Um, labrum is here, it has been completely released and it came back in its native position. I mark here the cartilage, you see this mark here? Yeah. This is where I want to put my, um, uh, my, my biceps, so this is where I will drill. I have one anchor at five o'clock. I will put my biceps at four o'clock and then another anchor at three o'clock. So this is the plan. Otherwise, we didn't have any bad news. Um, there is no associated rotator cuff lesion and there is a teeny ilsax lesion that we will neglect in this case. There is no slap lesion and there is no otherwise loose body, okay? So we check already everything and yeah, perfect. So everything has been checked. There is no haggle, uh, very teeny, it's sex lesion and so on. So now we are ready. So the, we have several goals. The first goal is to cut the long head of the biceps. The second goal, and we, you, you keep as much as possible. The second goal will be to drill the whole at this location on the glenoid, then I will find the biceps anteriorly, prepare the, bi the biceps with a suture, put the biceps through the subscapularis, and this is another very important point. Uh, I, I created, I oh yes, it's already here. I created a split in the capsule here. 
uh, that is not yet obvious. Yeah, you, you can see it here. So I created a split in the capsule that I may enlarge now. And this is where the biceps will come. So the biceps will come from the uh, just below the pec major will penetrate into the subscapularis, exit through this split, and then will be fixed on the antioglenoid. Thank you. So I will simply enlarge a little bit. Now you can, uh, yeah, some more traction. Enlarge, because if you don't cut the capsule yet, you, you won't be able to um, pull slightly, uh, not too much actually, because otherwise, it will bring the, the labrum in front of me. Up. Good. So I simply increase the slide. Uh, I just remove the posterior capsule. And this plate has to be done at the level of um, the, bone def uh, the bone defect or the labral defect. But I think I have enough, it's nice. Very good. Cool, and this is done usually two centimeters below the upper part of the subscapular base. So now, I will so cut the biceps. In every case, you do uh, one centimeter below the upper border or you change according to different cases? I'm sorry because uh, we, we could not hear you you said that you make the opening in the subscap one centimeter below the upper border of the subscapular border. No, between two to five. Fin, if you do a latage, it should be two to five cent, uh, two to two point five centimeter below the upper part of the subscap. So in this case, I don't want to be lower than two centimeters, because the patient is hyperlax. So I really want him to um, to have a lot of subscap that is pushed down. So depending on case, you change the opening. I completely change the opening. And this is why I was really thankful for the team to uh, let me do a clinical examination of the patient before, because so I could have a better plan. So I just got the biceps like this. And now we will move through the anterosuperolateral portal and I will prepare, I will drill a hole into the glenoid. Thank you. So you have to know that uh, I'm not, uh, I'm quite miserable with the scope, meaning that I'm not as good as Hashem. So now we'll take this uh, uh, purple guide. Correct, and you will prepare me. Can I have the, the white thing on top of this? Yes, please, you can remove it. So I come from the anterior portal. So I was saying that as I am miserable with the scope and not as good as Hashem, I want to do things simple. And this is exactly where I want to put my, uh, my drill and finally, you know, so you remove, please, the guide and you put the wire, please. So I have the best team. I have Suman. Suman just passed one month with me in Geneva and this was one of the best experiences of my life. This guy is brilliant. And he will drill all the way, so perfect. Slightly more, sir. Thank you, it's perfect. So. Previously, I was putting my, my hole, I was doing my hole here, so medial to the glenoid, and I was repairing my labrum posteriorly. And I had more redislocation than Philippe Collin, and Philippe Collin told me, you should put your graft almost on the cartilage. You see that I, 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 I did a small hole in the, enfin, I will rim something like two millimeters of the cartilage, and. I think that this is the key to avoid redislocation. So you need to be quite posterior. Perfect, sir. Thank you. And then you see, have a look to the direction of the drill. We are drilling down. What does it mean? It means that we are drilling far away from the suprascapular nerve, and there is no neurological risk with this surgery compared to the latage where you drill up and you go in direction of the suprascapular nerve. Drill, and he will drill all the way. 
continue. Perfect. Thank you. Then I will simply, you can remove everything. Well done. So you have drilled bicortically through and through the... Bicortically because I want to push two centimeters of the tendon into the glenoid. And if I don't drill bicortically, uh, this is going very difficult. So I just drill everything all the way. Now I will clean the hole. And clean well because this, otherwise you won't be able to introduce the bicep. The bicep introduction is not an easy step of this surgery. So I think that this hole has really to be cleaned properly. Yes, thank you. Good. So now I'm happy. I will move anteriorly. I will remove this loose body if I can. Oops, it's moving. Okay. I will probably find it later. No, no problem. So, and then, so you, you need to find the bicep just above the pectoralis major. Magic, please. Ah, oh, this body is here. Don't wait. Oh, combo, combo grasper. Now we stop. Uh, the red one. Uh, you don't have it. Yeah, maybe this one. Perfect. It went away again. Okay, no big deal, it's me because I just removed the... Perfect, so... Yeah, combo rasper. Here it is. So I would love to get rid of this small piece of bone. This is done. Then I will take the magic and I will find the biceps and pull the biceps initially out of the bicipital groove and then through the anterior portal. So the lower you go, did you put some internal rotation? Yeah. Okay, not too much. Maybe it's too much. So you just need to feel your bicep at this level. So you see the biceps is here. I will grab it and put it out of the bicipital groove. Alex, any tips to do this as cleanly as you have just demonstrated? Uh, yes, you need to, to be low or because you have all the vascularization um, along the bicipital groove and if you start to open the groove from superior to inferior, you will have some bleeding. So this is why I simply do it this way, uh, clamp. This may be great. And then you just take a clamp and grab, you grab your biceps. At this moment, uh, Sumant will flex the elbow, so it decreases the tension, and it may help me to bring the bicep to the skin where it will be prepared with a suture. Or the clamp, please. So, Alex, how easy is this to do in the lateral decubitus position? Obviously, you're doing it in the beach chair where you have the luxury of flexing the arm, uh, but in the lateral decubitus, do you think it can be done uh, with relative ease? Um, it's a good point, sir. Um, I'm not sure that this will be more difficult. It's just a question of habit. So if you are used to lateral decubitus, uh, my advice is to, um, to continue like this. So you see the biceps. I just put a clamp and I will prepare two centimeters. The fiber loop, please. Raju, I started my DAS in B chair, but I do all of them in lateral because I'm more comfortable doing the labrum repair in lateral, but uh, to each his own. But what is important is the labrum repair is also equally important in DAS and Hutchins Oops. surgery. So you can't rely on the bone block and uh, DAS to do what it needs to do. 
how you modify the assist, your technique in lateral pull? My your tips is pretty much the same. Uh, there is no need to modify anything. Uh, the portals are absolutely identical. In fact, the drill passage is even more easier. Uh, it's not an easy surgery because you have to go outside the joint and find the biceps and also you need to get used to the biceps anatomy. Uh, for those who do Athalata and the AC joint, they are used to doing a soft tissue. So it's not as difficult. So I have a question. There is also a described double pulley only technique for the biceps tendon where you are not doing a tenodesis like Dr. Lieberman is doing. Yeah. Uh, I would like to know your thoughts and uh, Dr. Alexander's thought on that. Um, it's a very elegant technique, uh, completely anthroscopic, all inside. Double pulley. Yeah. Double pulley and it has been proposed by Anna and Clara. That did a good job. They have unbelievable results. They send me their, they send me their tables, and it's really nice. So, I really encourage you to, to try. Um, I like the the inlay technique because you will see that I, I have an unbelievable fixation, and this allowed me to have a faster re rehabilitation. Anna and Clara are immobilizing their patient for quite a long time, and I don't do this, but. A try. I mean, they did a good job, and it's really worth. Could you remove your clamp now? It's really worth to try. So I have a good fixation now. We will remove the needle. Can I? Could you cut this? And then you gi you give me a, a, a scissors because perfect. Just scissor like this. So now you make sure that your biceps is quite thin. Otherwise, it won't penetrate, it won't go through the, the subscapularies, first of all, forceps. Could you hold this one, please, sir? And second thing, it's not going to enter into the glenoid. Okay, I think I like it. I like it. It's very nice. Good. So. The next step, magic, I will push this between the conjunct tendon and the subscapularis. So we go back into the joint. And we have here the joint. We have here the subscap. And I need to push this biceps and the suture between the subscap and the conjunct tendon. Could you hold this, sir? Now I will push a little bit and you should see the... Could you hold the camera? We should see the biceps coming. Two biceps is here. And make sure that you don't have any interposition. You see that I have one here. So at this level, you, you need to make sure that everything is smooth and perfect. Yeah, good. I prefer this. So just grab the sutures, push your biceps between. Oh, I have. Okay, perfect. Hold this like this. So, subscapularis, biceps, conjunct tendon, here. I go inside the joint and I will take a clever hook, the green one. Thank you. Through the posterior portal, I introduce this clever hook. At this moment, Sumant may put some uh, external rotation. It's very slight. You need to be lateral to the labrum, and you need to be to pass into this uh, window that I created into the capsule. So now my clever rook is through the subscapularis. I move above the subscapularis, and I will try to find. Could you this? Could you hold this, sir? to find my clever hook and simply to grab the two sutures. So, all this cement. 
So this is, um, I have here the upper part of the sub cap, so I should be not too far away. Yes, I'm here. So hold this again, cement, we need to do this this piece of clavier, then to pectoral fascia there. So I need to bypass one more time. Hold this like this. Yes. And Sumant, he really is pushing. I'm here. I'm here. And I will try to, I need to grab the two sutures at the same time. So I have one here and two. And now, Sumant will retrieve his, his instrument. So, one more time. Congen tendon, um, long head of the biceps, subscapularis. I have my instruments that go through the subscapularis, and I will pull this suture through the posterior portal. From time to time, they don't come all at the same time. So, I will, I'm, and you see that the biceps is already into the joint, okay? Yeah, Can you see the biceps? Very cleverly done, Alex. Lovely. So, now I simply need to take the second suture. Oh, it's not even necessary, you know, guys, because it's perfect. Okay. Remember that I told you yesterday, we will keep the biceps under tension. And now, Sumant will hold the elbow and do forced internal and external rotation to create automatically the split. So we push the biceps and we create automatically the split. It's done into the muscle. So automatically the muscle fibers will just spread. And we did a cadaver study, did some measurement, and we have a, the, a length of the split that is, it's a mean of 20 millimeters. That will not limit postoperative external rotation. Thank you so much, guys. So now, through the rotator interval, and this is important. You saw Hashem, it's a complete, complete different philosophy because I do everything through the rotator interval. Why? Because I think it's safe. It really allows me to remove the, everything posteriorly, please. Okay. So now we'll bring the two sutures from the biceps through this portal. Everything. Take them, one, two, yes, please. And I will show you the path of the biceps one more time, just to make sure that everything is, is clean. So you have the conjunct tendon. You will find now the biceps here. Can you see the biceps? Uh, yes. The biceps is entering into the subscapularis. There. Yes, we can see that. Then it is into the joint, and from the joint, it's here. From the joint, it's exiting through the rotator interval. Yes, that's very okay. beautifully seen. Perfect. Could you hold the camera, so please? No, I will load a swivel lock. Can we have the, the swivel lock? Uh, 5.5, please, this one, yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I already checked, madam. Thank you so much. Next step, the goal is to push two centimeters of the biceps to the glenoid and to fix it with the sweep lock, trying to put the sweep lock posteriorly. For me, it makes more sense to have the anchor posteriorly, or for the anchor medially and the biceps laterally. It's not always easy, but I will try. Now, Jack, so you load your two sutures. Keep this, please. We will use it with the cord cutter. So, I have here my biceps. Sumant is flexing, he, is, um, he, put, he keeps the elbow in, into flexion. Could you hold the camera, sir? And now I don't try to, to put right away your, your biceps. Yes, exactly. I will. 
And if it's too small, just re-drill a little bit, okay? Because it looks quite difficult to make it enter like this, so I will try differently. If I don't succeed, yes, please put on this future. So, do you see any more uh, stitches on the biceps? Oh, uh, yes. Or more, yeah, on the biceps, no. And it means that I put everything that I wanted into the glenoid hammer. Mallet. And now we just fix it. And it's a very strong fixation. Lovely. So you make sure that you push enough. And I'm happy, guys. I'm happy. Yes. So I will remove this. Very well demonstrated, Alex. I will cut now the sutures. And interestingly, you can even, you know, keep the... Um, uh, huh? Yeah, okay, it's fine. It's an open one. You can even keep the suture from the, from the anchor to, um, uh, to repair your labrum. This is a possibility. Don't, don't remove it yet because we may keep it to repair the, the labrum. It really makes sense. Good. Good, good, good. So first thing, second thing. Just one more, one more time. Congen tendon, biceps is right here. Yeah. It penetrates into the subscapularis and finally is well fixed in front of the glenoid. It's very beautifully seen, Alex. And we will simply now repair the, the labrum switching stick. So I move again through the posterior portal. And then it's, you know, it's a very simple bone cart repair. So for somebody like me that is really miserable with the scope, I think that this technique is, is quite safe. Um, it's safe, it's easy, and relatively efficient because it really increases. And it, it, this has been shown by biomechanical studies. It, it really increased um, uh, the stability of your shoulder, the postoperative stability of your shoulder. So you see the biceps entering here, and now we will put one anchor there to reattach the, the labrum and another one there. Alex, you have another 10 minutes. Sure, but uh, I heard, uh, I will do it, but I heard that Hashem was not finished, so if you want to move them again and we can just come for a final view at the end, I'm, I'm, I'm also happy. Oh, we, can, we can do that. We'll just come to you for the final view and we are just going to hatch him, uh, just going to switch over to the other theater. Lovely, thank you. So. Okay. How are live? So uh, we are now, we reattach. Uh, could you hear me? Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Hachim, there's a change of moderators for you. This is uh, Raju and Raghuveer moderating you instead of okay. uh, Sundar and Dr. Deepak instead. Okay. So now we, no, suture retriever. We uh, put two anchor at five here. Look at this, the first one here. This is, this is almost it's six o'clock. I put to five o'clock. Uh, distal to the first uh, to the first distal tunnel, then uh, another suture here to reattach the capsule in between the inferior and superior tunnel, and then with a third anchor here is in the upper part of the graft. And the last one at one o'clock. So now hold the, hold the camera. So we transport now, and I retrieve my suture tape from back to uh, produce a tape circlage 
a tape, a tape bridge for ring precise. Sorry. Can't see here. Yeah, now I have a light. Did you do uh, rimplissage anchor fixation? Yes, in the beginning, but we, I didn't show you. I don't know if we can go back in the recording no. first we, to show you how I, make, how I made my first anchor. No, no, second anchor of rimplissage is done or not? No, 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 not done, not done, still not done. Look at this, this the second anchor now, the third anchor, is a little bit low to the upper subscap. That means it's at three o'clock. I'm going to put the, first, the last anchor at two o'clock. So this is here, suture transport, the thin one. The thin one is my loop. Hold the camera, please. Load it. I put all this anchor from the same portal. Could you see outside? Yes, yes. This is the same portal uh, which wa uh, was used for the suture transport, the PDS suture. Hold, please. Suture receiver. It's very important for me the proprioception of the patient. Uh, this is why we reattach the capsule always. This is the capsule here. So now, hold the camera here. Hold the camera here. So now, I pull again. Perfect. So, not pusher. This patient has very, very, very hypertrophy of the capsule and uh, was like, uh, this is perfectly done here, exactly. This is a third reattachment of the capsule and now we cut it. Tension, please. Tension is exactly. Okay, now, last anchor. Uh, can you show the rimplissage before you put this anchor? Yes, I'm going to rimplissage. So that we might switch to other theaters. Yeah, look at this. I, this is here my first, this is, look at the, the heel sack, it's a huge heel sack. Now it's very difficult to see because, because look at this, from here, this is almost two thirds up and one third down to the cartilage. So I, I didn't feel all the rimplissage. If you feel, because we measured 26 millimeters, 26 is almost as the same as the diameter of the glenoid. So if you feel all this, if you put your anchor here at uh, close to the cartilage, you will lost through external rotation. So it's enough if we restore the glenoid side, you don't have bipolar bone loss, only heel sac. So your heel sac now, it's come from off track to uh, on track. Feeling almost two thirds, this is anchor with two tapes. So now look at what's happened here. Dr. Hatchem, you have a question from Dr. Deen Shah. Yes. Deen Shah. when you're taking your drill tunnels for the bank cart, yes. how do you make sure that you're not uh, causing any damage to your tape for the bone block? Exactly. Two T-tips. Two, two, two I put a marker in the tunnel. So my uh, drill uh, sleeve, I put it lower than the first anchor the first tunnel because it's uh, distal to the mark, uh, marker line. So, and the second one in between two marker and the third one upper to this, the first marker line. So this is, this is what I'm sure. The second thing, it will, it's, it sometime will be happening, it doesn't matter because we didn't use a drill. We use a key wire. So like if the key wire goes through the tapes, it doesn't that damage because the key wire was suture tape with uh, fiber tape, it doesn't matter. 1.8 suture tape goes through 2.0 fiber, fiber tape, it doesn't matter. I mean, in cases, if you can't see your marker and your tunnel. Thank you. Catch it. And then, sir, and he does all this, uh, passing the guides through the subscribers portal. Yeah, this is one, this one, it's two fingers. So they are parallel to the drill tracks. Yeah, it's, look at this, it's a, I mean, it's, it's not, not too deep. This is axilla here. If my direction is here, but in this way, give me a switch, this, is, this one. Look at this. This is two finger below the rotator interval. 
So if you go in this direction, you go to the axillary nerve. But in this direction, should gonna be. This is the direction. So it's so, uh, almost to following following my my scope. So it's very safe. And uh, now I'm going to introduce the last. Look, look at this. Give me a three sleeve. Yes, yeah, sleeve, sleeve. Yeah. Sleeve, sleeve. Yes. So from here, I introduce it and go. Now look at this. I'm a little bit above the subscap, above the subscap. But if you can go, you can go here. But this is for the inferior anchor. I put it here, through the subscap, one centimeter and a half. Enough. So it's very safe. Uh, so sir, now, sir, in uh, excuse, me. sir, I have a question, sir. Sir, in case of uh, bipolar boneless when the lethargy is done, they say that. If you do lethargy, there is no need to do uh, remplissage. Uh, is that the same case here because remplissage is being done along with the bone block? Uh. So Dr. Hatchem, did you get the question? Uh, yes, yes, I get it. I get it, but what happened is, in, this is a few, not, not very frequent, this is very rare case. I, I, I mean, cases with a huge bone defect anteriorly and a huge heel sac, it, it's, I only, seen that in, uh, in seizure patient, because the seizure patient has very, very big heel sac and big glial defect. But this is the same case. I've never measured 25 millimeters. I hope we can see the recording. Yeah. Yeah, we saw that. Uh, it's a big hill sac, nearly the same diameter as glenoid, and that's why you elected to do a remplissage. Exactly. If you remember, a 25 millimeter, 25 millimeter, and if you have a diameter of the glenoid 24, 25, that means you, your hill sac is always off track, always, or peripheral track at least. Lasso. Hashim, I just have a question. Uh, in two of my cases, uh, I, I use two screws for the iliac crest graft. These are for revision ladder jays. And I had to go back in both of these patients because the screw heads were prominent and they were rubbing on the subscap. But what I noticed when I went back is that the, the surface of the iliac crest was completely covered with fibrous cartilage. It looked completely white. So I don't ever repair the labrum uh, anyway after a Lattage or the iliac crest graft. Uh, do you think that uh, the labral repair adds a lot more to this and you might be sacrificing chondral surface which might form or do you think, I'm just asking your opinion here because I don't have an answer. Yes, for my opinion, from my point of view, I always reattach the capsule. We don't have, I mean, we should do a, a RCT trial to one cases with reattachment, cases without reattachment to find, for me, it's, it's like a slim effect and the scene effect is for apprehension and stability, subjective, subjective instability. Uh, this is my feel. There are many, many papers about uh, burning and without the attaching the, the labrum after latter or after bone block. But in this case, uh, it, it, I, it's very useful for me. It, it took time a little bit, uh, a new bunker, which is a fourth anchor now. But uh, I, believe, I believe it. I don't know if I answered your question, Ashish. Yes. He's nodding his head. I think before we switch to the other theater, Hakim. Hakim. Yes. You said that you do the second rimpissage anchor, you will do in uh, external rotation, neutral or internal rotation? Good question. Yesterday I put my drawing uh, illustration about that. I believe if you put, uh, if you're anchor is introduced from lateral to medial and not close to the cartilage, you can put it the arm in internal rotation. If you put your arm in, in external rotation, you should take care and put your, uh, your, your anchor a little bit more uh, posteriorly. It depends from, from the vision of you have about uh, the introduction of the anchor. So in my case, I prefer to put it a little bit in, in, in internal rotation as the arm, because the, in this case, the capsule is going going uh, through the, uh, the uh, heel sac lesion. And then the anchor goes laterally. So I'm finished now the reattachment of the capsule. And I let, I, I let me show you the heel sac. So take out this one. So now the heel sac is here. So what's happened now, I remove this uh, I, cannula. Look at this. When I pull from here, 
is very centered now. The head is very centered. And now, when I pull, when I pull here from, look at it, what's happened. Ah, very synovitis. When I pull here, I close, put it a little bit, accelerotation. Give me a, give me a, something to pull. Uh, this one, this one, this is, this. Yes, this is. Uh, uh, Hachim, we are going to shift the theater. Just tell me what you want to do. I'm going to put the second screw for the uh, remplissage. Yeah, means uh, you want to put with a uh, push lock anchor. Yeah, no, it's a, sw sw a swivel lock, 3.9. Yeah, swivel lock anchor. This is, hold this one, look at this. So hold, we are pushing now the posterior capsule. And now, this is, this is a suture tape, comes from inferior anchor. But the tapes now is above the infrastrinatus and put it, look at this. I put the second anchor here. And what's happened, I close, okay, this is one. I, by pulling now from the superior anchor, but didn't put it now. So this is here, this is the first anchor, I put it here. Can you see the first anchor here, the direction? Yes. The from lateral? To medial, how is this one? There are two different and, portals. Okay, exactly, two different portals. This is a basic portal, this is a standard posterior portal. And this one is a uh, posterior inferior percutaneous one. So give me an anchor, uh, the second anchor, to show him the anchor. So I load now, I load these two tapes in the second anchor, and you can go further. So here I put two tapes in this anchor here, Shoot your tape without any knot. Okay. So I'm going to, this is one. This is what happened now. Hold ten, tension, tension the tape, shoot your tape, tension the tissue tape. So what happened now? Why well, shouldn't I lose this one? Catch it? Yes. Okay. So let's go. Give me a uh, punch. Punch, uh, needle pin. No, keep, keep it there, keep it there. Uh, Dr. Hatchem, with your permission, we are going to switch uh, to Alex's okay, uh, okay. surgery. Perfect. And, uh, we have uh, really enjoyed this excellent demonstration so far. If time permits, we'll again get back to you. Uh, otherwise, uh, uh, please accept our appreciation for a very wonderfully demonstrated uh, complex procedure. Okay, thank you, thank you. This is one here, perfect. This is it. Uh, Alex. Yes, yeah, so thank, thank you. Do you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah, so thank you for coming back to see this very easy uh, surgery compared to HM. So this is the final result you have here, a nice bump created. So you even see the retentioning of the inferior glenoium ligament, the bumps created with the labrum. This is the long head of the biceps that comes firmly and just stabilize the, the human head entirely. And we use uh, the, the suture of the swivel lock to uh, then fix the, the superior labrum. So something quite, quite easy, quite strong. Um, I would like to thank all the team here because it, uh, the, the team has been unbelievable. The anesthesiologist has been great with a very low uh, blood tension. So thank you so much uh, to all of you and I can't wait to see you in a few minutes. Thank you so much, uh, Alex. Beautifully demonstrated. We really enjoyed every minute of your surgery. Thank you very thank much. Thank you so much. Bye bye guys. Is it okay to demonstrate the dynamic effect of the biceps? If at all we have seen it, fix it in different movements of the arm. Alex, did you get the question? Uh, uh, do you generally check for uh, the effect of the sling immediately after fixing or you think that it will happen on its own once the biceps uh, heals? I just do it post postoperatively as asking my patient to move. This, this is, and could, could you just, can you see the external view of the shoulder? Yeah. Yes, okay, can, do you see this? This? Yeah. Yeah, it's called a tsunami of joy. It's a very interesting concept that I wanted to teach you, the tsunami of joy. See you in a few minutes. <laughs> Thank you very much, Alex. We'll uh, now go on to the main hall for the lectures. Thank you. So I take great pleasure in inviting my co-moderator, Dr. Raghavir, to speak on uh, transosseous and uh, transosseous hybrid rotator cuff repair. Good morning. Friends, I thank Ashish for giving this invitation. Transosseous uh, technique is po becoming popular uh, these years because it is cheaper. And if you use a simple suture technique, it is easy. And there is more biology and revision surgery is much easier. 
these articles mention when you compare transosseous with equivalent initial post operative pain is less and there is more blood flow and the final post operative strength is more and there is less type 3 tendon healing in transosseous method this is a sugaya classification that is the type 1 and this is a type 3 healing with the anchor the suman studies there is more type 3 healing in single row group when compared with transosseous method and this is a historical perspective of uh, arthroscopic transosseous instrumentation. This study by Bukhart in 97 has given step back in, uh, for this method, where he used the shorter bony tunnels and bone is to fail, and anchors tendon is to fail. But present generation arthroscopic transosseous, we no, middle tunnels made, normally we place the middle row anchor, and lateral tunnel is made in the hardest bone, the large bony bridge. And these two intersecting tunnels are made in different plane, and this loaded vicral loop is pulled out and passed the three sutures of your choice, and this is like a triple loaded anchor is being placed. So I learned this technique in 2009, and we bought with instrumentation, but it has been withdrawn from market for other reasons. Striker is launching this year, our Tonya group. So this Kumaran studies has said that there is higher uh, ultimate failure load strength in transosseous equivalent when compared to transosseous, but there is type 2 tendon failure at myotonious junction in transosseous equivalent. So clinical relevance is revision surgery is difficult because fails at middle row anchors. These are the, some of the concerns with this method, bone tunnel placement, number of tunnels, over tensioning and bone quality. Bone tunnel placement and number of tunnels are under surgeon hands but over tensioning and bone quality is not on such in hands. So I use only this technique for posterior superior cuff tears, but I don't use first stiff retracted tears, but I manage with single row partial or biceps augmentation. A suture cutout is uh, uh, most uh, emphasized by J.P. Warner. He had a few cases. So he has come with a little cortical uh, peak augmentation device passed over the sutures into the lateral tunnel to prevent the suture cutout. And Kuroda in his 384 cases, he had uh, only one case of suture cutout. Sumanth so didn't had any case. I had in not a one case in first 100 cases. These are the cortical augmentation device available in the market, peak and the metal one. So this patient is in the beach chair, being from posterior lateral portal. The greater tuberosity is uh, uh, shaped. I'm making the anterior tunnel, that is number two. The arm is placed in adduction. This is the inner view. Normally we place the medial row anchor near the cartilage. And the arm in slightly abduction intoleration, I make the posterior tunnel, that is number one. See that there is a gap of at least one centimeter is there between two tunnels. Now I place the lateral tunnels, intersecting tunnels at different angles with mild abduction intoleration. So there are two tunnels are in different planes. These are two step method. First is uh, passing the tunnels and second step is passing the micro loop. This is a two step method. So this wipe loop is pa uh, pulled out from anterior superior portal and you pass the three threads of your choice into the vicral loop and pulled from lateral portal. So other end of uh, three uh, sutures from lateral portal, from lateral portal pulled again into the anterior superior portal. So we have two sets now, two and four, three each. Similarly, you do the another intersecting tunnel to the posterior portal uh, tunnel. So we have number one and number three set of sutures. Total we have four sets, three sutures each. Plan is to interlink the suture and two replox stitches across the interlinking and there are two bridges. This is the after cuff repair. So most of the footprint is covered 
and this is the glenohumeral view. You can see the air bubbles is like an intact cuff. So this is uh, the reverse L-shaped tear. So seeing for the mobility. So same steps are repeated. Two tunnels are by made. The apex is uh, sutured with the orthocord. And this is the final repair. So this urologist had a mass event for hunting. He had a recoil of the gun. He has fallen out of the jeep. So presented with pseudoparalysis, the massive cuff tear. So plan was, uh, I made uh, three tunnels, so three suture C's, so they have 18 threads. So we had uh, two interlinking bridges and three riplock stitches and two bridges across it. You can see most of the knots are on the greater tuberosity. That is the first interlinking on the cuff. And there is a second interlinking on the cuff. So coming to hybrid cuff repair, it combines the use of anchors and transosseous techniques to maximize the benefits and minimize the detriments of both methods. If you are starting from transosseous equivalent surgeons to becoming transosseous method, you can use this uh, technique to make comfortable. The interlinking sutures are passed into the GT with the anchor. So it addresses the concerns of possible weak bone issues with the knot tying and this simultaneously retentions the construct. I'm using this uh, omega anchor. So it uh, provides a cortical augmentation creating a self reinforcing triple row construct and there is no inert material in the healing zone. And this is the after the cuff repair. So latest is uh, you can use the suture tapes and the uh, bread sanders are come with this instrumentation is much more easier. We can do everything in one step, both making the tunnels and passing the threads. It happens in one step. Thanks for patient hearing. So this is the take home message. I can say this uh, method is the two transiases method. It can be done in mini open and arthroscopic equal to current methods and it minimizes the stress concentration of the repair and allows the vascularity and there is more biology and revision surgery is easier and is cost effective. Thank you very Thank much Raghu for finishing on time. Uh, I would request you to join me here. We'll have questions towards the end. Can I invite the next speaker Nagraj Shetty from Mumbai to speak on subscap tears inside and outside the box. So, at the outset, once again, thank you to Dr. Ashish Babulkar sir for this invitation. It's an absolute honor. We've heard about subscapularis tears in multiple sessions since yesterday about how do you go inside and outside the box. I'll try to show you my tips and tricks which I've learned over the last decade. First thing is, I'm going to show you all the tips and tricks in the lateral decubitus. I would try to convince you that the lateral decubitus is not a disadvantage when you do a subscapularis repair, as has been generally believed. The first thing is the position of the patient. You need to make sure that the patient tilts about 15 to 20 degree towards the flow to account for the retroversion of the glenoid and the glenoid is perfectly parallel for you and that's how it would look. The next thing is you want forward flexion. Once you do forward flexion, it opens up the subcoracoid space along with the internal rotation. The next thing is do not keep a pillow under the head because you do not want to have less space here so that your instrumentation doesn't hit the face or the eyes of the patient. So these are the landmarks which you need to remember when you position your patient a good position along with good portals now. The posterior portal should be as close to the posterior lateral corner of the acromion in line with the lateral border of the acromion and I'll show you why. 
The anterior supralateral portal is absolutely essential to be created two finger breadth away from the anterolateral corner of the acromion, and I'll show you why. And then you need some sub bicipital portals and a few portals lateral to the conjoint tendon. So that's how it will look when you have shifted your scope into the subacromial space or the outside the box. Now coming to the camera position, as a general rule in arthroscopy, you are told that never turn your camera, just turn your light cable. However, here if you want to get a beach chair orientation, you actually have to turn the camera parallel to the floor. So the lateral decubitus orientation now becomes a beach chair orientation and being closer to the acromion helps you go over the humeral head and visualize nicely the lesser tuberosity. But then still you need a few maneuvers to be able to get that access which the beach chair surgeons get. So that's where the Burkhardt principle of posterior lever push will help you. Now coming to the anterosuperolateral portal, that's the spinal needle coming from the roof of the biceps, just in that interval, parallel to the leading edge of the subscap and it directed towards the coracoid. So these are the principles of the anterosuperolateral portal. Now coming to the posterior lever push as described by Stephen Burkhardt, so that helps to expose the lesser tuberosity. It helps to identify a small tear and reveal a bigger tear underneath and helps you to prepare the lesser tuberosity extremely well. So these are my tricks, positions, portals, posterior lever push and a perfect anterosuperolateral portal like you see in this video. Now with this understanding, you need to now understand what's the comma sign. So that's the anterosuperolateral portal radio frequency hooking on to the comma, that's the beach chair orientation. So you're hooking onto the comma, which is primarily the superior glenohumeral ligament and the coracohumeral ligament. It is always perpendicular to the superolateral leading edge of the subscap. So that's the guideline. So once you have identified the comma, you would take a traction suture right at that junction of the superolateral corner of the leading edge of the subscap to the comma, place your traction suture outside the cannula. So now you're ready to do the dissection around the subscap. So that's your radio frequency one. You do a 270 degree release of the rotator interval initially, pass directly there, you see the coracoid tip, you skeletonize the coracoid, you expose the undersurface of the coracoid, you release the adhesions of the subscap from the coracoid, you will get some mobilization of the tendon. You then release the middle glenohumeral ligament and some capsular adhesions between the subscap and the glenoid, preserving the labrum. You can use radio frequency and a blunt liberator to release all the adhesions 270 degree under the coracoid and behind the subscap and between the subscap and the glenoid. And once you do that, you'll get an excellent reduction of even a type three uh, Lafosse uh, 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 tear. So that's the switching stick behind the comma. So that's inside the box. And that's the switching stick now in front of the comma and that's outside the box. So now once I've done this, I shift the scope into the switching stick and I get a subacromial view right anteriorly. You need to do some sub deltoid, sub acromial bursal releases, release the conjoint tendon, release the sub coracoid space, release some bursal tissue on the lateral aspect of the footprint. So that's the left hand side is your subscap, right hand side is the intact biceps. You can see I've not cut the biceps yet. And after this point of time, the lesser tuberosity is beautifully exposed. It's almost like a regular rotator cuff repair. So that's the reduction that I have, a perfect reduction all the way to the footprint of the, uh, almost of the biceps groove. And that's the orientation now. So viewing is from that anterosuperolateral portal, instrumentation is from the sub bicepital portals. And that's the anchor placement regular as you do in a rotator cuff repair. I use triple loaded anchors. The first anchor is on the inferior portion, a portal just lateral to the conjoint tendon. And this is from Stephen Snyder's principles. I like to use a crescent shaped spectrum like device to penetrate my initial stitches. So this is a fine device, unlike the arthropias, mattress stitches from the first anchor. So triple loaded anchor for a large tear like this. So those are all the mattress stitches that are passed through. So that's the suture array that you get. Make sure you've got a good reduction and come out with your second triple loaded anchor now. Triple loaded because I'm going to use multiple passages now with the scorpion. So anti-grade devices, retrograde devices, and then you start tying your knot, triple loaded of the second anchor because you can use one suture for the biceps tenodesis, a lasso loop stitch, and then I cut the biceps. And that's the final repair with a fiber link suture additionally on the leading edge and a nice double row subscapularis repair from out of the box. And this is how it will look from inside the box. So you've got a nice footprint repair of a large type three subscap tear with the biceps tenodesis in place. 
you got a robust repair, you can mobilize these patients early, and you've got, you really maintain the entire supraspinatus by just working through that interval. Coming to inside the box, this is now the orientation of a right shoulder. All the principles are the same in terms of the dissection of the subscap, in terms of the mobilization of the subscap. The only difference being you need to come at a perpendicular trajectory now just lateral to the coracoid for your anchor placement. So right shoulder and the viewing is from the posterior portal. So the anchor comes in on a perpendicular trajectory to the lesser tuberosity. That's a type 2 tear, again a spectrum device which can be used for passage of sutures and to confirm the reduction. So blue suture being the first mattress, the second blue suture at the same level, so a mattress suture. I use the black suture now as a modified Mason Allen configuration by going medial to the mattress sutures in a simple configuration. And the white suture is a mattress suture at the reduction point on the lateral aspect of the tendon. So you, have, you can see that the orientation is beach chair orientation. Although the patient is a lateral decubitus, you're tying the mattress sutures and then like a rip stop, your simple suture, make sure that there is a strong construct and you've got a nice footprint restoration and a nice tenodesis effect even in the inside the box repair. Now this is suitable for the smaller tears because you can place a single anchor. It's difficult to place two anchors and do the other technique which you saw in the out of the box repair. So you get a nice robust tendon repair there. So this is the pre-op bear hug test of a patient with a massive subscap. That's his follow-up bear hug test. Excellent outcomes. A massive subscap tear, the patient will actually flex his wrist. He will not be able to get his elbow up to the level of the arm. And that's the belly press, a strong belly press. My take home message, a good subscap repair is possible in the lateral decubitus position. You don't need to feel disadvantages if you're a lateral decubitus surgeon. The patient position, the head position, the forward flexion of the arm, mild internal rotation, and the posterior lever push maneuvers help you to expose the lesser tuberosity well and, and get that advantage of the beach chair position. Identification of the comma tissue which goes perpendicular to the superlateral leading edge of the subscap is absolutely critical. Once you've identified the comma, your ability to go on either side of the comma, posterior to the comma and anterior to the comma, makes you easily shift from the inside the box to the outside the box view. You should be comfortable in doing a 270 degree capsular release so that there is a low tension footprint, double row, double anchor technique for large tears. The intraarticular technique is principally the same in terms of the exposure, just that you're visualizing from the posterior portal throughout in a beach chair orientation with the camera turned and it is perfectly suitable for the small tears, either with an anchor based or with a knotless speed bridge kind of a technique. All those techniques are really possible. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Nagaraj. Now I request Dr. Sundara Rajan. Come and speak on. We will not be able to do so much. We will not be able to do so much. Where are you from? And where are you from? Pattern of cup tear. Good morning. So my talk is about the patterns of the cuff tear. So basically this talk is very difficult to classify the cuff tears. So then why do we need this talk? But by identification of the shape and predicting the preoperatively will help you to uh, map it out that how can you approximate the cuff to the footprint that will, uh, you can plan your repair also. So when you come to the classification, there are a few types which has been described by Burkhardt and David Sutton, David Sutton et al have published how to predict your preoperative tears. So the most common type which you see is the crescentic tear, which is uh, very easy able to repair. You can predict by knowing that the MRI, the taking the MRI will show that your anteroposterior uh, length is less and medial lateral width is less and anteroposterior width is uh, wide. That means it's a crescentic tear. You will be able to do a nice footprint uh, like speed bridge or a single row or a double row, whichever you are comfortable with that, you will be able to do that. So anything with the crescentic tear which you can predict preoperatively, you, you are 100% you are sure that you are going to do a nice footprint repair. So the same crescentic tear, if it goes in the width wise, that is from medial lateral width is too large and your anteroposterior width is too small, then you know that that apex of your uh, cuff tear is very, very difficult to bring it back to the footprint. So here we may need to do something else. So I think you can see this is a large U-shaped tear. 
it's very difficult to bring your apex to here so in these cases you may need to do a marginal convergence in the most of the time um, so where you take that uh, trans tendinous uh, uh, repair is a laminated tear two here to take this two or two, three or uh, marginal conversion sutures to make it as a single cuff then you use the anchors on the your footprint and the one on the uh, anterior side one on the posterior side then easy to repair this edge of your cuff so that you can complete the complete uh, cuff repair then that gives you uh, complete footprint coverage when you do this marginal convergence but sometimes when you have the even the large v-shaped tear like this is an acute tears you may think that sometimes the apex cannot be brought back here but sometimes with the good release or in acute tears even the apex will come back to the original position we know that biomechanically the cuff which you put foot uh, apex if you bring to the footprint biomechanically more advantage and stronger than the marginal convergence repair this is another uh, tear we can see the large v-shaped tear you can almost go to the apex but still the cuff is still in good quality it is not completely retracted it's a recent tear so you can still i can make it and bring it back to the footprint and attach without marginal convergence but if you think that it is going to be in tension then better do a marginal convergence and bring it there when you see all these tears like a u tear or this uh, crescentic tear there is no huge difference in the functional outcome but whatever the kind of repair you do that when you come to the l and reverse l shape tear i think all of you aware what is l shape tear where you can bring that infraspinatus to bring back to the footprint the reverse l shape is the very where you cannot bring the infraspinatus but you can bring the supraspinatus to the footprint so this is an l shape tear which normally you see in your uh, uh, practice it is very common than the uh, reverse l shape here you make that robust repair of infraspinatus bring back to the footprint by using the retrograde devices through the posterior portal so that you can take that entire laminated tears over there so sometimes you have to change your scope to the lateral portal and take the repairing stitch through the posterior portal so the, so that you can bring back and attach your infraspinatus to the footprint uh, uh, that is how that uh, looks you can see the gap between the anterior side but doesn't matter as long as you repair a good infraspinatus you can get a good functional outcome even if you are not able to do the supraspinatus repair when you compare the reverse l shape and the l shape definitely the l shapes uh, uh, tears definitely has gives a better results than the reverse l shape tear so that means your infraspinatus repair gives a better result than the uh, supraspinatus tear alone so this is a large massive contractive tears which you see often in the in age, uh, late presentations where you are both adio antero posterior and medio lateral which is too high too large or too way wide and it is impossible to bring back to your footprints here you do a interval slides you do the partial repair you can see the large contracted uh, uh, u shape tear almost retracted beyond the glenoid level and you think that sometimes you'll be able to repair by taking a tissue that is just a capsule so you take that end mass as a cuff that it may not come to the position then here what we do that you do the traction stitches you try to release both subacromially and also the uh, uh, over the glenoid level uh, you go up to the uh, spine of the scapula make sure that you have uh, enough release over there at the same time you you can uh, do the some releases between your glenoid and the cuff even that can give almost around 1 cm excursion of your cuff you can try to bring back your attach it if it is not possible even after that then you do an anterior interval slide like in this case you can are but you don't do the posterior interval slide i think most of us stop doing the posterior interval slide because it is not gaining anything and anterior interval slide and good sub acromial release and sub and over the glenar release along, along with some days now now we don't we always if you are not able to bring the supraspinatus we do the biceps as an scr you put back there then you do a good infraspinatus repair that will give you a very good result in this kind of massive contracted repairs when you come to the other aspect of the type of the patterns of the cuff repair this is a, another case you are seeing through the postolateral portal you think that it is an easy to repair this tissue this looks like a nice crescentic tear you can think you, you can think that you can repair it very nicely but you think that but you if you put your scope on the lateral portal you see that the same tear which you are seeing in the, through the postolateral is completely a different aspect when you see through the lateral portal the original cuff tissue is almost in that the level of the glenoid level what you are seeing is only the upper layer so that is an uh, 
laminated tear where you can get deceived if you are seeing through only posterolateral portal. So make sure that in your practice when you do a cuff repair, you always change your scope to the lateral portal and make sure that you don't miss these kind of laminated tears. So here the repair is going to be totally different. If you don't take out that deep layer and bring it to the footprint, invariably it is going to fail. So here, because it's in the different level of uh, retraction, you have to do a differential double layer repair. So here I'm using the uh, first taking bites through the deep, deep tissues. Here, the superficial layer, I will take it at the later date and you can, later time and uh, you can good, nice laminated uh, tear can be repaired with a double row repair like this. So, so don't miss your laminated tear. That is very important that make sure your scope is on the lateral portal. Again, you can most of the time you can predict through the MRI. You can see that the lamination can be seen by the coronal view. So that you can you 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 predict that there is a laminated tear. So sometimes it will be very obvious, so even if it's through the posterior lateral portal, but sometimes it is a very big cough, you will not be able to do any end mass repair. So most often when you have when you see a big cough with a differential dis, dis, uh, dis, uh, retraction, always I do a double layer repair so that that will give you the uh, good uh, coverage of a footprint. So here I'm taking that some bites on the inferior layer and some bites on the superior layer so that you can have a, a, a good robust repair by taking these two bites. Then I suggest to that and taking to the lateral row so that you have a good biomechanically strong repair by with the double row. Coming to the, uh, that is a, the same patient has have a healing, very good healing of your sagittal section, showing the complete healing of that cuff and the axial view. When they compare the NMOS repair and the double layer repair, does it have a much advantage? But the, this is a systemic review where they have done uh, two RCTs and three observation studies, which they found that it's, both are equally effective and they have a same retard that rate. So it's a tech, this is only a technique. So if you are able to do an NMOS repair, it's fine, but most of the time you'll be ending doing the double layer repair. When you're coming to the last part of the tear, is a musculotendinous uh, musculo tear. It's not very common, but you tend to get to see. It's a type A tear. You can see this is a, most part of your tendinous part is in the lateral part, and uh, it is torn almost in the medial part of musculotendinous attachment. There is a very small tendinous attachment in this case. So that is a type A. Here, what you can do that, we can do a medial anchor, and we can do an approximation of the ten, both the tendons on the either side and then approximate the both lateral end of the cuff and the middle end of the cuff and also I use the uh, rips of uh, threads to get into the lateral uh, row so that you reduce the tension on your medial row. This can help to uh, put a less stress on the approximation of the cuff that gives the very good healing. When you come to the type 2 or uh, type 3 you may end up in augmentation or a, a superior capsular reconstruction because inevitably it will fail. To conclude Identification of the shape will help the plan and mobilize the cup tears and your pre-operative MRI also will help in that. Don't miss the delaminated tears. It has to be identified and repaired in NVOS or double layer repair if there is a differential retraction. Looking from lateral portal is a key, so you should not miss it. And primary musculotendinous tears are rare, but to be diagnosed preoperatively, yes, they may need augmentation or reconstruction with a later date. And thank you very much. And uh, because it's my last talk, I also I would like to invite you all for Ganga arthroscopic course in the March 22 to 24, where we are planning around 25 life surgeries and chol on the knee, chol on the shoulder, and uh, also we have it on ankle and wrist. And also my request for you all to support me in the vice president election in the next month online election. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sundar. That was an almost encyclopedic collection of uh, tears. And I now invite the Mahapurush for the next talk on ir irreducible or irreparable cuff tears, the other options and evidence. <laughs> Uh, these are my disclosures. So, you know, we all know attracted supraspinatus tears have a poor prognosis. I'm just going to run through a certain things quicker because a lot of people have asked me to show the video. So we get cuff tears, which are, you know, big cuff tears. And what do we do for this? And we've been battling out for the last two 
approaches, two days. And as Christian Gerber says, if you put two orthopedic surgeons in a room and you get a consensus, they're not orthopedic surgeons. Uh, so in a case like this, uh, I think the Goutelet grade is not reliable way we measure it. And uh, I'll run this video from here somewhere. And if you look at it, ideally what we're doing here is we're looking at this Goutelet grade, very, very lateral, uh, which is at the scapular Y view. And in big cuff tears, this muscle retracts and goes much more medially. So ideally, we should be looking at the section somewhere here. So if you look at the section somewhere here, the muscle quality is actually pretty good, and the gutilier grade is nowhere what it, what it is laterally. And this is actually not gutilier grading because this is perimuscular fat, and it's not intramuscular fat or fatty atrophy. So there's a lot of difference in the nomenclature in doing this. Um, we'll move forward. So it's not my operation, it's originally Didier Pat's operation, and I learned it from the Japanese. I always give credit to my friend Yoshi, who thinks outside the box. And basically what we're doing is we uh, are releasing underneath the supraspinatus and the infraspinatus in the fossa. Um, and I figured this out when I went to Bassam's tendon transfer course, that if you go underneath the lower trapezius, the fascia of the infraspinatus is actually very, very thick. So you have to leave that supra superficial fascia intact, but you have to cut that all the way around the medial border of the scapula. And it's no different than doing a Jude approach for a scapular fracture or doing a MEPO technique for a femur fracture. And by this technique, I've been able to mobilize the tendon complex to almost four to five centimeters. So this is not an operation for every surgeon. It's an advanced arthroscopy skill. This is not an operation for every cuff tear. If you don't have a tendon, you can't repair the tendon. If you have very little tendon, this will fail. And if you've got static head migration, then this operation does not work in either reverse. And what I mean by static head migration is I, I do an X-ray, not an MRI. In an MRI, all the humeral heads are elevated because you're in the gantry. I look at the X-ray, and if there's a head migration, I send them back to X-ray, and they hold a five kilo dumbbell which I call a weight-bearing x-ray. And if the head drops the back down, then that's a dynamic head migration. And those cases are a candidate to have a muscle advancement. If the head doesn't come down, they get a reverse. So the, I will not talk about the results because the, thankfully the paper's been accepted for publication and it's been accepted, so the results will be out soon. But I've had a 92% healing rate um, in these group of patients, and these are the failures, okay? Um, so this is a case from two weeks ago. I wanted to present something different. He's an accountant. Uh, he's 50. He had a trauma uh, while he was on the boat. He sleeps disturbed, you know, and he's a very, very active person. So do you do a reverse on him? Will a muscle transfer give him strength back to go back jet skiing? Um, these are his scores. So he still has an active range of motion. Um, he's not pseudoparalytic, and as you can see on the left side, so this is a left shoulder, it's quite weak. These are his x-rays, there's no migration there. Um, this is his MRI. He's got a delaminated tear, which is quite a large tear. This is his axial. You know, a bit of infraspinatus is still there, and uh, So you can see as you go more and more medial, you go more and more medial, the supraspinatus is much, much better. So we'll run through this. I'd like to thank all my co-fellows uh, for helping me with the video. So this is beach chair position. I scope everything through beach chair. And when you look through the back, this is the view you get, um, which is not the best view, I think. So then I will switch my camera and we'll look through the lateral portal. And so this is the view from the lateral portal. So I would really recommend everybody to have a look through the lateral portal. So that's the coracoid in the front. The subscap is intact in him. Some fibers of supra are left there, which you can see. And then the biceps. Now, this is the back, and this is without anything. This is the kind of strength you get, which for me is a lot of tension. Tension for the cuff, tension for the surgeon. This is the delaminated layer, which is not coming. 
So this is my standard approach for all massive cuff tears. I don't know if I need a muscle advancement here. I don't know if I need a muscle slide here, but I'm going to go from lateral and I'm going to keep working medially. And I'll show you my standard releases for every big cuff tear. So the first thing which comes out is the cracohumeral ligament. So that's the sub supraspinatus and that's the uh, uh, coracoid. So that's the cracohumeral ligament that needs to be excised completely. So that's completely excised. The next thing which happens is that there's a band of fibers. You see these fibers? They go from the SGHL to the cracohumeral ligament. Now, we're still scoping laterally. That's the conoid and trapezoid ligament. The coracoid base is just there, and I'm going to do a suprascapular nerve release. Because for these massive cuff tears, I have to mobilize the whole muscle belly. So the nerve has to be completely released. It's like the pedicle dissection Bassam showed open. This is just an arthroscopic pedicle dissection. And you look at that. That is the carpal tunnel of the shoulder. That nerve is congested. It's tight. The artery is up above. I'm going to release this nerve. And then you'll see suddenly that the gush of blood reduces. The bleeding actually improves. And that nerve is tight. So unless you release these nerves, you won't really know about it. The nerve is already branching there. We can see the nerve is branched. And this is a very capacious capsule. So now I've actually, for the demonstration purpose, put my camera anteriorly. So I'm looking anteriorly. That's the biceps which I'm cutting. I thank God for giving all the shoulder surgeons a supraspinatus because that's going to pay for my children's education and my mortgage. But just to irritate us all, God gave us a biceps. So. Anyway, so we're on top now. This is the lesion of the slap, and we have to do a complete periarticular release. And you can see my suprascapular nerve forceps or scissors are on the left side. I'm on top of the glenoid right now, and I'm releasing all these vertical fibers which go from the supraspinatus all the way around to the labrum. And this is very important to mobilize these fibers, otherwise the muscle doesn't move. And you'll be able to see on the other side, the nerve is completely free. So the nerve is in that fat, and these are these vertical fibers which go from the supraspinatus down, and now we're gonna go posteriorly, and there's your nerve going into the infraspinatus. I like to see my nerves, I like to know where my enemies are because then I can control them. And these are the little bit of the vertical fibers which are still left there, and you're gonna incise that. And once I've done my intraarticular releases, I'll put a traction stitch on the cuff and I'll see what kind of tension I get. If this is enough, they get a repair. It's still not coming. It's still not good enough. So now I'm going to put a traction stitch here to see what kind of traction I get. I'll run through this quickly. I'll come back here a little bit. And now we're going to go subacromially. So that labral elevator is coming from the suprascapular nerve portal. We're in front, this is the supraspinous fossa. We go, we go on medial to the suprascapular nerve, so this is all really safe, and we just keep dissecting. Now I'm coming posteriorly at the infraspinous fossa. You can see the spine of the acromium, and we're just gonna keep elevating the infraspinatus. The deltoid and the lower trap are much more superior, so I'm working underneath it. I'm not destroying the lower trap, Basim, please don't worry. Um, and we keep going medial as far as we can go. And in a little patient or in a lady, this, the whole operation can be done arthroscopically and you don't need a medial incision. Um, in a big guy, so you can see the whole infraspinatus is getting mobilized completely. In a big guy, this is often hard because you can't get to the medial edge of the spine or the scapula. I would like to thank my anesthetist for this case because you can see the vision's really good and happens to be my wife and that's the only time I can control her. So I'm over time, but I'll take one more minute if that's okay. So you make a medial incision here. When you start, make it a bit bigger. You split the lower trapezius. So you go middle trapezius and lower trapezius because it's the middle trapezius for the supraspinatus. And you want to go below the lower trapezius for the infraspinatus. And you basically just release. I put a Cobb's elevator, and I release the, the remaining part of the muscle laterally um, through the, with the fascia. So I'm only dissecting at the junction. You see the difference there. There's no tension here. This has come back down. Um, uh, med standard medial row anchors, I'll shout out to Zimmer Biomet because uh, I've been using their anchors now for eight years. Lasso loop technique for the delamination taught to me by my mentor, Laurent. And this really gives you a watertight seal of the medial part of the tendon, which is really important. Otherwise, the synovial tissue 
goes on the surface of the uh, uh, humeral head. So we're going to put a whole bunch of lasso loops to get the tension down. Um, then I'm trialing out a new device, which is called a Tetris implant, which is demineralized bone matrix to improve the anthesis uh, of the humeral head um, and to see whether the anthesis becomes stronger. So we're just going to put that there. I'll skip through this for the sake of time. So that's just the Tetris implant there, which we're going to put to improve the anthesis. This is uh, still work in progress. And then um, once you tie the knot, you can see, we'll just go back a little bit. So when I'm going to pull the lasso loops down, you'll see that the medial row comes down to the footprint completely, and that's a watertight seal. And that's where all your tension of this repair is. And then the lateral row comes on top. So I'm going to tie these knots. Uh, we're going to do the biceps later, and then we put a lateral row anchor, and you can see that it's a completely tension-free repair for this patient. That's a spacer balloon I've used. It's a urinary catheter. It's not the striker thing. It's just to get me some uh, space in the lateral part of the deltoid. And then we do the favorite operation, which is a biceps tenodesis. But this is the re repair you get in 90 minutes to or two hours for something you think was not repairable. So I definitely think it's worth uh, the thing. The only slide I want to show here is that the strength comes back. So the key here is that I could not get the strength back of a function with the tendon transfer, but in this case, the relative strength comes back and the post-operative strength comes back. There's no change in fatty degeneration. You can't reverse this. What's gone is gone, but we have been able to reverse pseudoparalysis in these massive tears. Cause, and that's logic. If you have a massive tear, you're pseudoparalytic, you repair the tear, the pseudoparalysis reverses. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ashish. Now we'll have a debate. I request uh, Dr. Dinsha Pardiwalo to come and speak on cuff tear and poor tissue patch. Ja Simran, ja jile apni zindagi. That's unique. Okay, so cuff tear poor tissue, and I'm going to cover patch augmentation. So when I get a rotator cuff tear that has poor tissue, I'm primarily differentiating between is this a qualitative problem or is this a quantitative problem? Qualitative means the biology is poor. Quantitative means structurally I've got a defect. And I'm going to treat this differently because if it's a qualitative problem, it's a biological issue, I'm going to put in a bioinductive patch. Whereas if it's a quantitative issue, then I need structure there. It's going to be a structural graft, and therefore it's going to be a SCR or a modified SCR. And I'm going to show you the difference between the two. So take this patient, for example. This is a 54-year-old male. He has a right shoulder, full thickness rotator cuff tear with this everted tendon. Now you can see this everted tendon out here. This tendon is the problem. Of course, he's got a large spur too. So when I go down arthroscopically, this is what I see. He's got a tendon that's poor tissue. It's delaminated. There are flaps lying all over. He's got a large spur that I'm going to excise, but he's got this everted tendon at the muscle tendon junction, and all of this tendon, which is unhealthy, is going to go. Now, once this tendon goes, I'm going to assess whether I can repair it. And in most situations, as we just saw yesterday, I think you will be able to achieve a repair. The question is, how long is that repair going to last is that tear going to be prone for a re-tear? And this is really a biological issue here. So I'm going to do my trial reduction. And once I've got all that unhealthy tissue out, I can see that my deeper lamination I can bring back to the medial aspect of the footprint. However, he's lost a lot of tendon there. And even that super, the superficial aspect, you can see that that's just at that muscle tendon junction. So would I repair this? Yes, of course I'm going to repair this. But once I repair it, if I just leave it as that, I think my re-tear rates are going to be significantly higher. So for this tear, it was at muscle tendon junction posteriorly, so I'm going to do an end-to-end, -end, so it's like an L tear. And the rest of the tear I've done. But once I've done this, I certainly want to have some biological augmentation there. I want to do something that's going to improve his tendon quality. So for me, that's a bioinductive implant there. This is a collagen patch that's going to help healing. And where do I place it? I place it right from the muscle to the muscle tendon junction and then bring that right over the tuberosity right up to bone. 
So what does this collagen patch do? This collagen patch is going to induce bioinduction, so it's going to help with the healing, and it's probably going to help with my tendon quality. So let's see what this looks like. So at the one week post-op, you'll note that that's the patch out there, and that, of course, is my repair. At six weeks, it's already healing well, so you've got a good confluence sort of tendon tissue there. By three months, when it resorbs, you've got a nice thick tendon, which I don't think I would have had if I hadn't put that patch in. And by six months, he's got a nice reconstituted tendon out there. So if I hadn't put that patch in, I suspect that this patient would not have had such a good, healthy-looking tendon. Now take another case for example. This is a 23-year-old female. She's a competitive javelin thrower. She's got a right shoulder partial thickness rotator cuff tear on the articular surface. And a lot of degeneration within the tendon with years and years of throwing. Now this frayed aspect out here, of course we're going to go down, we're going to debrief this. But the question is that when you do this in a throwing athlete who needs this extensive hyperabduction with external rotation, if we try and take this down and do a repair, this patient's not going to get back to javelin. If we do a trans tendinous repair, you're probably going to lose range. And if we just leave it alone, as we did in the past, then these patients may lose strength over time. So I'm going to put a patch in there, and that patch is going to help with the healing, and it's probably going to help with making this tendon a little thicker. Does that happen? Well, here's her MRI at one week, and you can see that that's the area I've debrided. I put the patch on the, uh, uh, on the bursal surface, mind you. By three months, you can see that that bioinductive patch has helped with the healing on the articular surface. And by six months, it's a fully reconstituted footprint out there. And then at nine months, when she's throwing, you'll note that the undersurface itself shows you a nice, well, healthy sort of tendon. And I think that this is then encouraging for me. So this bioinductive patch is a type 1 collagen patch. It promotes biological healing. Remember, it's not a structural graft. It's not going to help you with structure at all. It facilitates new tendon-like tissue growth and changes the course of rotator cuff disease progression. This is something, you know, we've always talked about. We're really good at fixing things. Biomechanically, we're good. Our repairs are good. But biology is a problem. I think this may be good for biology. Some studies have shown increased and sustained tendon thickness observed up to five years and improve patient outcomes and retear rates for both full thickness and partial thickness rotator cuff tears. And the initial sort of papers, you know, I, I had doubts because I thought that these were probably industry driven. But last month, we had a good paper coming in in the arthroscopy journal, which is a randomized control trial of medium and large full thickness tears of the rotator cuff augmented with and without. And here we can see that the retear rates, if you do it without, is up to 25%. And the retail rates, if you put the patch in, is 8.3. So you've got a three times lower risk of a retail if you do put in a biological patch. On MRI, significantly better tendon integrity and no additional complications. So I think if you've got poor tissue, it's a biological problem, then a biological solution like a patch is going to be useful. Therefore, for most of our full thickness rotator cuff tests today, if you've got poor tissue, if it's complex, degenerative, delaminated tears, we're putting the patch in. For our failed cuff repairs, when we do a, re, uh, a revision repair, again, we're putting the patch in. And for bursal thickness rotator cuff tears, especially if they've got significant uh, you know, interstitial tears, poor quality cuffs, again, we're putting a patch in. Now, what about structural problems? What if it's a quantitative problem? Then a biological patch is not going to help you. You're going to need something which is more than that. So this is a 58-year-old female. She's got a right pseudoparalytic shoulder, pain and weakness since two years. She's been rehabbing since the last one and a half years. That's why she's come so late to me. She's got an irreparable posterior superior rotator cuff tear with a repairable subscap tear and no cuff tear arthropathy. So for me, in this situation, I'm going to try to do a partial repair. I'm, of course, going to do a bicep stenodesis. I try and see, can I do a repair or not? I'm going to do an extensive release, but if even after the release I can't get a repair, then this for me is an indication for a standard supracapsular reconstruction. So I'm going to take the fascia lata, I'm going to make a 12 by 4 centimeter thick uh, strip there, triple it so that it's at least 8 millimeters thick, and then repair it. But what I do differently is that once I've done this, I'm going to try and, number one, get my supraspinatus repaired onto the graft. So this is on the medial aspect. That's the supraspinatus, which is there near the glenoid. I fixed this graft between the glenoid 
and the suprasmator. So I fix the suprasmators back onto the graft. And so that's my SCR with the infraspinatus repaired to the graft posteriorly. And medially, it's the suprasmatus which is fixed onto the SCR graft. And I think that this probably helps with uh, both strength return and improved function. So if we look at the MRI there after one year, you've got, I think, three effects with this SCR. Number one, you've got this interposition effect, which gives this patient early pain relief. You've got the tenodesis effect. You've got your force couples, which have returned. So that gives this patient early functional return. But more importantly, because you've repaired your supraspinatus here to your graft of the SCR, I think this acts like a bridging graft effect and gives your patient good function. So you can see by six months, this patient who had been rehabbing for one and a half years and didn't have a result on the right side, in six months, she is much, much better. More importantly, when you see her x-rays at the five-year mark too, the acromiohumeral distance is well maintained as compared to pre-op. So I think that these are the sort of results that we see with structural grafts out there. Now, a little bit of a modification for patients who are not that bad. So take this patient, for example. This patient's got a cuff tear. I'm going to try to do a repair, but I don't have adequate tendon tissue. I've done the release. I really can't get even a medialized single row sort of repair. He's got significant fatty degeneration, both in the supra and the infra. I can't really achieve a repair. I'm going to put in an SCR, but this is going to be a thinner SCR. This is not going to be a triple. This is going to be a double of about five to six millimeters. And once I've done this, once I've got the graft in, I'm going to tie the graft on the medial side. And similar to what you saw yesterday, I'm then going to take the supraspinatus, because this one's not that badly retracted. I can bring that supraspinatus on the graft itself. This, of course, won't come right up to the tuberosity, but it's going to come and heal on the SCR graft. And this is going to then be put into that lateral row. So when we put that in the lateral row, and we're going to fix it there, what do we see after that? So that's the exposed tuberosity with the SCR on it. And that's the supraspinatus on top. Now, when we look at this patient's MRI one year down the line, you'll see, again, this is anatomic. You've got the superior capsule that you've got out here. And then you've got the cuff on the top. So this, for me, is restoration of anatomy. You've restored the superior capsule. You've restored the anatomy there. And that's the pre-op. And you'll note that post-op, usually within four to six months, they are much, much better off, both from pain relief and from function. And I think that this is primarily because you've managed to get that humeral head down and you've managed to get that strength in that shoulder. So do these results, are they long-standing? You know, yesterday we had a doubt, are they long-standing? And we can see that these patients that we've done even eight years back, functionally, they retain their function even eight years down the line. Yes, they may have some radiological changes here of early OA, but on the MR, we can still see that that SCR graft is retained. So I think that unlike a partial repair, which may give you results for maybe two or three years for these younger patients, long-standing results with these uh, 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 SCRs with uh, cuff repair. Now, literature, we've got a lot of varying literature, and it could go both ways. We know that Bihata has had some great results. We've had other papers which really say, does it make sense? But we've really had nothing which compares, say, tendon transfers with SCR. In, in a few papers, it seems to suggest that SCRs are better than lat dorsi transfers. There's one paper where middle trapezius transfer may be better dynamically than an SCR. So I think you really need to decide patient to patient what's your best option. But for me, the best option for poor tissue Qualitative problem, it's biology, improve the biology of the bioinductive patch. It's a quantitative problem, it's a structural issue. You put in your graph there, which needs to be a structural graph, for which for, which for me is a modified SCR. Thank you. Uh, thanks for your perspective, Dinshaw. Uh, I'll invite uh, Basim for uh, his take uh, on what could possibly be considered a patchy operation. Uh, what's his take on altered? <laughs> Namaste. Good. Right? Okay. So there is a study that done at Mass General, in fact, that showed when you compare the SCR to the tendon transfer, the, SCR, the tendon transfer was much better with SCR with much higher complication. 
So let's start with the basics. And this is something you're going to see it in the next lecture about the scapula, by the way. This is a very nice animation from University of Lyon, just showing the rotator cuff. Remember, the scapula on the posterior chest. The rotator cuffs are on the posterior chest. So when we say anterior posterior rotator cuff with respect to the scapula, not with respect to the chest, with respect to the chest wall, the scapula is sitting on the posterior chest. So all the rotator cuff are posterior. We have the deltoid and rotator cuff and the periscopal muscle to work. <coughs> now, whenever we have an irreparable rotator cuff, restoring shoulder mechanics is our aim. And I'll show you this because some of you asked me yesterday, so I add this one to the presentation. When the rotator cuff are intact and the deltoid is absent, this is the function. The right shoulder, coronic deltoid paralysis. You have full range of motion of the shoulder. Now with these, this is why the patient from yesterday, when you try to do your standard test for the rotator cuff, they're gonna be normal. Job test is gonna be normal, belly press gonna be normal, external rotation gonna be normal. So how can you evaluate, how can you know that the deltoid is paralyzed? And this is here mostly the power of the rotator cuff. So there are a number of tests, like for example, extension lag, you put the elbow, yesterday we did this one yesterday, and you can see in one arm it drops. If it drops more than 15 degrees, it means the posterior deltoid is not working. You can extend the elbow and move the same, we call it a swallow tail test. Again, you have different 30, 40 degrees, it means the posterior deltoid not working. And this is a paper I published with Bertelli. Bertelli test is you do flexion internal rotation because it brings the supraspinatus anterior. The only abductor is the middle deltoid. And if the patient cannot hold their shoulder, it means the middle deltoid is not working. And you can see I put it and boom. Even though his job test negative, everything else is negative. The power of the rotator cuff. And this is a paper we published about if you're interested in it. We had at least close to 40 patients, all deltoid paralysis. They had good function. Now, when the deltoid is normal, but the rotator cuff are fat, what's going to happen? You're going to develop either pseudoparalysis or pseudoparalysis you want to go. Because what happened now, you've, you've lost your force couple and you have proximal migration of the head, and you have what we know, all of you here know, pseudoparalysis. For me, no muscle, no life. And so the big question here to all of us, you know, why are we here as a shoulder surgeon? We try to reconstruct the rotator cuff. So if I see this patient, you can see here, infra supra atrophy, rotator cuff fat, what will I do? Will I use a patch or whatever to reconstruct muscle? Or I try to bring a muscle to reconstruct a muscle? And for me, like muscle, there are a number of them, but if I could bring power to the shoulder, I will absolutely do it. So of course, my choice is tendon transfer or muscle transfer in this case. And this patient, if you see the supra is gone, but he has a infra and subscap, and look at this motion, he has a full motion. So whenever the force couple is restored, you'll be able to function well. And this is what we spoke about yesterday because when you have this remaining irreparable supra, this is one you can debate whatever you want to do about it. Now, what are the available tendon transfer? You have, for the massive tear, you have the latissimus, which is the classic, you have teres major, and you have the lower trapezius. Now, when I'm comparing these, they're all, you have to understand, these three muscles, why they are good? They're all posterior muscles, latissimus, teres major, and lower trapezius, and the scapula is sitting in the back, so you can reconstruct the scapula this way. So, the lower trap, whenever we look at the line of pull and we think about houses, we said the scapula is the house of the rotator cuff. If you look at it as a house and you look at the lower trap, it looks almost exactly the same. If you look at the muscle fibers, not only infra, not only supra, not only subscap, we always look in two dimensional, think about it three dimensional. You look at the scapula this way, very thin wall. You have subscap, supra, infra, they're all exactly the same vector. One, two, three, three is minor. They're all exactly the same vector, by the way, but they're different to move the head. And if you look at this in the trapezius, if you move it to the back, top or front, they can reconstruct any of them. The latissimus is good, but it's more vertical. So for me, if you can get both, it would be ideal. And you can see here, like with the direct transfer of the lower trap, it really, really mimics the infraspinatus very well. Hashem, this is you, this is him in India as, as well, and this is study I'm doing with Hashem about the anatomy of the lower trap, and you can see from the back, this is where the infraspinatus fossa, this infra you're gonna see this one much more today. 
So anatomically, kinematically, biomechanically, the best transfer to restore posterior superior rotator cuff for us is the lower trapezius. And right now we can examine the patient, especially if they're not very fluffy, like not very big, you can see directly the tendon transfer. This is a lower trap, by the way. It was here, now it's here. And you can see the triangular action of the lower trap during shoulder external rotation. And many times right now, this is what I rely on. I don't even do ultrasound or MRI because you see it against resistance, it's working. So, and there are a lot of biomechanical study originally done by us, but now done by many people to show the superiority of the lower trap compared to other tendon transfer. And because it matches very well, the, the rotator cuff, early on we did it for brachial plexus. This is my very first patient I did lower trap on in 2007. Big surgery at that time, it's brachial plexus, big opening. We did not learn about it as much. This is him at one year. I did for him pedicle pec transfer for flexion. He got around 90. This is him at 10 years. This is him at 15 years. So with the allograft with the longevity. So, and we've done more than 700 cases of tendon transfers. Specifically, we did them for brachial plexus when we do mission work outside the United States. And we said, if it worked in brachial plexus, why will not work for the rotator cuff? But the patient selection is very important. So young, active, massive tear, fatty atrophy, mild arthritis, no escape. These are the patients for me uh, that they can, you can do them. Now, <clears throat> in terms of the technique, early on we used to do open. We used to do like vertical incision. Some people do it up till now. I used to do transacromial approach and it gave very good result. But we transitioned from open to arthroscopic like everything we do. And uh, we call it SOLP, Scope Assisted Lower Trapezius Transfer. Now, I'm not gonna show you the detailed video because we're gonna do it today, hopefully. So, but essentially, we know uh, from the MRI, from the exam the patient needed, I'll go straight for the harvest of the lower trap. You tag it, you, and meanwhile, member of the team will prepare the Achilles tendon allograft. You pass it deep to the deltoid tower, the greater tuberosity, and you fix it and then you split the graft to put the shoulder and abduction external rotation and pull the taft through the lower trapezius. Now what we changed is, so we started with open, then arthroscopic. Now this is the way we do it all the time, triple team it. Like usually I'm inside the shoulder. The, the fellow will learn how to do it very quickly. Within two to three times, the fellow is doing it. So the fellow is harvesting from the back. My PA is preparing the Achilles tendon. I'm inside the shoulder. And usually, if all goes well, I don't want to jink it today so that nothing happens, but usually it goes relatively quick whenever you have the triple team. Now, what about the outcome? Um, you can see, again, this is one of the examples. I'm not going to show video after video. We have great videos from me, from Hashem, from a lot of my colleagues. But now I love it because I can see the tendon active, the muscle activating and the tendon working. And you can see it along the motion. And when the patient moves, throughout the motion, it's active. Not like the latissimus, which is sometimes it's a tenodesis. You can see it throughout the motion, activating, in flexion, in abduction, in external rotation. What does this mean? Well, as we spoke about it yesterday, the force couple, because the force couple is important for the shoulder flexion. Now, this is a question a lot of you ask me about, why don't you do on top of that SCR? This is a patient I did not do biceps tenodesis on. I went back after three years. I did not touch the superior capsule. It was naked. I did not do anything. When I went back, it was sealed completely. So when you balance the shoulder, you do not need to cover it because it will get covered over time. So I cut more and more, I'm doing less and less because you don't have to do more if you don't have to. And our multiple outcome studies about also the good outcome of the lower trapezius. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Basam. Can I invite you, Dinsha, on the stage for a short Q&A uh, session on uh, this particular debate? And uh, let me start by asking you, Basim, uh, you've mentioned a lot about the force couple, and uh, Dinsha showed in his uh, one, one case that once he was able to repair the subscap and restore the force couple, the patch did the trick for him. So in your practice, would you ever consider a biological or any other kind of patch uh, for uh, rotator cuff tears? What would be your indications? And then, sure, the same question will go to you. When would you consider a tendon transfer kind of a procedure? You know, just to be fair, he, he gave very great presentation, but I think the patient he presented somehow different than mine. Just to be fair, this way we don't have to compare because it would be unfair. Because when you have fatty atrophy of the supra infra, especially with the teres minor, for me, there's no role for patch. Now, what he showed early on, I don't do a patch because I don't see these cases, unfortunately. I get only the bad ones. But if you have a deficiency that requires patching and everything else is okay, why not? 
But when you have a massive tear of fatty atrophy, I'm against the principle of trying to replace muscle with, with, with soft tissue. I think that's exactly the thing, that if you look at a general shoulder surgeon who's going to see 100 rotator cuff tears, we're going to see 50 guys with poor cuff tissue. You're going to have 50 which will have good cuff tears. 50 which are going to have poor cuff tissue, which were the sort of cases that I showed. Most of us would see maybe three or four or maybe five at most in a year, which would be the cases that Basam has just showed. Guys with extreme lag. So I think you're comparing a completely different thing. But if you're looking at poor cuff tissue, degenerate cuff tissue, on the whole, I think the algorithm that I showed would work. If you've got a patient who's got a lag sign, I'm sure that you're going to have to move to a tendon transfer. But what I'm trying to say is, for a general shoulder surgeon, that's going to happen not more than three or four times a year, whereas the remaining 47 or 48 are going to be poor cuff tissue that you need to augment either biologically or structurally. I, I just want to add, uh, I totally agree because I have a referral. I just get the one that essentially they consider them irreparable for, for tendon transfer. So I end up 80, 90% of the rotator cuff I get are quote, are quote, irreparable. So they are somehow different. Maybe the patient specific, if you require more muscle strength, maybe tendon transfer, if you require muscle strength, you might require tendon transfer. That's, I think th that's if, true. If SCR, uh, I think muscle strength, I don't know about, what is your comment? Well, and I know, I, Teru is not here today, right? I don't, I'm not seeing him. Well, the, the issue, this is what happened, like uh, yesterday, he showed beautifully, like Alex Lederman, what's happening with the new technique. I think what's happening with the SCR is the indication, indication, indication. And this is what's happening to the balloon right now, by the way. So when you have no supra-infra with the really ER lag, especially with the teres minor affected, in my opinion, it should be contraindication to SCR because the te this tissue is not going to give you any strength. So the tricky part about the SCR, and you can comment about it, a lot of people when, who, do, who do SCR start to change their indication. And many of them say, Sarah, if you have reparable infra, and irreparable supra is the best indication for SCR because now you have some strengths. Otherwise, you're not going to get strengths. Do you agree? Completely. Absolutely. So if you've got a strength issue, the guy's got a lag, you can't expect SCR to give you muscle strength. But if, you know, there's a spectrum of disease. And then patients who don't have a lag, who've got basically a painful pseudo-paralytic shoulder with some amount of external rotation. I think that's where your SCR is going to come in versus a partial cuff repair. Because as soon as you've got your force couple in there, you're going to improve his strength. And if you can get that bridging effect that I spoke about, I think that's where you're going to get strength. So I think you can get strength even with an SCR. But how much strength is the issue? If you've got a lag, you're not going to get that strength. So you've got specific indications for specific procedures. And I think that Basim's procedure is going to be good for the sort of patients he's shown. But if I've got the patient that I've shown, are any of them going to undergo a lower trap transfer for that kind of cuff tear? No. no sorry, one, one more thing. Whatever works in, in your hand. Again, Alex Raderman showed yesterday at the end of his talk, he talked surgeon preference, etc., etc. In my hand, I'm very comfortable doing lower trap as an augmentation. So even when I feel there is a deficiency that may require patch, I still use a lower trap, but this is in my head. doesn't have to be with any, anyone else, though. So, you know? I'll take questions from the floor. Mic number two, then mic number four, and then mic number one. So my question is with regards to pseudo paralysis only, and I've asked this question on different occasions to both of you. So when you're talking only about true pseudo paralysis, we are trying to restore effectively the anterior cable. Like you rightly mentioned, although the scapula is a posteriorly based bone, the supra pull is anterior to the infra pull. So you want to restore the direction of pull and the depressor effect of the supra. Now that's the reason why probably if you restore the anterior cable or if you have an intact anterior cable, you do anything posteriorly like a partial repair, it works for these pseudoparalytic patients. Now I do not understand how a lower trapezius transfer works very well for external rotation restoration, but how will it work in the line of pull of the supra and work like a humeral head depressor? And similarly, if you do an isolated SCR without the biceps stenodesis or the rerouting or the restoration of the cable or the subscap partial repair, we, do, we put everything into the box to get that depressor effect. How any of these techniques in isolation can restore pseudoparalysis? 
Well, we spoke about it and we're gonna talk about it again and again. I spoke about the force couple as a very simplified way. If you look at the rotator, if you look at the cuff, the cable, the cable attachment, by the way, of the infraspinatus is very anterior. You know, anatomically, if you look at it, you look at the infra coming all the way and the supra almost insert on it. So when you do the tendon transfer, you do the lower trap all the way to the greater tuberosity, the inferior fibers depress the head. The more horizontal fibers, they do the external rotation. This combination with the subscap in the front restored the couple for the deltoid to work. That is for me how it works, restoring the force couple. You need the subscap, you have an infra on the back, you have the lower trap in the back to restore the posterior cuff, you have this couple, now the deltoid can function. If you cannot restore it, they were not gonna, gonna reverse. Right, uh, mic number four, please. Uh, my question is regarding the bioinductive patch uh, to Dr. Pardiwala. How much is it your intraoperative decision and, or is it more so a preoperative decision that you take to induce the bioinductive material? If so, what, what are the indicators? What do you look for if you want to put in a bioinductive patch? I think most of the time this is a pre-op decision. So for the partial cuff tears, if you're seeing really poor quality cuff, then those, it's usually a pre-op decision. For the full thickness cuff tears, I've, I've, you know, the, the indications that I mentioned. So if I'm seeing something like this, which is a flip tear, I've got tendon loss, I've got mus uh, muscle tendon junction tear, I've got a badly delaminated tear. These are the sort of tears that I'd want biological augmentation. You know, as, as shoulder surgeons, for years and years we've spoken about, oh, we're really good at repairs, we're really good at structural integrity, but we wish that we could improve the biology of the tissue that we're dealing with. Uh, you know, PRPs and injections, they don't, I, I don't think they've really worked. But if something is promising right now, then I think this would be it. We've used it for the past one year, we've done lots of MRIs to see the tendon quality, and it's promising. And I therefore would continue with it unless later on, you know, we find that it's not really as effective as it should be. Uh, Mike, one? Yeah. yeah, two things. The first thing I think is, can I just respond to that comment about the super being a humeral head depressor? The super is not a humeral head depressor. Jay Keener showed us that very clearly in his JBJS study showing that when you watch the cuff, you do not see elevation of the head until the tear extends to the infraspinatus. And that makes sense if you look at the muscles. The super is not pulling down on the head. The super is pulling if anything, immediately, maybe slightly superiorly, the infra pulls down on the head. That's what's beautiful about the lower trap. The lower trap has that same line of pull, so it also pulls down on the head. The, this question I have for you, Bossom, is about the supra. So you've showed us so beautifully the lower trap works. Is there a tendon transfer for the supra? Why isn't it the middle trap? The middle trap, I tried it in the past. This is a problem with the middle trap. Again and again, mechanics. The origin of the trapezius on the spine we're gonna show it in the next lecture. And the insertion on, 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 on the different part of the scapula. The lower trap, the insertion site, you can detach it and you tension it to get it to attach on the rotator cuff. The middle trapezius doesn't have tendon at all. Number one. Number two, spinal accessory come very close to the corner with the middle trapezius. And number three, any transfer you do direct to the supra is deep to the acromion. I can bet you can make a study, every single one of them gets scarred, it will not do anything. It is not going to impact that head function. I used to do them before, I did levator scapulae transfer to the head, I did middle and I stopped it because they get scarred, they don't do anything and you lost the middle trap. This is why I don't do it. And for me, again, in my head, because I still do lower trap for dynamic, you know, stabilization in patients who have pain because partly the Achilles tendon help with the pain and others, if they need strength, I can add it this is for me. We have around the 20 cases of supra that we've done. Some of them muscular tendinous, by the way, which you cannot do SAR for, that we've done lower trap and they've done well. But in my opinion, these are the ones that you can do anything they can do well. But this is in my hand. Thank you so much. I think for the lack of uh, time, we'll have to close discussion on this debate. Uh, was a wonderful debate, uh, both of you, and uh, very good learning points. Uh, on a lighter note, I think depression is uh, one disease which is very good for the humeral head from the rotator cuff perspective. Thank you. We'll take that message and move on. And uh, Basim, please continue okay. with your next talk. Okay. Kabi kabi jitne ke liye kuch haar na bhi padta hai. Aur haar ka jitne wale ko bazigar kehte hain. Sure. Okay. <clears throat> so this talk, I'm gonna go through a few things in general because it is impossible to talk about the scapula in 10 minutes. But we're gonna just give you some perspective. So when you see some abnormality, 
Okay, but when you see major abnormality, you start to look what's going on. This is when it becomes confusing for those who don't see as much of this problem, and you have to understand the basics. How to evaluate STEM or scapulothoracic abnormal motion? And again, the basics. Why does the shoulder girdle allow this amazing mobility? Okay, this is yesterday we were discussing it with some of the attendees here. Look at the shoulder as a shoulder girdle, and the shoulder girdle is the only like joint or articulation or, or part of the body that move that has a three joint one articulation, SC, AC, scapulothoracic, and the glenohumeral. We have tendency to look at the glenohumeral only. If you do not widen your view, you're gonna miss a lot. So this is a nice animation that I, I found. It show you the mobility of the scapulothoracic. And many times we think it's two dimensional. It is not, it's three. And look how the SC and the AC are contributing. And you can see here the SC mobility, and as you move, there is even rotational activity. So there are three-dimensional mobility around the scapulothoracic articulation. This is how complex it is. And yesterday also I spoke to some of you. Imagine the chest is rectangular. You cannot move this way. And if it's circular, it's gonna move all the way. So the shape of the chest with the muscle around it, with this type of motion, with this type of articulation, allow the best mobility. There are 14 muscles that are around the scapulothoracic articulation and the shoulder. Eight, mainly on the glenohumeral joint, and six on the scapulothoracic articulation. I showed you this in the presentation about the rotator cuff and the deltoid. These are five. And then you have pectoralis major, teres major, and the latissimus dorsi. And these things, uh, I know the majority of you know, but you should know the innervation of each of these muscles and know how to deal with them. Uh, the six muscles that work on the scapulothoracic articulation are the serratus, Trapezius, these are the power horse. And then you have the levator scapular rhomboid minor, rhomboid major, and the pectoralis minor. The pectoralis minor is the only muscle originating from the anterior chest and insert posteriorly. Now, some of you say, no, no, it insert on the coracoid, it's anterior. Well, again and again, the coracoid part of the scapular, scapula is posterior. So let's dig deeper right now. This is, again, what some of you asked me yesterday. Levator scapulae originate from the base deep to the neck. This is done in the University of Lyon, it's beautiful. So it can pull the medial proximal scapula, but never the outer part of the scapula. So you can not to bring the acromion up. Now, because of the type of practice we have, we can expose this one in certain surgery and we see them. Look at this, this is elevator scapula, this is scapula, this is a shoulder, this is a spine. When you stimulate it to bring the medial scapula close to the spine, not the acromion, the medial scapula, okay? Now, rhomboid minor, rhomboid major, more straightforward because they originate also from the thoracic spine and medialize the medial aspect of the scapula. And again, this is here, the shoulder is here, the scapula is here, the spine is here. When you stimulate, you can see the distal tip of the scapula coming closer to the spine, retraction of the scapula on the chest wall. Now, pec minor, as probably you heard from, from me often, it could be very troublesome muscle is the only muscle coming from the anterior chest inserting on the coracoid. It can pull on the scapula. It could be the culprit of abnormal motion and the problem in the shoulder. Now, if you expose, this is pedicle pec, reflecting the pec, this is a shoulder, this is a chest, this is pectoralis minor. When you stipulate the pectoralis minor, this is a checkpoint, you look at the scapula from lateral, you're gonna see it in a second, it's tilting the scapula anterior it causes an anterior, excessive anterior tilt of the scapula. It can mimic what you see it in serratus dysfunction. Now, the serratus function for us as orthopedic surgeon, we do not appreciate it as much because we don't spend much time in the back of the shoulder. This is more seen by the plastic when they do some kind of flap. But the serratus is a huge, immense muscle from T1 to T9 and insert on the inner part of the scapula, keep it on the chest and protract it forward. Now, this is the distal tip of the scapula is the most important part. And during shoulder flexion, it is this part with the muscle activate to protract the scapula on the chest wall and keep the subacromial space open. And this will allow you flexion. Now, if this is a serratus, if the serratus is not working, the scapula wing off, drop, and the block the subacromial space. So you can have perfectly normal deltoid and rotator cuff, but you cannot flex the shoulder. And you can see it here, the importance of the distal tip of the scapula in the protraction. And this is intra-op, this is a medial border. That's a shoulder, that's a spine. And you can see here, when you stimulate the distal serratus, 
is to bring and protract the scapula on the chest wall to open the subacromial space. The trapezius also is an incredible muscle. It's the only muscle, especially the upper trapezius, that originate from more superficial base of the neck and insert on three parts, like the different parts of the acromion of the spine of the scapula, and allow uh, shrugging and retraction of the shoulder. And the, the, it is an important function because without it, the shoulder is going to droop with an anterior tilt. So you need the combined function of the rotator cuff, deltoid, periscapular muscles to have the amaz amazing shoulder motion. Now, if you d dismiss the function of the trapezius, the majority in the books, when they talk about trapezius paralysis, they talk about drooping. However, because trapezius insert on the clavicle and the acromion, when it's paralyzed, it's droop with an anterior tilt. So right now, if you let it go, you can see what happened. It's not only droop, droop with an anterior tilt. And that droop with anterior tilt specifically affect abduction. So when you have the serratus still protracting the scapula on the chest wall, you need the trapezius to keep the acromia open in the lateral space. And this is again, shoulder is here, spine is here, the head is here. And this is the scapula with the rotator cuff. This is a lower trapezius, it retracts the scapula. And when you lateralize it during tendon transfer, it keeps retracting, you're not gonna lose it. But this is the upper trapezius. It brings the acromion, which is here, close to the spine. So it does pull the scapula approximately in a vertical position. And again, this is what I showed before, the importance of it during shoulder motion. Now, this is what I want you to see, abnormality of the muscles and joints around the scapula thoracic. When you look into the patient like this and you're trying to figure it out, you have to think, it is dyskinesia or winging. For me, I eliminated these terms except as descriptive terms. And we came up because of the confusion with the term is called STAM, scapulothoracic abdominal motion, which means just as an abnormality of the scapulothoracic articulation, we try to figure it out why. Now, it is an English version of dyskinesia. It includes any abnormality. So when you tell me dyskinesia, what does it mean dyskinesia exactly? How much of the scapula is abnormal? This will give you, like, just give you this perspective. Now, there are two types of STEM. You have functional, when everything is normal, but the way the muscle activate is abnormal. This patient, the left shoulder is normal, but the right shoulder, the, everything neurologically, deltoid, rotator cuff, everything is normal, but it's behaving very abnormal. This is called functional STEM. And you have a structural STEM. Structural, it means either bone or muscle or both. So this patient has an SC joint, dissected twice, she has medialization of the scapula, and she has a stem, but secondary to a structural problem, which is ST joint abnormality. This patient has sprangle deformity, structural stem. It can have with it muscle abnormality. This patient has a massive rotator cuff tear, a structural leading to abnormality. This is like the patient we saw yesterday. This patient has serratus paralysis. This is structural stem secondary to muscle paralysis. Trapezius paralysis, this is another form of structural muscular form of STEM. And when you have it combined, this is what we call the FSH. Most, majority of them are FSHD or facial scapular humor dystrophy, where everything is paralyzed, and these patients they have usually the most dramatic scapular examination. Now, based on these, we have classification. We used to have a long classification for all of these, but then we divided them. We have functional STEM, we have structural STEM. For the functional STEM, we have four types. Type one is mostly the Peckmanner hyperactivity. We have minimal, minimal abnormality around the scapula, or we have to call it dyskinesia, but usually they have tenderness over the pectoralis minor with a potted tinel. That's a type one. Type two, you have two of them. This is the most confusing with the serratus paralysis. 2A, they present this way, usually subluxation of the shoulder, a very abnormal scapulothoracic motion. Sometimes they're dislocating. This is mostly from pectoralis minor hyperactivity, which is the culprit but sometimes they hyperactivate the upper trapezius, hypoactivated serratus. Now, when you stabilize the scapulothoracic articulation in these patients, these are the one, you'll be able to stabilize it, and they move very well, very easily. This is stem to A, because you're reducing the scapula on the chest wall just to help with the mobility. Stem to B is harder, because similar, they present, but they're locked. They cannot move very well and have still more intense abnormality of the muscle around the scapula, and we try to stabilize it, it's very hard to stabilize and get the mobility back. And 2B is many times, they're very dramatic, by the way. They have dislocation, very weird motion. 3 is very abnormal, just a minute. 
uh, they come almost like dystonia. They come stuck. Everything's so tight, you cannot reduce, you cannot examine. They come sometime as misdiagnosed as Sprengel's deformity. But uh, what happened, you put them under sedation, beautiful motion, nothing locked, nothing abnormal. This patient, you can see her on the left side, so is incredibly abnormal, but the EMG, everything is normal. But then in the anesthesia with one finger, you can move her fully. Stem four, two type, 2A and 2B. 2A is dancing of the scapula with the mobility of the shoulder. They start to wiggle the scapula during motion. And uh, the 4B, it's the most, the hardest, which is dancing all the time. You can feel almost like a seizure activity. You're not gonna see this in practice except you have a high referral for scapula. So this is essentially the, the, the STEM type of classification, the functional STEM. So in summary, understanding the anatomy and the functional biomechanics of the bone and muscle around the scapulothoracic articulation are essential to manage different pathology of the scapulothoracic articulation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Basim. Uh, Ashish, do we have time for a quick Q&A session? Yeah, so we have two minutes for uh, Q&A, and I think this extends to all the talks that have been given in this uh, session. I would invite uh, audience interaction. Uh, mic number three to start with. Uh, my question to Dr. Basa. Uh, uh, in the lower trapezius transfer, like we know that the main function of the lower trapezius, along with the serratus artery, is the stabilization of the inferior pole and the middle border of the scapula. So do we find the scapulothoracic pain or the scapular dyskinesia in the post-operative period in the lower trapezius? Yeah, I, I guess asked this question, in fact, in the ASAP meeting. Uh, I would start by saying we studied this before. Yes. I have very high respect to the scapula, as you know. So what happened when you notice on stimulation, it medialized, it like it retracted. Yes. When you take it with a tendon, take it to the humerus, think about the scapular humeral as one unit. It to bring the whole muscle back. In fact, if anything, it can have a stabilizing effect on the scapula. You're not losing it. You're getting still the retraction. For, you have two, retraction and external rotation. Thank you so much. George, please. Uh, Basam, I was curious. Uh, I guess first question is, is how do you differentiate STAM 3 and 4 from dissociative disorder? From what? Dissociation. Dissociative, like a, it's a you know, uh, psychological disorder, a dissociative syndrome. Well... <laughs> We have been trying to do functional MRI on this patient and to, uh, working with a psychotherapist. What we found, George, I think the majority of these patients, they do have a form of psychological disorder, and this is reflective of their problem. The issue, though, they get to a point, it's all subconscious, they're not aware of it. Even if it started as intentionally become completely unintentional with the, with the area in the brain that is lit up, causing this activity. So I cannot say they're almost always mixed, and I do not have so far complete separation because all of these patients, for me, young female, which I know you see them as well, they end up with this kind of problem. The 2A, is, and crazy is some of them progress from 2A to 2B to 4, 3 and 4, which is I did not expect it. I put this classification just because they are different. But the 2A are the milder form of the one are the most likely, which for me, it means psychologically less from the trauma, have less impact, they get better. But the three and four are very, very hard and I'm still trying to figure them out. Yeah, I think that's the definition of dissociative disorder is that they actually, it's involuntary yes. and they do activate. So it's very similar to a psychiatric diagnosis of dissociative. I was also curious as to then um, why, so essentially you're classifying the behaviors of muscle activation, so no. muscle patterning. We have a surface EMG study on all this. This is only 10 minutes. I have a lot okay. of work done in this one. We can talk later. Yeah, yeah, this is a the surface EMG study that we've done extensively on this patient to be able to determine this pattern. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So it's very similar to the muscle patterning that was defined earlier on. Yes. Yeah, so. So George, uh, just also all these patients, they see psychotherapists, none of them describe them as dissociative disorder, or very few of them. So if, say that again. Many of these patients, they see psychotherapists, and most of them are not described as dissociative disorder. Oh, interesting. It is very hard for them to find a right psychotherapist for them. This is why Chelsea is doing psychotherapy. Because of this, I'm getting frustrated. I was at Mayo, there was one person who was somehow helping, then they take their hand off because they talk to, they talk to the patient, the patient likes to stay this way, sitting, right? They don't examine the patient motion. Any problem? No, sometimes I have problem with my shoulder. 
oh no, this is a normal patient, she has a little bit of whatever, that's it. They don't describe them. We need this very specialized people. Hopefully we can figure it out to help us with this. Last two questions, Mike three Hi, and uh, two. Sir, so is the take home message for us being, uh, if the supra infra are irreparable and there is no lag sign and SCR is gonna work, and if there is a lag sign, uh, a LTT would be a better option. Yes. Is this, uh, whatever well, I'm saying, is, is this right or? It depends on your own practice. In my opinion, if you have an isolated irreparable supra, biceps SCR, SCR, lower trap, lat, partial repair, bicep tenotomy may work. I cannot justify it. In my own practice, I prefer to do lower trap because I'm comfortable with it, I have good outcome, but you can do any of these. I cannot say this is better than other. And if there is a lag sign, then uh, you... Lag sign, I will do lower trap for sure. Like, I regard this, I do them in general, but lag sign is the be best indication for it. So, Jeep, your last uh, quick uh, question. Yeah, a question about uh, STEM. STEM 1 probably is the, the commonest one we see. And is it just a clinical diagnosis or how, you, how do you um, uh, evaluate it? It is all the, the, two, eight, the, the rest of, the, of them, they come to us because they've seen so many physicians. They have surgeries before. Uh, instability, they have one or two instability surgery that failed. This is why I was happy with Hashem's presentation yesterday because he had this combination. This is a purely clinical examination. The patient come, they have mild stem, they have tenderness of the coracoid, nothing in the shoulder proper. Sometimes they have a post of tinel, and many times you can see the upper trapezius slightly bigger. And they've seen other physicians, they've tried intraocular injection, nothing worked. This is in a clinical diagnosis when everything else is ruled out. And when you know the diagnosis and you test the pec monitor and everything else. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Just a housekeeping note. Uh, the MMC point, those who have not signed, please sign on the register behind. And lunch will be served in the Hall A, the neighbor in Sabha 1. Uh, after Ashish Gupta's surgery, we might probably have only 30 minutes for lunch to be able to get in Basam's live surgery in time. Thank you. Uh, can I request the next session moderators, uh, Dr. Nilesh and Dr. Bhuv, to take over? And the next speaker, George, uh, to take Human behavior ke bare mein us din humne kuch jana. Dost fail ho jai, to dukh hota hai. Lekin dost first a jai. George, the meaning of that is don't try to be the best. So, so we, um, we invite our first speaker for this session, George, uh, Orthoscopic Management of Glenoid Fractures. Uh, thank you. Uh, so let's get started. So over the next 10 minutes, I was just going to focus in on three particular areas of this presentation. I was going to discuss briefly the indications for management of these glenoid fractures, spend most of the time talking about the technique and briefly discuss some of my personal patient outcomes. So what are the indications to manage uh, displaced intraarticular glenoid fractures? Well, unfortunately, the literature is quite poor and it is quite controversial. And it's very difficult to find a very comprehensive classification system. So if you have a glenoid fracture with displacement, I believe when you look at the literature, it kind of defines it as associated with instability. So if you, if you have associated glenohumeral joint instability, potentially the displacement variables are a little bit lower, maybe two to five millimeters. And if you have it without instability, uh, certain surgeons are willing to accept a greater amount of displacement. When we look at the percentage surface area, it looks, it's also quite variable. The operative indication is anywhere from 10 to 25% surface area involvement. Me personally, when I conduct these arthroscopically, I do have some contraindications. Uh, ideally, I want these minimally comminuted. I find the more comminuted they are, they, they're much more difficult to manage, and I'll share some of my experiences with you. And finally, you want to get to these er early, and I think Denshaw talked about that also. The longer you wait to get to these, to do them arthroscopically, they can become a little bit more challenging. And so this is the Eidelberg classification of glenoid fossa fractures, and I've kind of defined on which, on, which ones you can possibly manage arthroscopically with uh, cannulated screws. So we have the 1A and the 1B. Those are certainly very effective and very good uh, options for arthroscopic treatment. The type 2 also, as long as the lateral column involvement is minimal, those are also effectively managed arthroscopically. The type 3s are actually fairly easy to manage arthroscopically. The type 4, this one gets a little bit more challenging and you may choose to do a mini open medial incision to close the hinge of the medial column. The type 5A, maybe these are also quite challenging. 5B is actually quite reasonable to do arthroscopically because you're manipulating the superior fragment. Type 5C, maybe these ones are a little bit more challenging. Certainly the 6 for me is one that I would not even attempt to do arthroscopically. There's just too many moving pieces. 
So let's go uh, through the technique. Typically, I use diamond pins, and I use diamond pins to obtain my reduction, and I switch them out for cannulated screws. I really like the latter day experience screws. I have no conflict with that. And I like to use the micro fracture all as a tool to manipulate the fracture fragments. So let's start off with type 1A. This is a, a very common type of fracture you'd see. I typically like to view anterolateral, and I have two working portals, the standard anterior portal and the standard posterior portal viewing from anterolateral. I like to place my styman pins in first and just have them sitting in the capsule so that once I get the reduction, my resident or fellow or assistant can pass in the wires. And so here it comes in the micro fracture all from the anterior portal, and it makes it look a little bit easy, but that's essentially what I'm doing. I'm gonna to try to reduce it, pin it, and put in some screws. So let's go through the case. It's a case uh, very similar to the one Dinshaw presented, the, the hinge type fracture, 30 year old male patient. Let's get into the operation. So I'm viewing from posterior, and this fracture was about three weeks old, so you can see that there is some uh, soft callus in the present, so you have to take some time to debride it and remove this. And so we'll work along. And now I'm gonna go ahead and develop the subdeltoid space. This is very important to develop because most of the work that we're gonna be doing is from the anterior viewing portal. So there's our CA ligament, the lateral aspect of our conjoint tendon. So I'm gonna do uh, release this, release the lateral clavipec fascia. And then once I've done these releases, I'm gonna go ahead uh, and plan an anterolateral portal. So we'll just continue down here, releasing the lateral clavipec fascia. So now we're gonna switch, put in a, a spinal needle, and I'm gonna transition the camera into that anterolateral portal. So we're now we're viewing anterolateral, and we're gonna continue our dissection, and we're gonna go down to identify the pec major. In this case, you can actually see it quite well. There's our pec major. You can actually see the, the several aspects of the pec major tendon right there. So once I've identified pec major, I'm gonna look for the axillary nerve. Here's the conjoint tendon. I'm gonna move my way up. There's the coracoid. There's the CA ligament. And between the conjoint tendon and the subscapularis, I'm going to identify my axillary nerve. And the reason that's important is I'm going to use cannulated screws to fix all of these larger fractures. So here's the fracture viewing from anterolateral. I'm going to bring in a curette and debride it. And once we've done that, we're going to back up and we're going to bring in our diamond pin. And the challenge that we're gonna have here is the conjoint tendon. It's gonna keep us lateral. So I like to use this large pituitary and I like to push the guide pin medially and I allow my pituitary to manipulate where my guide pin's gonna go in. So this allows me to get a much more medial start point on the guide pin, which can be quite challenging if you don't use that technique because the coracoid and the conjoint tendon prevent you from doing that. So now we're gonna spend some time reducing this fragment, mobilizing it. Typically, I'll try to have someone else hold the camera and I can try to do bimanual manipulation. And so here I got a ringed curette and the uh, microfracture all in order to manipulate the fragment. And this is what probably takes the longest portion of the operation is to try to obtain the reduction. Once you've obtained the reduction, which is typically the hardest part, you're gonna maintain it with the guide pin. So now I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna move that guide pin into a better position and this is all coming in percutaneously, then I'm gonna pin it. And once I've pinned it, I'm gonna be a little bit more happy and I'm gonna come in with my uh, cannulated screw system. So this is the cannulated screw system. This is the Mitec system that I choose to use. I'm just gonna go here, push through the subscapularis, put that right onto the fragment. And then through that, we're gonna go ahead and put a guide pin in, drill it, and then compress it with a 4.5 millimeter screw. So there I'm gonna compress it. Now, typically I'd like to try to put two screws in, so now I'm gonna go a little bit more inferior. All right, and we'll put another screw in. So that's my provisional. We'll come in again. Here's another screw. So this is another essentially cannulated guide. I'm gonna push that through the subscapularis and just use that to position where I'm gonna place my inferior screw. And so we'll go ahead and put a guide pin in, drill, measure, and put it in an inferior screw. Very similar to how she showed us how to do a uh, ladder J yesterday. And so there, now we're gonna get compression. And there we go, fixation of our 1A type fracture. 
all right? And this patient also happened to have a greater tuberosity fracture, so I fixed the, uh, I stabilized the greater tuberosity fracture. And here's this patient's x-rays. We can see a cannula screw into the greater tuberosity and two screws used to fixate the anterior glenoid rim. Let's look at the type three and the type five B fractures, a little bit more complex. Typically when I manage these fractures, I use an advisor's portal. So this patient also had a minimally displaced uh, scapular spine fracture, which we're gonna fix. So with this, I'd like to come in from superior. I'm gonna use a superior to try to get the reduction. Or you can also put a joystick into the coracoid to allow that to manipulate it. I'm gonna go ahead and pin it and then screw it. And let's start with this as a case. So here, I've already gone ahead and plated the scapular spine and we're gonna move into the arthroscopic portion of the case. So in this case, you have to get the, I find it much easier to get the biceps tendon out of the way. So I'm gonna do a biceps tenodesis to allow me access to the superior pole of the glenoid. And now I'm templating the location of my fixation using a, uh, a spinal needle. Once again, these are gonna be coming in from superior and I'm gonna use the screw to obtain my reduction. It's not my ideal way of doing things. Typically, I like to obtain it and then maintain it with the fixation, but in this case, we're gonna use our screws to help obtain our compression. And so now I'm gonna put an additional screw in uh, from, uh, from anterior superior to posterior inferior, and then we're gonna go ahead and compress everything. And these are x-rays after. Uh, certainly, you can see fixation of the scapular spine and fixation of the intraarticular glenoid fracture. Now, here's another 5B fracture. We removed the humeral head. We can see there's a little more comminution here. It's a superior pole involvement with a non-displaced split uh, in the coronal plane. Let's take the surgery. So here's our coracoid right there. There's our CA ligament. And now we're gonna look underneath the CA ligament. We're gonna go through the rotator interval and we're gonna go view this fracture. And so in this case, I've already fixed it with, I believe, three cannulated screws come in from superior pole going inferior. And as you remember, this one was quite commented into three fragments. So not a perfect reduction, but certainly an, an acceptable reduction where we addressed both the axial and the coronal plane fracture. Another 5B case, quite commented. This one's quite interesting. Look at the degree of comminution on the scapular spine. So we, I fixed the scapular spine and use the same technique to come in through Navisor's portal to place two cannula screws into that glenoid fracture. And here are the uh, post-operative and healed x-rays. So what do I, uh, my personal experience with this, uh, over 18 years, I've done 27 attempts at screw fixation. I've been successful 25 times. We had two cases we had to convert to open. I'll share those with you. The mean age is about 34. So overall about 25 out of 27 successful. We had a, a healing rate of 24 to 25. We had one fracture that went on to a non-union and resorption. And that's the x-ray that you see here on the right his glenoid fragment completely resorbed and he went on to dislocate again and bent his screw and I revised him to an arthroscopic latage, and that's the one recurrence that we've had. Actually very good range of motion. Typically with screw fixation, I feel very comfortable in moving them quite quickly. These are the two cases I converted to open. Both of them have a very similar thing in that they have a free floating articular segment. As soon as I have a free floating articular segment, I find those are very difficult to manage arthroscopically. Presently, I switch right to open as soon as I see a free floating articular segment that right there. So in summary, I think arthroscopic fixation with screws is less invasive than open. You can preserve the subscapularis. It's safe and it's effective. The one question is it does cost more. These screws cost more. The time it also takes is substantially longer, anywhere from two to three and a half hours to manage these. So that was my last presentation. I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank Ashish for this wonderful opportunity to be here and to come back to India. It's been a, it's a bit of a great pleasure for me. I'd like to also draw your attention to a course I run with my partners, Jay Keener and Bob Tajan. It's called the Advanced Shoulder Arthroplastic Course. It takes place in Utah, and the next one is in January of 2026. And most importantly, I wanna invite everyone to Vancouver in 2026. So in 2026, uh, the ASCS is gonna be hosting the International Congress of Shoulder and Elbow Surgery since September of 2026. I'd like to invite all of India to Vancouver. There's a huge Indian community in Vancouver, so I think it's very important for all of us to be there and have a good showing. Thank you. Thank you, George. We'll take the questions later. Next up, uh, we have Dr. Nandan Adla speak on management of GT fractures, and we all know that these can sometimes be really unforgiving. So after that excellent presentation, George, um, moving on to a more... Moving on to a more uh, simpler fracture, uh, but most badly managed fractures we see in our practice. 
Um, GT, as we know, is uh, very important for the shoulder and you will not get a satisfactory outcome unless the GT is healed onto the shaft. Even if you don't have a head, you can have a reasonably good function. So healing of the tuberosity is important. So the dawn of the shoulder is not the head of the shoulder, but it is the greater tuberosity. So simple example, this is what we see in regular practice, fracture dislocation, reduced, had a general anesthetic for that, reduced, then found the GT was uh, displaced, so they went ahead to fix it. Again, it moved away. They put a bigger implant to hold it down. Again, it moves away. So, dawn ko pakarna mushkil nahi hai. But, dawn is always running, so you can still hold him, provided you catch the attachments, not the bone itself. So, tuberosities are very important because the rotator cuff is attached, the motor of the shoulder is attached to it, and the bone is very soft. So don't treat it like a fracture, treat it like a tear, and you can get a better result. Classification-wise, there are many classifications, not very useful, but the one which is useful is the avulsion, split, and depression one. And if you look at our, uh, the mechanism of injury, we can easily get to how you treat these correctly. So most of them are either an impaction injury or an avulsion injury. It's a fall on the tip of the shoulder is most often a depressed, a compressed fracture, whereas a pull is most often an avulsion. So if you have a point fall on the shoulder, unlikely to be avulsed, and these can be treated non-operatively, but a fall on the outstretched hand where it's avulsed, you need to fix it. If it is associated with an anterior fracture dislocation, more chance of fixing it. External ocean lag sign is a very good, useful test to find out if it is, the GT is functioning or not. And this lady was eight months post-injury, was having physiotherapy, um, and we could easily make out that the GT was broken because of the examination itself. So examination is very important even in GT fractures. Decision-making-wise, we used to talk about five millimeters. Now we have moved on to three millimeters of displacement, so it's unforgiving, so any little displacement, you do fix them. Imaging, most of them are deceptive sometimes, so have a very low threshold of getting a CT scan. Number of fragments are easily determined by a CT scan, so low threshold for imaging with a CT. Non-operative treatment protocol, how do you do it? First phase, immobilize for three weeks, wait for the soft callus. Second phase, pendular exercises and active. Then active exercises start a bit later, after six weeks. Most important thing you tell your patient is that they take about eight months to recover. They do not recover immediately after you fix them. So monitor these fractures because if they displace, you fix them. What are the options? Screw with a washer, intraosseous suture, uh, suture anchor fixation, and small locking plates have also been described. So we'll go through that whole process. And that's the biomechanical study which showed that the locking plate is good, but you should have big greater tuberosity fragments for a locking plate also, but always supplement with a suture even if you use a plate. Screw fixations are very tempting. Most of the time you think of doing a percutaneous technique and this is what happens. So please don't do that. Do a mini open, use some sutures on it. Even if you use a screw, use a suture to intraosseous repair it. So mini open surgery is recommended for this and reduction is better with a mini open. And the screw is always going from posterior to the anterior medial cortex. Use a supplementary anchor if you feel there is fragmentation. You can also use intraosseous sutures if you are feeling that cost is a constraint. So screw with an intraosseous suture is a good construct too. Biomechanical studies have shown that the suture constructs are better for uh, these and they prevent displacements even compared to a simple tension band technique. So suture anchor repair, how do I do it? Single row, tension repair or a TOE type of repair, transosseous equivalent is much better because it actually compresses the fragment into the bed of the fracture. Because we know fractures heal with compression, you need good compression at that point. So tension type of repair is better. 
Open or arthroscopic can be done. I prefer open. Example, 34-year-old, he walks in with an MRI scan. And again, MRI is not needed for this. You can do a CT scan and determine what it is because you get a better definition of the fracture. X-ray is enough and a CT would be better, but this is the intraoperative image of this patient. Don't use the forceps on the bone. So that's something I wouldn't recommend. Use the traction suture. Mobilize the cuff like you would do a rotator cuff and a medial row anchor going through the fracture. I sometimes go right down to the calcar too because the bone is very soft and you pull the anchor and see where your uh, best hold is and then pass the sutures through the rotator cuff like you would do for an open cuff repair. Once that is done, reduce it and I normally use K-wires to hold it. Why do I use that? The tendency for a great tuberosity is that we tend to pull it downwards. A GT needs to be pushed, pulled laterally and slightly upwards, not downwards. Otherwise, you tend to over-reduce it and cause this. So if you get a hairline reduction on the lateral cortex, stabilize it with the K-wires and then tension it so that you don't over-reduce it down. If it is an old fracture, you can put bone graft under the fragment before you push it down so that the void is filled and the height of the GT is maintained well. So that's the anchor going in, the lateral row anchor. This is the tension type of anchor. You can see the sutures there are loose. So once you start winding it in, you will see the tension on the, the uh, sutures increasing and then you can get a nice repair like that with a good compression of the fracture without a use of a screw because this fracture had three fragments in it and you wouldn't have put a screw in it. Arthroscopic similar type of technique can be done arthroscopically although I prefer doing it open it's much more simpler and the results have been comparable this is an arthroscopic uh, this uh, locking technique which has been published from China they have a special device for that seem to hold the bone well, but this is only again for big fragments, but if you use a plate, please use a suture as well. And they have shown good results with the plating system. Arthroscopic, good outcome measures, and athletes were returned to a pre-activity level as well, pre-sports level. Arthroscopic versus open, no difference in outcome. So if you're comfortable with open, please go ahead and do the open. Don't start your fixations unless you are doing arthroscopic regularly, don't do this as a primary case for you to do an arthroscopic GT fracture fixation because things can go wrong badly. My series, 37 patients, we did nine patients had a delayed presentation more than three months. The furthest I've done is for one year and I still could get good healing and good function if you repair them properly. That's the outcomes we had, and that's the configurations I've used in these uh, patients. 62-year-old lady, three-month-old injury, had a lag sign, single anchor suture fixation, and that's what I meant. You tend to over-reduce over the GT. Sometimes that can be a problem, but it can cause more stiffness. That, but that will you'll come over that if you do a rehab properly afterwards. Post-surgical, this is a very common scenario we see. Have a plate fixation done. Then you see the GT escaping, it looks okay there, it escapes and this man comes to me about eight months later with a big scar and he's no better from where we started and he had a lag sign too. You can see that the GT is vacant. One important tip I'll give you for proximal humerus fixations, if you put those top two screws, you're actually putting it through the subcondral part of the attachment of the cuff. So there is a tendency for a crack to appear there and the GT escapes over the top of that. So always, always, always have sutures on your tendon when you do your phyllos plating as well and avoid those top two screws if you can. So what I did, I took out those top two screws, mobilized the GT, pushed it under the, uh, the plate and tied the sutures onto the plate to get it back. Conclusion, a good history, low threshold for CT scan, technique used uh, depending on the fragment size and the combination, but treat it like a rotator cuff and not a fracture. Thank you. Thank you so much.
Um, we invite now Ram. A poor guy is going to get Devdas as a slight slow, side slow who's never smelled alcohol. And Ram is going to talk on proximal humerus fractures and complications and how to prevent them. Thank you, Bu. Okay, ready? Caps. कौन कम बक बर्दाश्त करने को पीता है? Yes. So, uh, thank you, Ashish. Uh, my topic is uh, proximal hemorrhage fracture complications. How to prevent? So, 51-year-old lady, right-handed, after a fall, four-part displaced, dislocated fracture. Um, how many of you will fix? Raise hands. Okay, and how many of you will replace? Hemi? Okay, that's good. So that's the common uh, indication to do that. So this was the surgical fixation elsewhere. And six months post-op, developed a severe pain, and I could see here, screw cut off, tuberosity disappearing. And at this point, what do you do? Remove, or remove an hemi, or removal, or an RCA. So the surgeon has done hemiarthroplasty. Time is passing on, be two years down the line. The patient had this hemiarthroplasty done. What do you expect to happen? In six months later, the patient come back like this, severe pain, unable to carry out activities of daily living, flexion abduction only 30 degrees, very painful, no rotation, and there is actually escape of the hemiarthroplasty you can feel under the skin. So she has to undergo a reverse shoulder arthroplasty. It's a big operation. She's able to elevate up to 100 degrees, no pain, relief, but she suffered for four and a half years with the right shoulder uh, fracture with multiple surgeries. So let us plan and let us do no harm. The complications mostly described and important to describe about the uh, plating because that is very commonly used here. So these are all biological complications, infection or uh, avascular necrosis or fracture over which we don't have much control, but these could be prevented. These are all different case scenario. Case one, case two, case three, you could see the phyllosplating is done, but the joint is dislocated left. <laughs> the complications I see the most, fracture fragments not fixed properly, plating done, dislocation is missed, GT escape, and screw penetration, loss of fixation, mall union, non-union, and very rarely you get deltoid paralysis and injury as well. So if you look at the literature for anybody aged over 60, high risk of complication, especially screw cut out. So we have emptying examples. So you could see that's a case one 52 year old coming with a crunching noise in the shoulder after phyllos plate. Screw is the culprit, it has to be removed. If we do not remove, this is another patient who came late to me and the gl glenoid is eroded. So we are heading for reverse shoulder here. So how to get it right? I'll walk you through a case. Uh, 30 year old lady after road traffic accident, that's a four part, multiple fragments you could see. And that's the coronal uh, pictures, sagittal showing head split, multiple fragments. So what is your choice? Uh, how many for percutaneous fixation? Raise hands. Or if with plating, hemi or arthroplasty. Well, what do the rest will do? <laughs> so, I did the ORIF, this is a fresh injury, a short delta petal approach, I could see here. Uh, indirect fixation, basically multiple sutures, supra, infra, musculotendinous interface, and then you do a gentle reduction and get the reduction provisionally fixed. Calcar uh, peak plate application and uh, use the short screws. Uh, check calcar reduction and the screw fixation, and also a dynamic screening to check the quality of uh, reduction as well as any screw penetration. So that is her post-operative, and that is the range of movement three months later. Flexion, abduction, and also the rotations. So it is possible 
to restore full function even if it is multi-fragmented. The technical tips, I will give you 10 tips. Number one, suture and reduction first. Because this locking plate is not going to hold uh, your uh, reduction. Plate used as a reduction tool only to achieve calcar reduction. Avoid long screws. This is not hip, so use short screws, 5 to 10 millimeter from the articular surface. Don't be happy with just the static image. Do a dynamic screening. If you're not happy, take the screw out. It's the best time to correct it. And remember, the fixed angle plating, it is a configuration. You have to get the height correct. Uh, otherwise, use a variable angle plate. It's available from uh, Arthrex, where you can check the uh, screw, locking screw direction and keep the top under the tuberosity area free. And I prefer to use the uh, carbon reinforced peak plate from uh, Trex, actually. Um, there is a lot of advantages. The modulus of elasticity is closer to the bone, and it's a radio loosened plate. So you could see the reduction. You could uh, control the uh, surgical steps. So, and if you have any doubt, augment the fixation. Put either front to back screw or a small plate or use a synthetic or uh, iliac crust graft if necessary to support the metaphyseal void. And if you have a calcar issue or a delayed union or non-union, you could uh, use a fibular graft. So let us see one uh, final case. So a 55-year-old right-handed gentleman after a fall. Uh, looking like relatively simple, it is not like the first and the second case which I have shown. So that is a CT. And uh, conservative treatment, raise hands. OK, one or two. ORAF with plate. Oh, very good. So he had the ORAF done elsewhere. And that is the immediate post-op x-ray. Again, remember to get AP and lateral view x-ray. This is AP and oblique, OK? So he's not telling you where, where is the screw or what is the position of tuberosity. So that is one month post-operative. Is the fragments looking, being held. Two months post-operative, the patient is starting to develop pain, unable to lift arm up. And that is his range of movement. And that is the true AP view which I have obtained. And I think Nandan already seen one case, so I will show is again repetition. But basically, GT escape. It was held, but it wasn't held in place very well. No support by tuberosity sutures. So that is the key. Respected tuberosity and put a lot of sutures to hold it. That's a key message. So that's it. So how to do? This is a difficult situation. Uh, this is the CT scan to uh, assess. And uh, important is this is the scar, and he has also got some axillary nerve injury. EMG shows neurogenic changes, demonstrating features of denervation as well as renervation. So there is some injury as well present. So 55-year-old, dominant hand, only two months post ORIF, GT escape, secondary stiffness, prominent plate and screw as well, and axillary nerve injury. So it's a difficult, it's a challenge. I think yesterday one delegate showed similar case. So how to avoid or how to manage? So let's see. So that is that uh, surgery, delta petal approach, uh, and you see the glistening articular cartilage because the tuberosity is behind, and you could see the articular head. So that's the GT mobilization. You have to be patient because the GT is stuck on the posterior aspect of the uh, head. But you could use multiple suture, hold on to one suture, and retrieve the uh, remaining fragments. And that is the infraspinator suture. So I have put around six, or, uh, six sets of sutures. And once it is done, reduction, reduce that fragment. But you see, I have taken the sutures through the holes of the same phyllos plate. I didn't want to remove it because there is additional uh, procedure. And once the reduction is fine, uh, in the void, I have just put a synthetic graft. You could also put iliac crust graft if necessary. And remove the top two screws because you need a space for the graft to go in. And that's the final uh, construct. So that's the movement. And that's the post-operative. I give him a neutral rotation brace for four weeks because you don't want to, if you put the regular sling, it is going to stretch the posterior uh, cough and tuberosity repair. And that is just the range of movement and healing at uh, two months period. And very importantly, check this uh, rotation. The right shoulder operated, and it's restored his active uh, external rotation. So 
This is how sometimes uh, you are successful in doing that. But I will also warn the patient, if I'm unable to do, I will take out the plate out and be prepared for arthroplasty as well. So displaced to three and four part fracture, fracture reduction, gentle, indirect, use multiple sutures. Put the sutures in the GT cuff interface, more the merrier. Plate profile, height, and location, you have to be very careful if you are using a fixed angle plate. There's alternative available as well with a variable angle. That uh, screw should be diverging and make it short. Don't make it long. Restore the culcar and screw fixation, bone graft if indicated. Thank you. Thank you, Ram. Next, may I invite my co-moderator, Dr. Bhu Machani, to give his thoughts on role of arthroplasty in the proximal humerus fracture management. <laughs> Thank you, Ashish, uh, for having me here, <clears throat> and also last talk before the lunch. So I'm just going to take an overview on uh, proximal humerus fractures and orthoplasty indications. And don't forget, 85% uh, and more are still treated non-operatively, uh, or if it's still the gold standard, and shoulder orthoplasty, as of recent studies, is only for 5% and increasing trend. So we need to make sure that is it good and acceptable function, results reproducible, and are the risks acceptable. <clears throat> so I think most of it is the behavior of the surgeons. And uh, if we go back in until 2005, uh, me as a surgeon, I had a fear of displacement. Then we had a low threshold either to do open reduction or, or go for hemi. 2005 to 2010, we had a confidence of backup of RSA. So actually, we treated non-operatively more because we knew that if we did fail, then we can go back and do RSA. At, at 2010 to 15, uh, the HEMI trend uh, started falling down, and then onwards uh, increased RSA, and mainly because of the increased expertise of the surgeons and also the availability of the implants, but more so because of the good functional outcomes. So the adverse factors in trauma and orthoplasty is there is no definite landmarks. Uh, we do not know the status of the rotator cuff and how to get the good tension in the GT, stem designs, fracture stems, pre-existing arthritis, what do you do in young versus elderly patients, and more so, patients had been asymptomatic prior to this, and what are their expectations? So we need to take this into account. So going through some literature, um, clearly the tuberosity healing was the main determining factor for hemiarthroplasty and uh, the factors advised to that. The other factors contributed to the good outcome was the stem to get the right height on the version. And in patients who underwent RSA, the non-healing of tuberosity, although some papers did show that there's no major outcome, but also showed that it is necessary for good forward flexion. Notching was also not significantly adversing the outcome. So the, some, uh, some studies uh, cemented versus uncemented. Uh, there are many flaws in the studies. This is not randomized, and I, I would still be very cautious of using uncemented in uh, such uh, situations. Uh, the other uh, topic is um, HEMI uh, is better in some and RS in some, but RS is not always offered due to lack of expertise. Uh, finally, uh, the influence of greater tuberosity, uh, 47 patients in this, uh, 47 patients in this study, eight gender BMI and delay in surgery did not affect the healing, 68% had anatomical healing, but there was no statistical difference in functional range of movements. So, uh, um, hemiarthroplasty, is it falling apart? Um, I think uh, it is, but it should not be the case. So typically, uh, hemiarthroplasty, my indications would be uh, for age group between 50 and 70 years of age, when there's substantial combination, head split, uh, displacement or dislocation with more than 50% articular involvement, and no significant tuberosity combination in intact rotator cuff, I think hemiarthroplasty would be the choice. And RSA for patients who are slightly older, uh, three and four part, and uh, head is splitting, and if there is any pre-existing arthritis or cuff, ins cuff insufficiency. Favorable, favorable factors of good outcome is mainly the technical points. Tuberosity fixation to the implant and to the shaft still remains very, very important for both types of orthoplasty. Getting the stem height and version. Tensioning 
intraoperatively, more surgeons believe on congenital tendon and deltoid height, but we saw George talking yesterday, um, not, not so much. Um, but uh, I think congenital tendon tension is one of the good indicator. Inferior tilting of the glenosphere, little evidence to show if this improves in such situations and to get the base plate fixation with at least two good um, uh, peripheral screws and one central peg or central screw is, uh, is necessary. So height of greater tuberosity, uh, not so much about impingement, but there could be inferior capsule which becomes tight and limiting abduction and uh, center of rotation displays upwards with respect to rotator cuff and with small moment of our arm. <clears throat> so in terms of hemiarthroplasty, this is possibly the most inconsistent and difficult uh, thing to get. In order to get the tuberosities heal, we have to do somehow and something in whatever technique you need to get onto the heel, uh, the tuberosities to the stem onto the, uh, onto the shaft itself. Likewise, uh, there are different techniques uh, around the world, which is probably more favorable and most understandable to get uh, the tuberosities heel onto the uh, RSA. Uh, the, there are many indications and many predictors of how you get the height right. This is one of the uh, method you use the uh, top of the pick major onto the TB to get around 5.6 uh, centimeters. But there are other intraoperative, preoperative uh, techniques where you can use them. Don't forget uh, the center of rotation uh, is different to hemi and uh, RSA. Uh, lateral offset, again, um, is uh, vital. If subscap can't be repositioned to its insertion, that means there is increased lateral offset. So stem orientation, um, my, my preferred is about 20, 30 degrees. Uh, again, uh, there's a debate on what you want to do. Most prefer neutral. Uh, the fracture stem is uh, necessary if you're doing uh, orthoplasties in whatever form uh, to get the better tuberosity fixations. Just going on to a few cases of my clinical practice. Uh, this is 76-year-old female. Uh, you can see the X-rays are uh, pretty uh, obvious and not amenable for fixation. And I think there's no debate that we all will uh, do a reverse on this patient. So another patient, 63 year old, uh, not amenable for fixation. And uh, again, this is a doubt whether you want to do hemi or reverse. And I opted for hemi uh, with uh, tuberosities coming on quite well with good functional outcome. And very similar, uh, 65 year old, um, we can debate again, I went on for hemi, which uh, did reasonably well. Uh, this is one uh, of my uh, uh, collections for my autobiography, my call it as 69 year old, uh, done elsewhere. This actually was treated for uh, literally six months of non-union. Uh, although the component is loose, uh, the surgeon tried to treat it non-operatively to try and get the fragment uh, heal and then the uh, second surgery would be easier. But six months on, there was still non-union, patient had no function. And uh, with whatever results, options, and uh, resources available, this is what I could do. Uh, that was the longest stem available to bypass the tip, uh, medial uh, fibular strut graft and lateral plating uh, with cyclage wires around, tensionable. But I think now we have uh, different, uh, without uh, metal one, which are, are tensionable ones. So she was doing fine, and actually it was my mistake. The son called up to say, right, can she go to Hajj? I said, okay, she can. And then this is the x-ray I get um, after some time. Um, patient had to travel back all the way from Doha to Dubai. I don't know, I did tell them consider going to Germany or other parts, but they opted to come to me. Um, so I did um, go inside, uh, put metal plate and then return to, and this is x-rays uh, literally seven months after the second surgery, uh, which I'm pleased to say that there is union. And if I get a call to say that they want to go to Hajj, I know what my answer would be, please don't go. <clears throat> so the pearls of the rheumat uh, RSA is functional outcomes, particularly with forward elevation and intellectual rotation. Uh, they do well with when tuberosities heal. Uh, Re-establishing humeral length and rotation are essential, and using medial calcare is a helpful reference point to ensure proper height. 
Of course, if you don't do any of the above correctly, uh, then there are pitfalls into that one. Over-tensioning the soft tissue either out of concern for instability or component malposition can lead to acromial stress. And hemiarthroplasty, uh, they, it is intimately related to the ability of anatomically reducing the tuberosities. And that is a challenge to reestablish anatomic height and version. Numerous methods can provide to get this right. Intraoperative use of fluoroscopy is a good technique to ensure the anatomic reduction. And if you do have to uh, under science rather than overstuffing the joint. The future studies, um, I think it is a good one to do with the cemented or uncemented. I think there's still a role for specific patients. Uh, we know that now many series are available for RSA to be doing well above 50 years of age. So is that now going to be ca coming down from 70 or from to 50 onwards? I think that's something future will tell us. So if the take-home message, if there is any well-done hemi in young patients, obtaining good version, tuberosity is much better. And when basic principles are applied, uh, RSA gives us superior results, and to an extent it is forgiving as well. Thank you, Bo. The, the floor is now open for questions, if there are any from the audience. So I have a question for George. George, so you showed your a wonderful case for your 1A fracture, which was managed arthroscopically with uh, two metal screws. Now, sometimes we are not so fortunate to get a big chunk. And as you're drilling across, you're always, you always have that fear that it might shatter through. So is this something which you preoperatively decide that you're going to go, uh, or you're going to be committed to use a metal metallic implant? Or is it an intraoperative decision that you, that you decide to go ahead and use screws and not anchors or not do a double row fixation? I think the, the important thing is the uh, medial to lateral width of the fragment. I find as we go more peripherally, it gets smaller, and I really like the suture anchor technique, but as we get more medial extension, I find the candidate screws actually work quite well. And I, I feel, um, uh, uh, um, I just seem, when I have larger fragments, I have a much more difficult time with the suture anchors because I find I, it's harder for me to get the reduction versus with the, because I find sometimes I pass the sutures and I tie them, it translates the fragment. And I find that switching to using the pinning technique just to get the reduction and then putting the screws, and I've been much happier. All right, thanks. Any other questions from the floor? Okay, so if that's great, I thank all the speakers for their wonderful talks. And uh, if we can get an audio link from the OT and whether they're ready for the next case. Can, we, can I also invite the uh, moderators for the next live surgery? May I request uh, Dr. Nandan Adla and Dr. Ram Chidambaram to come on stage to moderate the next session. Going on to case number three, we have a 63-year-old male who is a known diabetic, left shoulder, multiple dislocations more than 100 times. First episode was 14 years back, multiple sleep dislocations, no dislocations for the last five years. On clinical examination, he has an ARM of uh, 130, 140, 45 buttocks, ER90 was 60 and IR90 was zero. Going under the cuff strength, bilateral grade five, crepitus was present, UCLA was scored to be 13, ASC is 30, VAS was noted to be seven on 10. He actually takes two analgesics per day for the pain. These are the x-rays. You can see erosion in the lenoid and wear. So this is the CT image. Clearly shows uh, OA changes over the glenoid and glenoid is in retroversion. The axial image. Going into the coronal image. Similar OA findings both in the humeral head and the glenoid.
sad sections. Now going over to Dr. Ashish Gupta for the Acuna planning. Okay. Hi, Ashish. Hey guys. Uh, hi, Ashish. Can you hear yes. me? Yeah, we can. It's Ram and uh, Nandan here. Hey, Ram Nandan. <clears throat> thank you for this. Uh, I'd really like to thank the whole team here. So we've got Dr. Nair, we've got Vedant, Karthik, Tin, and the most important person is Poonam, who's the scrub team here. Okay. Uh, can we show the case, please? Uh, case has been shown. I think we are waiting for your uh, planning. And have you show, yeah, can you show us the preoperative planning? So I examined this patient. He's a 63-year-old guy. His active elevation was roughly 130, 140 degrees. And you can see, uh, you know, with George in the room, it's, it's a B2 glenoid with a little bit of subluxation at the back. Can we go to the next uh, plan? For this the next one this is just the 3d images go to the next please so here you can see um it is really variable where you measure the the retroversion but it's it's around an 11 degree uh, retroversion it's got an arthritic uh, glenoid here we go next um so we're going to do a comprehensive with an augment because uh, he doesn't have a lot of medialization which we measured um, and with an 11 degree defect i measured the medialization at the back of around six millimeters so in my head, I decide whether or not I'm going to use a bio-RSA or if I'm going to use a metallic augment. And if my, impl if my lateralization I want to achieve is less than one centimeter, because that's the minimum amount of bone graft I need before uh, I will kill the axillary nerve, then I will usually use an augmented base plate. So this case was you know, an excellent case to demonstrate uh, the same here. Um, and he's a very tiny patient, like an Indian size, Indian male. So we're going to go a six, uh, six millimeter uh, humeral stem here. Okay? Is that right so far? So we'll come in directly intraoperatively, if you can see the screen. So I want to show a few things first. Can you show the setup? So this is how my standard setup is. I've got all my retractors here. Um, I've got the Fakuda here. My scissors are here somewhere. Poonam's taking them away. Um, and then at the back table there, I just want to show the, the back table next to Poonam. Can we swap over to the back table, please? Yeah, those are the only instruments I need to do this operation. So I've done over 700 shoulder replacements with less than 20 instruments. And that's because of preoperative planning, optimizing what we're going to do. And just that set of instrumentation and what's on the Mayo table will help us to do this operation. Um, can you show the setup, which is really important? Just zoom out and show the room, please. So I'm standing on this side of the patient, which is the other side. My scrub nurse is standing on the other side, and that's all her domain. We've got the blood-brain barrier for the anesthetist with the see-through drape so that we can still communicate. Um, and uh, usually I use a spider arm, but uh, uh, we've got uh, Karthik and Vedanti are going to help us. So come intraoperatively now. So I want to do the whole case. We'll try and get through as much as we can live. Okay. So, standard delta pectoral approach. I'm going to take this one out. And I just want to show the anatomy. So, here is the, my forcep, uh, is the, I'm just going to elevate this. You can see this is the, just a second, Tim. This is the conjoint tendon. Can you guys see everything clearly? Yeah, clear. So, this is the conjoint tendon. Here is the CA ligament. So, I'm going to have a blunt, a sharp woman here. I'm going to put it on the top of the CA ligament. Now, people say, do you sacrifice the CA ligament or you don't? And I do, because it compromises my view quite significantly on the top. So I'm going to cut this, and th this is the triangle which George showed me, uh, the Mordenheim's triangle, which is uh, the conjoint tendon here and the CA ligament there. And I'm going to incise this CA ligament. So... You are who you are because of your mentors, uh, your parents, and you can achieve what you can because of your wife. So, can we turn that volume down, please? Because it's right in my ear. So, that's the CA ligament in size there. There's always a bleeder of the CH. Sorry, that's the CH going off now, too. And I'm going to go all the way to the glenoid with that. So the next thing which, which we're going to do here, which is really important, is I'm going to put this. 
underneath here. I'm just going to swap positions with you. Just watch your camera for a second, please. Can you come on this side? Okay. And I'm going to put this over here. And you're going to move that forward. Okay. Can I have a pair of forceps? Thank you. So, and a sponge. So can we get the camera on top? I want, it, I want to show this way. Here. So I'm just going to move Christine. Can you see the three yeah, sisters we, here? We can visualize that very well. Okay, so yeah. this is a very important part of a reverse shoulder replacement. So those are your three sisters. I'm going to put my finger here. Okay, and here's the auxiliary nerve. Can you see the auxiliary there? Yes. Can the audience see the auxiliary? Yes. It's just here. Okay, can you see it? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a blunt homan. And this blunt homan goes on top of the auxiliary here. Can everyone see that? Yes. Yeah. And then this blunt homan will go this way and this retractor is going to come out. So my assistant in the front has the auxiliary throughout the case and it's protected. Okay? It's a very important step for me when I do a reverse because as I said earlier on, I want to know where my enemies are. Okay. This is the most important part of how far your dissection goes. I've just taken the top of the lat, but this is your lat dorsi. Can we see the lat dorsi clearly? Yes. So the junction of where the subscap and the lat dorsi need to go is this is your junction where the inferior capsule is going to be. I've coagulated the, the three sisters there. So we're going to do that. Can I have a Cobbs, Cobbs elevator, please? Thank you, Poonam. And... George showed me how to do this, George, so I still do it the way you showed me. So I'm going to ask Christine to hold this. But one of the differences is that, take the artery off, is I don't start dissecting my subscap from top to bottom, because the top bit's the easier bit. And I do a peel, and I will start peeling off from bottom to top. And we we'll just need you to get a sucker, somebody. We can... Yeah. Thank you. So See? I use my scrub as an assistant and just suck here. And so you I don't pull. isolate the biceps. Uh, I, I did before. Uh, was it Ram? Sorry. No, Nandan. Nandan. Nandan yeah. Uh, Deepthi, yeah, I did isolate the biceps. As I said, I'm a biceps killer thanks to the French. And the biceps are just here and I got the bleeder. So we're just elevating this here. And I'm going to keep going from the bottom. Can I have some wash, please? Just an announcement that the lunch is being served at the back. The partition has been opened so you could pick up a plate and wash the So surgery. I've got peroxide mix, mixed with my saline. That's what I use to wash. I wash every 10 seconds so that uh, diatomy is a bit sus. And then Christine's going to keep levering uh, so that my subscap can be visual. No pressure. George is watching very attentively. George, you can tell me if I'm doing something wrong. So, so see here, the, the capsule starts coming into view. And we're going to start externally rotating the arm. Because you'll usually get the, the bleeders. And the important bit is then this always stays inside. I'm going to give you my thing for a second. And I'm going to ask you to start externally rotating, please. Suck there, please. Then. And forward flex. So because my corpse is intraarticular, the auxiliary nerve is under Christine or, or Poonam. And there's an gold osteophyte here. We're just going to keep peeling this away. Can you see that osteophyte? We can get rid of this one now. So this is in our way. And we're going to do that. I'm going to externally rotate. Can you guys see the osteophyte? Yes, we can. So usually, I just can stop a second. So usually the, what we need to go is below, we need to go below this. Can I get a nibbler, please? I'm going to externally rotate more. Thank you, Poonam. Do 
Do you have another cobs? Thank you. Do you have another cobs? It's coming. Do you have another kind of... Uh, thank you. This is perfect. So we'll use this. And the, the key is I'm peeling off the inferior capsule from the humerus. And I want you to do, do that. Do we have another cobs? Could I use... Uh, And the key is as long as you stay inside the joint, you're safe and Christine's uh, letting the tension go off the homen and I've released the inferior capsule here. Yeah, I'll have another sponge. Good. You see that give? Did you guys see that give? I don't know if you did, but that's the inferior capsule which is off. So this is a peroxide soaked sponge. This goes in here to protect the deltoid throughout the case. So I'm happy with that. We're gonna go this way. We're gonna go this way. And could I have a Fakuda please? The Fakuda. Okay, I'm gonna swap you. Now reposition this. Okay. We're going to go like that. And this retractor will go at the one o'clock position. There. And can I have some wash, please? Thank you. So, uh, four sips. So, this is the superior part of the subscap, which is going to the glenoid. Can you see this? Yes. Can we stop talking in my ear, please? Because I can't uh, focus. And this is the rotator interval, which is really important to release. Okay, now, so dissecting scissors. I don't cut the humeral head at this point because to externally rotate the humeral head, you cause a lot of force on the axillary nerve and I'll show you that. Mm -hmm. So, subscap, glenoid, and I'm gonna go in this plane here. Christine's gonna relax a little bit. Sure. So that's your sure. MGHL. And that MGHL is cut. Okay, can I have my Cobb's elevator again? Christine's gonna relax. So, this is your subscap muscle advancement. Because you can see, we've gone a fair way. And I have the Batman retractor, please. No, nope. the fang, yeah. The big one, thank you. So that's Batman, as I've been taught. And we're gonna put that there. That bleeder will settle down in a second. Just have some peroxide wash. Thank you for that. And can I have my 15 blade a bit, please? Thank you, Poonam. So because the auxiliary nerve is with Christine, I'm just going to release this because it makes life easy. I'm going to have my forceps, please. And that's excise. Then the next thing I'm going to do is go to the back. Cobs, please. Mm -hmm. 
relax that for me please you have to own the glenoid in a retroverted glenoid so releasing this that's out back again here again suck again for me Cobb's elevator please and off so what I need you to do is I need you to tilt the oh. tilt it like that and you'll see suddenly my space gets increased so my suction please 15 blade the assistant is just tilted the humeral head back and I'm gonna release the inferior capsule here for now there's a lot of damage we do while we retract to the auxiliary nerve and we never pay effect on it and I'll show that with a nerve simulator so just releasing this here and I have the robin the other small retractor the, the subscap and the robin the smaller subscap retractor yeah that one Poonam one of those just one of those uh, Ashish how far you do the inferior release all the way so I'll show you and relax this thing. So there you go, hold both of these. Sucker for me, please, and a wash. And you have to own the anterior neck of the glenoid. Can you see the whole anterior neck of the glenoid there? Yes, yes. And that's really important for us to be able to make sure that our implant's really low when we do it. So I'm gonna stop at this point. There you go, there. There we go, there. Can we have the two-prong retractor? The the, play, the Playboy retractor. Yeah, two prong. So that goes under the humeral head. And uh, can I have another blunt homing? And I'm gonna ask you to come on that side. And this, this blunt homing goes underneath. And then you can see, you see how easily the whole head comes out? There's no force on it. There's no traction on it, and this retractor is relaxed. And there's, so I've cut the supraspinatus, and then this two prong will go on either end of the supra and infraspinatus. Can you see that landmark? Yes, yes. That's uh, very yes. important to tell you how far you need to cut. So can I have some peroxide wash again? There you go. Okay, thank you. Please stop me if you. Have any questions? I think using that uh, two prong so, there is a good idea, but uh, does it not dig into the head? No. If uh, Karthik digs into the head, he's buying me beers. So I take off all the chondral surface because I use bone graft a lot. And this is the easiest point of time where you can take off all your chondral surface so that you have bleeding bone. Okay, wash again. So we recently published a study to show the uh, usefulness of these extra medullary jigs we use. And we think 10 degrees, 15 degrees, this and that makes a huge difference. But we did a study where we looked at the humeral cut we made and with the jig and followed that up with post-operative uh, implant positioning. And there was a 15 degree variation and a 10 degree variation in women. So what we think is a 20 degree cut here, I don't know what it is, clearly. So my cut is dependent on, uh, die for me again, please. You can only cut as far as the cuff. Can you see that? The cuff's at the back there. This is my neck uh, for a comprehensive. So there's no science to this. So you're going at the right articular edge. Well, I decide based on if it's too tight or too long. I'm, my cut's purely dependent on the insertion of the posterior cuff.
Thank you. Have the diaphragm again. Ashish, what about the version? Uh, I think that was 15 degrees, and that's what I'm saying, that even if we think we put it in a certain amount of version, it's actually all BS with the extra medullary jig. So, but my, my normal rule is I'd like to cut it to 15 to 20 degrees of version. Mm -hmm. Have the protection plate. I know a lot of people cut it at 30 degrees, but there's no science to prove one way or the other because there's so many confounding variables. So got a little bit of a protection plate there. And now we're gonna do the glenoid further. So, and I swap this. Okay, I need a sharp home in first. So that goes to you, sorry. So, sharp home in at one o'clock, two prong. Two prong grows at the bottom. Christina will come out. So that's there. So I want to show the retractors because this is a really important part of the operation. Have the cobs, please. Batman. Do we Can have. Just zoom out and show the arm position. Please? Yeah, and I'll change that in a second. So that's the Batman there. Have a Robin. One of those. Do we have drape tape? No, we don't need drape tape, actually. We'll use uh, uh, towel, towel clips. You have towel or an artery or a towel clip. So one goes, it's okay, we'll start with this one. And then have another one, please. Can we have a zoom out picture on one of the screens, please, to look at the arm position? Alice, thank you. Uh, that looks good, thank you. This will come out. Okay, I'll pop this back here. So now I'm going to ask the anesthetist to co-plane the bed away from me, please. Can you tilt the bed away from me? No, the other way. It's a 50% chance and it's always Murphy's Law. A little bit more. Thank you. So this helps you visualize the glenoid better. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to hold a hand. Let me let go. And I usually have the spider at this point in my hand. And I'm going to hand, I'm going to put it like this. So can you come on this side, please? Suction goes to Christine. Uh, can you turn the left side screen so that you can see vertical glenoid? It is just now flat. Yeah. And can I adjust the light, please? Intro. Okay, is that still sterile? Okay, good. Okay. So Ram, sir, you want it flat, is it? Left side. Turn. Left uh, turn, eh? Rotate. Yeah, rotate. Okay, okay. Uh, hand camera rotate. Yeah, 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 a bit more. Okay. Is that okay, sir? Yes. Good. And can we focus the light a bit more? So can I have the knife and uh, 15 blade? I just need this. Sure. Murph Murphy's law. Can I have new top gloves, please? So we'll start with this. So. I'm going to excise the back. So I'm in the junction of the capsule and the labrum. And usually the posterior labrum is hypertrophic in a osteoarthritic type B. I need another blade, please. It's really important to get a sharp blade out the back because if you twist and you break that, it's a 45 minute extravaganza to find that blade. Okay, uh, Cobb's elevator, please. So then we're going to do the same. We're going to go to the back, Cobb's elevator. And there that goes, Cobb's elevator. There that goes, Robin. Yep, no, that's. Thank you. And that goes under my Cobb's elevator there. You have to hold that and that together with one hand and this one with this hand. Good. 
Can we raise the table a bit more? And let me have this one. Can, you got those two? Perfect. Uh, I want to excise that later. I'm going to give this back to you. Knife, please. Forceps. Cobbs, please. Relax that one. Okay, so this is what I want to show everyone. Suck. Is this a nibbler for me for a second? I'm going to get some peroxide wash because it's a very important step. Why do you use a hydrogen peroxide wash? Just for bleeding? Three, three reasons, uh, Nandan. Number one, it's a hemostatic agent. Num number two, it's a bactericidal agent. So the hemostatic agent reduces your bleeding, but it gives you a clean view. And the most important thing is, uh, I hate blood. So, can this is really, okay. can I have my dissecting scissors? Have some peroxide wash, just to prove to Nandan, and a sponge for a second. So what I'm doing here, is I'm gonna really, don't suck please. Who needs enemies when you've got friends? Um, the most important step here is to release the long head of the triceps. So I'm a very firm believer that you need to release the long head of the triceps because that makes a very big difference to your excursion and your glenoid exposure. So we just packed this here. I've taken my capsule out completely. I've excised the labrum. There's always a bleeder at the back there, at the bottom. But I want you to be able to show this. And we can see the whole glenoid. All can the you way. see this here? Yeah. yeah. That's the long head of the triceps. Can you appreciate that? And as soon as I'm going to incise this, thank you for that. Uh, there's suddenly a blow for freedom okay. relax again let me have this one there's still something holding me back there we go so now with the arm in this position and this like that. You see you've owned the glenoid. Can we adjust the camera? The camera needs to come from here, guys. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Try better to see end face. Yeah, that's what I'm... And then this just goes down here. Can we co-plane the bed a bit more? I need the camera to be on my right shoulder, please. No, the other way. A bit more. Thank you. That's it. That's better. Can you see that now? Uh, just a second, sir. Good tune. Make it vertical. Okay. Yeah, let's can go we? One and two. Let's go one and two. Can we make the camera, the glenoid vertical, please? A bit more. One. And zoom out. Thank you. And can you bring it lower? The camera needs. I don't know which camera that is, but. That's the handled one. That's behind your shoulder, sir. Sure. Good. So can you see that? Yeah, you can see a nice posterior wear. So you can see posterior wear. You can see superior wear. Yeah. Okay. So, can I have the, the jig, just to position, and I have my second gloves, please. Thank you. And can I have my K-wire loaded up? So, I always use my reamers and the K-wires, which I'm used to, irrespective of what kit we use. We planned a 25 millimeter here, and uh, can we paralyze the patient a bit more? And when I measured it, it was seven millimeters of offset here. So all I'm trying to figure out here is the position superior inferiorly. The version and all I will fix in a second. So roughly it says it should go there. Um, back home, we use MR for this. The robots are coming in. All sorts of stuff's going to happen. I'll take the bottom retractor. So the key here is this is like playing pool now. 
okay? So that's eroded. This is like snooker. I'm gonna use this as a snooker kit. I'm gonna put it roughly there. And for all of us who don't have navigation, we're like seven degrees off by experienced hands and experienced surgeons. And experienced surgeons are 10 degrees off in a study which we published. So I'm gonna roughly put it here. And if I'm in the right spot, I'm gonna oscillate to get the maximum depth into the glenoid. My elbow's not sterile, so just don't touch my elbow. I need an offside. Okay, can I have my reamer, please? You also factor in that uh, tilt you have given on the table. I have right? given the tilt. I, it might be a little hard to see from where we are there, but there's definitely a tilt here. I don't. Can I, I need to move my hand back. So you got to step back, please. I need you to step back, please. Thank you. That's good. And you can actually take a view from far away. So I like this reamer. It's a cutout reamer. Are we back? Good. And can you zoom in? So this is a cutout reamer. And if you go without control, that is what happens. That was intentional. I wanted to show that. The osteophyte's broken. So you always start this before. Go gentle because that osteophyte's going to break. Is it, is it because it's very sharp? Is it because it's very sharp, Reamer? It, even if they're not sharp, orthopedic surgeons are stronger than anything else. <laughs> so in real life, to ream the back, I don't use a reamer, I use a burr. So I use a handheld burr to do the back there. So that's all I need for now. Cocker. I'm gonna give you this one at the bottom. One hand for both of those, one hand for that. Thank you, Cocker, thank you. See, I didn't take any osteophytes out so far, and I'm going to take them out now. So nibbler, please. And don't try and pull them off, because you'll fracture an osteopenic bone. So I make radial cuts. Uh, Ashish, yeah. hey, it's George. Just a question. Why did you make the first drill hole? I think I lost you there. You made a drill hole, and then you switched to make another one. Because I just think if I do it with the first drill hole, my angle placement is wrong, because the retractors are in the way and that jig oh i see so the, you, okay so you, you you made the first drill hole with the guide and you felt that it was not in the right position so you moved it then i always just try and find the superior inferior inclination like the position the 25 mil from the inferior edge with the first drill hole and then i decide my version and inclination freehand okay i trust my gut feeling more than the jigs george so So, cobs, please. So this bottom bit needs to be cleaned up more, and this retractor needs to be positioned better. So I'm gonna take this off. So I'm on subscap here, on the scapula. And this is that inferior osteophyte, which is still there. Peroxide wash, please. Thank you. Okay, so uh, nibbler again. We're gonna take this bottom bit out. Do you have a straight nibbler or they're all curved? You'll manage. It's okay, Poonam. Don't worry. I don't wanna keep you happy. This is yours. I'm gonna reposition this. And can you see that my bottom is completely clear? Yes. Okay, so this is really important. Now, because this is a comprehensive and I'm gonna inset the implant a little bit, I don't need to take this bottom bit out. If I was doing a tonier or a medacta or a volutis where the, the base plate engages on top of the, the glenosphere engages on top of the base plate, you need to take this rim out completely, but in this system, I don't need to do that. So I'm gonna give you that. Okay, uh, can I have the, so uh, this, the wire so driver? This is an inlay glenoid. Well, because the joint line, we measured it preoperatively, I need to pull this guide wire out. 
because I measured it um, and I didn't want to lateralize him too much. And I'll show you this in a second because we've got a nerve stimulator. Mm -hmm. If I do that, I'm scared with a comprehensive, I lateralize them too much. Because with a comprehensive, you've got a Morse taper lateralization of six degrees, which is built in there. So can I have my reamer again? I'm really, really pedantic about taking all the subchondral bone out. It's not a total shoulder. I want my half cut reamer, please. Thank you. And normally, as I said, I would use a burr for this, but today we're just gonna use the reamer to get this thing going. Uh, you have to have cancellous bone. It doesn't matter whether you use dead metal or dead bone. The blood needs to come through and it needs to incorporate. And nothing incorporates on ivory. So I like the fact that it's bleeding. That's a good sign. Can we have the base plate ready, please? And the standard screws ready. So I've got it just gentle. So have you changed the... Uh I've changed the position of the guide wire, guide wire yeah. just to get some bleeding at the back. And you saw I was really, really slow and careful with it. Now I'm going to have the guide wire again. The wire driver, please. Thank you. And I'm just going to drill. You see how hard the bone is at the back? I've had cases when I started doing this with the Neo Reamer where I never got the sharpest instruments because more important surgeons had them. So I fractured the back and it was a nightmare. Now, can we have the reamer for the Zimmer system? So this part of the operation for me is the same. It doesn't matter what device company I use. Peroxide wash, just to show the audience. And can you see that pepper pot bleeding from everywhere? Yes. Deepthi? Yes, we can. Okay, good. We yes, just we just felt that you're taking too much of the subchondral bone off, but I think that's how you do it, so. Yeah, guide wire again, sorry, first. Uh, it's really important. I've had really good results with allograft incorporation and autograft incorporation, and if you don't do that, you can't really, uh, the bone grafts don't heal. Okay, now the Zimmer drill, the Zimmer uh, peg drill, Rima, thank you. So this is the Zimmer, Zimmer uh, Rima, you've got to get this in. Um, I'm really cautious everybody in India because the glenoids are much smaller and the central boss is around 12 to 14 mils. So if you don't hold this properly, you can blow out the front or back of the glenoid uh, very easily. So very slow. No force here. I'm going really slow. And that's us. Good old. Okay, wire driver again and the drill for the central screw. So the central screw is a 6.5 mil screw, so we need a 3.2 mil drill or something of like that. In some osteopenic patients, I don't drill because it becomes too loose. So I just use the guide wire and I put my screw in. But this guy's got strong bones, so we're going to go with the drill. And it's bleeding quite nicely. And there's a guide, a golden guide, which goes on top. I don't like many jigs in life. It just, but usually there's jigs for everything. So we're gonna go slow here again. I'm feeling the back. And there we go. Okay, let's have the base plate. Base plate, thank you. I don't like to wash or suck too much here because they're stem cells and people pay a lot of money for stem cells, so we should save them. So this is the augmented base plate. There's this general belief that the base plate augment always needs to go to the top, and that's not correct. The augment goes where the deformity is. The corollary to that is that the holes are perpendicular to the augment. So if you put the augment at a less than a 90 degree turn, your screws will be in the wrong direction. So our defect here was posterior inferior because that's where 
most of the B2 defects are. So I'm not going to put my augment in this direction. I'm going to put my augment in this direction so that my superior and inferior screws go that way. A question from Peter. Just can you wait for a second? Just let me just bash this thing in. Okay. Okay. And then I will take your question. I'm usually used to a slightly bigger mallet, but Ashish is a gentler person than I am. So can you zoom out and show my hand position? So yeah, very we can, important. You can see that. Okay, so very important thing for the hand position is when you put this, the tendency is to do that. Your hand really needs to go lower down. And you see how I'm bending? I'm bending down to get this thing in. Okay, central screw, please. Hey, Ashish. Wash again now. Yes, I'll take the question now. Wash, yeah. please. So we're loving your exposure. This is Peter Chalmers speaking. I had a quick question for you. So when you had, um, it looked like you reamed twice. Yes. How can you ensure that the second reaming is going to be at the same angle as the augment? Like, how can you ensure that with that reaming, your augment is You can't. You can't. It's completely not. So as I said, I would normally use a burr. And I would prepare that and I would take out the subchondral bone and I want my implant actually to compress inwards. So it's down here at the bottom. I can feel it's completely down. The top bit is not down. Top, yeah. You can see there's a gap there on the top, Small but the ma there's a major defect at the bottom. So I'm going to get a cobs. Can you get a cocker, please? So Ashisha, are you going to bone graft the superior portion of the base? I'm just plate? going to leave it alone. I'm just going to leave it alone. It doesn't make any difference. I don't think it does because based on our 50% rule, if you have two screws, 50% construct, two lock screws, it's a stable construct. So the fact that I've got a gap on the top means I've got inferior tilt. I don't want to bone graft this patient because I'm worried I would lateralize him too much with a bio RSA. My posterior augment is sitting at the B2. My screw position is, I'm dialing this so that I can get my screw position in the right spot. For me, that is more important than where the augment is going to potentially sit, but I've got my 50% rule covered here. So I'm going to get the central screw now. George, does that make sense? My priority here is to get fixation, and when you get the compression here, this will get compressed in further. And this is a good bite. Ashish, huh? As such, the base plate, when you put in, is there a primary fixation component? Um, I didn't primary stability, or you had to use the screw to get the primary fixation? See, the reason why I don't, I like the augments, but I don't hang my hat on them. They're really good situation, but I have to get my screw in the right spot. Now, once I've tightened this, and it's the same situation with multiple different augment companies, this is rock solid now. So, can I have a wash? Can you show us the lower margin of the glenoid plate? Yeah, I will. So. Can I have a cobs, please? So see, that's the lower margin. It's right at the bottom here with the triceps and the soft tissue here. And I don't want to take it off to compromise the bottom. Can you see that? Yeah, so yeah. that's the bottom of the glenoid. You can see that. Where I'm falling right down. Thank okay, you. can I have the drill for the screws? Thank you. Can I have the two screws open, please? And your aim is to put only superior inferior screws. Correct. Right? So I don't want this to go in this direction. That is what I was taught initially, but I think that if you get grade three or four notching, your poly is gonna rub on that screw. So I wanna go almost parallel and we wanna go posterior inferior because that's where the column is. So. Drill, 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 and I'm in bone. I would normally put a 42 millimeter screw or a 40 mil screw here. So see, I'm all the way in bone. And in the top here, I'm to try to angle this, or cheat a little bit, into the coracoid column. And that's a solid screw there. So it's going to bleed a little bit. And my screw, please. Yeah, the longer screw, the inferior screw. 30, 35, right? Longer screw first, please, always. Thank you. So this is the, the longer screw. It 
If you've reamed more and you've reamed through the subchondral bone, it'll bleed more, but that's a good sign. So we're gonna lock this. The screws in the comprehensive are friggin' awesome. And the top, I don't wanna compress the top because I don't want this base plate to tilt superiorly. So if you're using a system where the superior screw is a non-lock screw, I put a Cobb's elevator there and keep the base plate off the top because I wanna maintain inferior inclination. Okay, that's solid. Okay, can I have wash? Do you have a bone hook? That's a huge bone hook. Are you guys happy with that? Yeah, it looks solid. Okay, they're happy. Can I have that nubbin to check if my screw is deep down enough? Can we paralyze the patient, please? Just another bolus of paralysis. So this is just to make sure that your central screw is down enough and your glenosphere is gonna go on top. Okay, have the glenosphere, please. Yeah, sorry, 36 glenosphere, please open it. And just put it in a standard position, no eccentricity. So can you show it to me here and I can explain that to the audience because it's really important. Can you open the glenosphere and show us how the dialing works? Okay, so do we have the camera here? So this is the glenosphere. And a very good thing about, can you see it or is it shiny? Yes. Uh, the dialing type. You have a dialing technique, so you can dial it in any direction you want. Okay. If I put it like this, can you see? Too sharp. If you see that, you get more eccentricity at the bottom or on the top, and you can dial it in any direction uh, you want. So if it's a loose joint, I want a little bit of eccentricity. If it's a tight joint, I don't want any eccentricity. So in this patient, I'm gonna go Goldilocks, neither here nor there, and uh, somewhere between a B and a C. Uh, questions, uh, Ashish, how often do you do eccentric? Uh, I wouldn't know. Not normally. So I use a Medacta system right now and the Zimmer Comprehensive, and you can dial that. I really will not be able to tell you and uh, is it, uh, would you plan that as well? Be no, off? so this is purely based on my soft tissue tensioning. Tensioning, per operative decision. My decision right now is that the humerus is really lateralized. I can like really retract the humerus quite easily. There's not a lot of contracture here. We've got excellent paralysis. So this is a loose patient for me. So him, I will just make a little bit of eccentricity because it's a 36 glenosphere. And it's actually a 40 millimeter construct because there's a four millimeter la lateralization which is built on the screw taper. Can I have the introducer? Okay, I'll just mark, and a marking pen. So my eccentricity has been marked at the bottom here, and I, I would normally mark the top, because I can see the top, I can't see the bottom, if that makes sense. Okay, can I have the holder? Okay, so this is a really important step, the two-pronged retractor. It's just there, the bunny ears. The bunny ears, yeah, the two-prong, the bunny ears is there. So this is a really important step, and I need you to relax a little bit, but not too much, but just to show the audience, probably this one is there. Relax the top. Okay, so we call this the shoulder haka. Okay, so the infraspinatus is relaxed, the arm is relaxed, my eccentricity is dialed this way. I'm gonna bend my head. Can you zoom out and show them how I'm gonna do this? Okay, no, but, so I'm gonna bend down and this is gonna come in this position. And as soon as this comes in, my bottom retractor is gonna come out and this is gonna go down. So, I've never used this introducer before, but I'd, I'll cop it. And at this point of time, I want you to relax this because otherwise you'll pull my base plate out. I mean my glenosphere out. So three taps, one for the lawyer, one for the patient, one for me, and then three again. 
battery again. Bone hook, please. In a taper where you don't have a central screw, you have to check that you've got this down and it's not gonna dissociate. So I rock it to make sure this is not gonna dissociate and this is down. So I'm happy with that. So now, this is a really important part of the operation for me. So we've got all the retractors out and this is my humerus. That's okay, Christine. Can you guys see the joint? Yeah. Okay, so I can get my finger just in between the humerus and the glenosphere. Okay, with the patient completely paralyzed. I can barely get my finger in. So this is lateral, this is a tight joint for me. And if I were to put a bigger glenosphere or put a bigger bone graft, this would have become extremely tight and I wouldn't have been able to reduce this. Does that make sense? So this is my, this is my trial. Okay, I wanna swap sides with you. Can I give you the arm? Can I have another uh, uh, sponge, peroxide soak sponge? Just a bit duct of it. So we're going to protect the deltoid again. Two prong retractor. Okay, and the arm down here. Now this retractor comes out. Blunt Homan, please. Can we co-plane the bed backwards, please? Peroxide wash, thank you. Cobb's elevator. Back to me. Nibbler, please. Back to neutral. Okay, a bit more, please. Just watch this retractor. Thank you. That's enough. Thank you. Don't dig in. So, the arm is at neutral, horizontal. Don't pull, okay? Because you're going to stretch the auxiliary. So, just at neutral. We've got the whole view. Can the light be made a bit better or can you guys see clearly? Okay, Tim, can I give you this? Okay, so Cobb's elevator. Cobb's, I've got the Cobb's here, the second one. Mallet. Okay, so I'm just gonna take So I use this, I use a Grammont design quite often and I don't use any reamers for the humerus and I just take this bone out because I want to preserve bone to bone graft and we're going to preserve this bone not in a gall gully pot or a thing and the humeral head, can you put the humeral head in there too please the humeral head in there, okay now could I have the reamer please no, the humeral uh, sound, the, the gold one thank you, the, re uh, the sound on power and Okay, so this trick was taught to me by Laurent. I don't use it on the T. Just can you show how I'm holding it? So I'm holding it like this, and it's just the weight of this thing. Can you zoom? Uh, okay, we can see. It's just the weight of this thing which is gonna go down. One size up, six. And same here. You see, I've got no distal fixation at all. Do you agree with that? See, when I'm going down, I can keep going further. So my, my aim always is to undersize the humerus. Hmm. And I'm going to stay at six because I don't want any stress healing. Because I have a six trial, please. So, with this technique, because I'm taking less bone off, if I push this like this, I've medialized the humerus. Can you guys see that? Yeah. Yes. Yes. If I put my implant like this, I've lateralized the humerus. Yeah. Can you see that? If I push this all the way in, because this is an onlay system, you can't inlay and onlay it much, but you can play a little bit by bone grafting. So because I've undersized it, I'm gonna look from the top. And because I've undersized it, I have this ability to move it medially or laterally so that I can get my subscap repaired. So I'm gonna go as lateral as I can. And you see this is loose. Can you see that? Yeah. yeah. And I'm going to accept that. That's all I need. So that's our size, please. 
How do you get your version right, just for the audience? So there's a version guide on that. When the real implant goes in, we'll base it on that. So I'll show that. So can you open the implant? And I'm going to prepare holes for the subscap reattachment. So can we use juggernauts today? Yeah. Okay, give us the juggernaut drill. Open the humeral implant, mini tray. Juggernaut. Open the juggernaut, please. Nibbler for me. Any questions? No, all looking good so far. Now there's bone there. Who needs any? So if you can show the back table here while we're opening gear. Do we have a bigger nibbler? The bone graft is for the humeral. The humeral head. Yeah. Can you give me a bigger nibbler, please? Thank you. So you can open the implant, open the juggernauts. I need two juggernauts. Thank you so much. It's a bumper day for Zimmer. Juggernauts are for your uh, repair. Juggernauts are for my subscap repair. Subscap repair. But why not do an interosseous one? You can do it. It's just that I want to show two ways of doing things today. And uh, Zimmer have kindly donated the implant. Okay. <laughs> so, but because in some situations, if you have a periprosthetic fracture and you have cement mantle and you have other stuff in there, the juggernaut's really good because you can't do a transosseous repair many times. So I just wanted to show that to people as an option, as a get out of jail situation. So, okay, drill, thank you. 2.9 drill for the juggernaut, thank you. Watch out, elevate the arm and in, push the elbow up. So that's our lat dorsi just here. In a second, I'll drill broke. So you see, this is really good bone. So I'll need this back. Please don't take that away. Normally, we use juggernauts with needles, but I will manage. So this is a 2.9 mil juggernaut. So the advantage with this in a periprosthetic fracture or, a, or if or somewhere where you've got metal already in there. Second one, thank you. Is, uh, I'll, I'll do that, yeah, that will do that, Tim, that's a good idea. Uh, is that, uh, okay, second artery kindly. Can I have the drill again, please? And I need my Tycron uh, stay suture. So we're gonna do that. We're gonna put a Langen back here. Thank you. This is my lateral row in the bicepital groove. And then internally rotate, please. Watch your face, Karthik. This is to repair, watch, it, watch your face again, to repair my supraspinatus. So Deepthi, here is your transosseous. So combine both. You have to do a double row repair, subscap. We go on and on about subscap repairs. Uh, when we do arthroscopic surgery, there's sessions and sessions dedicated to it. And then we do a reverse and we say it doesn't matter. So if you do something, I believe, do it right. George published a study ages ago about plate fixation uh, versus no plate fixation, second uh, one. And Cocker, please. And uh, I don't know if George is still using a plate laterally for his repair. So this one goes to the back. And that's our setup. Ashish, the question is, if you have the glenoid lateralization and humeral also lateralized, subscap repair may be tight sometimes. Yeah, so, so I'm, you... putting, I'm putting my humerus as lateral as possible. Can we have better light there? Okay. So that my, my implant is going lateral, so I'm medializing my humerus. Okay, let's have the implant. Shish, we have 10 more minutes because yep. our theater is ready. 
Let's go. I thought the implant was open. Okay, it's mini tray. Open the mini tray. Smallest poly. Let's go. Thank you. Okay. So because this is a juggernaut, this is not bad. So I'm going to ask Christine to hold this. Can you see the version, guys? Yes. Yes. And at this point of time, I'm going to bone graft this. So that's in line with the forearm, the rod? Yes, it's in line with the forearm. But can, as you, can you zoom out one of the screen? Please. Oh, okay. I have a small cobs, please. So is this the same version for every patient or you change it from patient? I don't have any evidence to suggest cobs, sorry. I don't have any evidence to suggest that uh, I should change it because it, we're w working on a study with post-operative CT scans. Watch that one, Tim. In my career, I've hardly ever used a size 10 or a 12 millimeter stem. My bulk of my work back home in Australia is a six, seven or eight millimeter stem because I can bone graft all of them. Doing an impaction bone grafting before you put the stem in. That's Correct, you see how it is? In the, yeah. And this helps me control my medialization, lateralization and and I'm bone preserving. Stress shielding, the biggest complications in a reverse, the revisions are humerus related, they're not glenoid related. So now if you look at it, see this is stuck. Hmm. Can you see that? Yes. Yeah. Nice technique. So this is not going in. Please, uh, and just be careful, don't uh, rip my GT. You're gonna be in massive shit if that happens. Okay, mallet. So I'm pushing laterally. Can you see my arm? Yeah. The yeah. version's maintained. And the weight of the mallet. This is Ashish's mallet, so we're going to hit a little bit harder. But it's just the weight of the mallet. And only the wrist motion, not the elbow. No. And then once it's halfway down, stress relaxation for the surgeon and the bone. Mini tray, smallest poly, please. Thank you. So you're recreating the native version. I'm recreating the 15, de it's 15 degrees. 20 degrees here, so. Okay. So I'm not gonna go all the way, because I'm gonna bash the implant in for the next. So we're gonna reposition this. Can we have, are you okay? Okay. I'm gonna reposition this to see the back. Sorry, we're just a little short of time, but this is an important step to see wash at this point of time. And can you see the impaction bone grafting there? Yeah, okay. yes. And then the poly goes, and the base plate goes in. Oh, you can. It says superior for dummies there. Yes. Just in case intellect's a bit low. And I need you to support the arm with your hand there and the elbow. So just support the elbow. And so see, I've got a laterally directed force here. So I'm making sure my stem doesn't go into varus. Wait a bit more. Okay, wash. Do you ever have a dissociation of that? Uh, I haven't had one so far. You worry about it, but the biomechanical testing shows that it's really solid. So I do trust the engineers. More bone graft, please. So this prosthesis is the metaphysical fit, correct? Correct. Nibbler. So just in case if you don't have enough bone or... Uh, cemented. Cemented. Don't complicate life. You don't, this is not a femur. I never <laughs> want to put a big implant in, which, uh, smaller nibbler, please. Thank you. I never want to put a big implant in 
because uh, stress shielding is a big, a lot of revisions I do are be, uh, because of stress shielding. A little bit more bone. Okay, wash please. Awesome, so I'm gonna swap sides with you now. I'm gonna come out with all the retractors and I'm gonna leave this one here. This comes out. Now I've got the arm. So you can fracture the humerus at this position. So we're gonna pull the, sorry, I just gotta get the two sutures. You haven't <laughs> trialed it uh, prior, Rashid? No, I never, I, I usually 99% of the times I don't trial, only in revisions. Because I've preoperatively planned and I looked at my tension, so I'm gonna. The trial size as well, pre op plan, or is that? It was based on my soft tissue tension. So I, I got the joint line back to neutral. Okay. I used a small glenosphere. I okay. felt the tension of my humerus sitting on the glenosphere, which told me this is a tight joint. Mm -hmm. So my option is to cut the humerus more and push it down. But this is the smallest size implant I've got. I can't put anything smaller than this. Okay. So I can't really do anything more than cut the humerus to get this in further. But I do think, so if you can zoom out and show my arm position, can you see my hand position here? So I'm holding the hand at the wrist, the elbow is dropped, so the weight of the arm is down. I'm gonna pull externally rotate, okay? And there it goes. Okay? okay. And that's us. So, a soft clunk. Yeah. I think uh, we'll move on to the next theater if you don't mind. I'll uh, just show you how the subscap's gonna sit back because then the rest I'll just repair it. Can we have another Langen back, please? Can I give you the arm? And I wanna show you the auxiliary nerve because at this point of time, you have to make sure, you got it, Christine? Can we adjust the light to down here? And the, I feel the auxiliary nerve and it's really soft. You don't want the auxiliary nerve to be tight here. And then you can see, I'm gonna release these top bands of the muscle here. I just wanna show you this to be able to mobilize the subscap scissors, thank you. Just one more minute and then you guys can move across. Scissors, please. Scissors. So this is the top fibers of the subscap with the fascia. And you see, as soon as I release the inside surface, you see that excursion? Yeah. yeah. So that's a really important factor. I'm dissecting between the glenoid and the subscap. And here, in neutral rotation, my subscap's back. Yeah, that's the right tension. That's the right tension, because my joint line's restored, my subscap's back, and then I'm gonna show you the supraspinatus, which I will repair in this in the end, and maybe you can come back to me later, but have another cocker. Can we show from up there? And you see that supraspinatus? Yeah. yeah, that's coming right back down. So it's kind of like an anatomical reverse, but my tension relationships maintained and the joints being the same. And so you're repairing this in the arm in slight extension rotation? There's and zero degrees for the subscap and just zero degrees for the supra. supraspinatus as well. Okay. And you can see the deltoid is really nice and soft. Yeah. Okay? Okay. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. I think a round of applause. Thank you, Ashish. Thank you. Now, can I invite uh, Dr. Dinsha Padiwala and Dr. Nagraj Shetty to be the moderators for the next live surgery, please. Thank you. Let's go for the final case for the day, case number four. We have a 68-year-old male gentleman, right shoulder pain and weakness for one month, history of injury while lifting weight, night pain is present, no history of diabetes or hyperthyroidism. On range of movements, uh, he had a ARM of 160, 160, 45 and L3, UCLA was scored to be 15, ASCS 37, and a VAS of 5 on 10. Examination of the cuff strength, uh, SSP, ISP, and horn rovers all found to be three, 
and subscap was found to be 5. Empty can, full can. ISP and that's Gerber's for subscap. Affected side. External rotation lag sign. The X ray, you can find a significant proximal migration of humeral head. As the MRI, T2CUR, massive SSP and ISP tear with about 40 mm traction up to the glenohumeral joint. to axial slight posterior rim T to Sarge Massive SSP and ISP tear. Going over to Dr. Bassam for live surgery. Over to you, moderators. Thank you. That's okay. Can you have the pass passport, please? Okay, can you push on it? Okay, good. All right, Arthur Care. Hi, Basim, we see you, both the outside and the inside arthroscopic image. You're good to go. Well, hello, how are you? Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Ajit. Thank you for this great opportunity. You have such a great team here. They're working all together. Uh, and uh, can we go to the uh, dissection of the lower trapezius? They can, yeah, but can they go? Do, yeah, I know, but I want to see the recording of the lower trap harvesting. Can they see it? I cannot see it. Okay, so here we are doing just the marking of the lower, the, the marking for the scapula, acromium and the spine. You can go, you can go quick, fast. Yeah, so the, the key here, like I, I'm used to traction, but here we have a human traction here. Some of the guys here are doing the traction for me. So I'm very appreciative. So we go very important to keep the scapula in one position because if you change the, the position of the scapula, it's going to change your incision. It's going to uh, change the marking that you have. That's very, very essential. And when you do your marking medially, it's very, very important to try truly to feel the medial aspect of the scapula because there are three landmarks. I'm going to show it to you right now. We're going to talk about them right now. Okay, you can notice when you move the scapula, it's going to move the marking. So you keep the scapula always in the same position, okay? So now, these are, uh, okay, no, 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 go back, go back. Okay, good. So go back. So we have three marking, okay? Three landmarks. Number one, <clears throat> if you measure, uh, around five centimeter and you draw a vertical line and you bisect it, this bisection is exactly the lower trapezius tendon. Number two, the medial uh, border of the scapula and medial spine uh, of the scapula make an angle. That angle is the house of the lower trapezius tendon. That's number two. And number three is this. This is how we do our marking as well. The number three is a uh, smiling face. And the, sm the mouse of the smiling face 
is where it's going to be your incision. So I'm going to go. Usually my incision is only three, four centimeter maximum. But here we're going to make it, my, we're not make it bigger. We're going to make it slightly bigger only. So we're going to make the incision. Always the steps are the same. By the way, here I'm not going to do any fasting or any editing just to show you how quick it can go. So we're going to make the incision. This is the first step. Go for the incision. Yeah. After the incision, oh, this is the Peronis <laughs> That is not mine, by the way. That is shitty. <laughs> well, this is a Peronis longest harvesting. That's okay. Well, this is something amazing for me because I've never seen this procedure before. So, uh, can you comment about this? Like this, so you make the exposure over the peneus longest behind the uh, malleolus. He put the sutures and then he, it took him like maybe four or five minutes to do it very quickly. Okay, now, after the incision, we'll put usually self-retaining retractor. That's the next step after the incision. And then, as you notice, even this patient is relatively skinny. I always, always take the fat out. This is always like my fellows know the rule. Once you open, you take the fat out all the time. So right now, after I open, I see a layer of fat. I'm going to be pulling on it. I'm going to take it out. And then once you take it out, you're going to see, I see a little bit of muscle. That's it. This lower trapezius. That is exactly how long it took. That's a lower trapezius muscle. And the white uh, attachment is the tendon. So, but once I know where it is, then I'll start to do more dissection in order to remove more fat in order to identify it better. And you can see right now the fat is coming out. I'm trying not to edit because this is something if, uh, like for those who are interested, this is exactly the step by step how we do it. And you can see now the tendon, how it is. Oh, I don't know what happened right now. Anyway, this is down the infraspinatus fascia and the one on top is the lower trapezius tendon. Okay, now once you get to this point, we're gonna be ready essentially to detach the, the tendon. You can detach the tendon now for sure, but sometimes what I do intentionally, I try to remove more fat to be able to see it, to, to see even more uh, the tendon. That's a muscle, that's a tendon, the infraspinatus fascia is down. There is some layer of fat on top of it, I'm gonna remove them. And that will allow you to expose the tendon even better. So right now, you're going to see the tendon much better, especially if you take like a 4x4 four four, uh, and just clean the top of the tendon. And again, like we're still within almost five minutes from like the harvesting. And this is the easiest part about the lower trap compared to the latissimus in terms of the area and everything else. The removal of fat just for identification, many times by now we can detach it. <clears throat> <clears throat> you can detach it completely. Now, the detachment is very common. I get asked this question many times. When you detach it, usually you remove, uh, you, you expose it very well, and then either you go from distal to proximal, or sometime you can identify it proximally on top of the, swine, uh, of the spine, and you know exactly where the tendon is, and you can go from proximal to distal. But my preference is always distal to proximal. Can you hold the camera? Mm, here. And once you identify proximally, this is where the middle trapezius is. This is the top part of the, this is the top part of the uh, trapezius tendon, by the way. Bassam? Yes. Can you show us the nerve as well? Uh, okay, I'll show uh, it right now. Yeah. Just give me one second. But let me, let's finish this part and then we'll go live on, on this one. Okay. Now, after you detach it, you don't have to dissect it too much more medially, by the way. But uh, if you want to, you can. Yeah. Anyway, now we're going to put sutures, a running suture in it. And we'll go from there. Now, this part here, guys, the distal part is within two centimeters with the, with the protraction of the scapula from the medial scapula. This is where the spinal accessory nerve is. When you go proximal, it becomes slightly closer. So whenever you want to release more, stay on the surface of the muscle. And you can look deeper to the muscle. Now, if you want to see the nerve, the nerve is more medial. 
Can you uh, uh, four by four? Let's step the floor. Do you have a dissection scissors? Dissection scissors, do you have? Or a hemostat? Yeah. Can you go deep? Yeah, you may have to stop. This is the nerve. If you go deep here, that's the nerve. Your camera. This camera. It's deep in the muscle, okay? They are showing this camera. <coughs> Can you see it? Yeah, deep. That's the nerve. It's almost within a one to two centimeter from the medial border of the scapula. Outside picture, please. We're seeing the yeah. So that's your spinal accessory there. Yes, that's the spinal accessory down there. And you get a very nice excursion of the lower trapezius for the next step. And the infraspinatus fascia is already opened. And usually when you open the infraspinatus fascia, you can go all the way to the subacromial space from here. This is gonna be our trajectory for the peroneus longus. And we just started, by the way, the thing is this patient has as expected massive tear. Let me have an arthro care. And his biceps was shredded in addition to he has a liberal tear. So we did a quick bicep stenotomy. And now I'm just cleaning the greater tuberosity. But so uh, you have an age limit for this sort of a procedure? So uh, I like the patient to be physiologically active, which means sometime, honestly, for me, I prefer to be below 70. But I have a patient one time, he came, he's uh, really high end. He was super active. He was 90 years old, uh, still in doing, doing short marathon and stuff. And he did not want replacement. And I recommended replacement for him. He did not want to have it done. I did it for him. He did extremely well. So I'm not very sure there is a true age limit, but the majority of the patient, please know this is not something I do it only routinely. I don't. But the majority of my patient, uh, routinely an older patient, majority of my patient, the age is from 30 to high 50s, early 60s. That's my usually preference. The, the, the reason for the question was, with age, does the lower trap seem to have any sort of changes? Or do you notice that the younger patients and the older patients seem to have the same sort of structure as far as the muscle and the tendon is concerned? Uh, that's a really good question. Not really. Like when the quality of the muscle is always less. But remember, everything else with it is less. So whenever you try to plan it in someone who is older, maybe you're not going to get the same quality of, of the muscle. But you're still able to have enough muscle to transfer. Like we've done pedicle pack on... 80 years old and they've done okay the same not the same quality of someone who's super young but still great now here i'm going just to show you <clears throat> with the breathed tuberosity we're going to still clean it up the tendon i'm going to show you it's very very stuck i'm going to show you how it is very hard to move it and uh, this is greater tuberosity this is supra this is the infra which is advanced fatty atrophy i try to clean the interval between the infra and the deltoid toward my medial incision and usually when you go this way, if you go outside a little bit, you're going to see, look, can you go outside? Yeah, we can see that really well. Yeah, you can see how this one is all the way out right now. Yeah. And this is a trajectory. This is a very easy trajectory. It has to be easy when you pull the tendon. It should not be very complicated at all. It should be really very easy. If it's not easy, it means you're in the wrong trajectory. You're not in the right trajectory. So this is our area of the lower trap. In fact... Can you hold this one here for me? Up. And if you go this, sorry, you can see my finger. Okay? That is exactly, and the camera can go all the way out as well. So this is our trajectory that we have to make sure to preserve or to remember always whenever we're going to try to pass the tendon. Now, let me have Shaver, please. Uh, Dr. Bassam, this patient had a significant horn blower sign also. Yeah. So, do you treat the patients with a significant horn blower in addition to the external rotation lag sign any differently from the ones who do not have a horn blower? And what is the status of the steerous spinal according to you? I think uh, this is a great question, by the way. The most important thing that I change is the immobilization. Like these patients should be strictly immobilized in external rotation so that the internal rotator will not take over. 
so this is what I change mostly. Otherwise, no. We have to say, like, and this is, I mentioned it in many times in meetings, that the outcome in patients who are pseudo-paralytic and completely ER lag is not the same outcome in patients who are not completely ER lag, like the, the flap sign that we talked about yesterday as we were talking. The difference, the big difference for me is the strengths that we talked about today. Uh, we were talking about some of these today and we talked about like the re, re, uh, regaining of the strengths. You cannot always regain strengths in patients who have no muscle. Now, as I'm working, I'm gonna explain it quickly. Why, give me Arthur Care, please. Thank you very much, I appreciate it. Thank you. So the main reason, this is why you are shoulder surgeon. I love the rotator cuff. They're very small, but they're super powerful, you know? Like uh, in martial art, Bruce Lee used to know to be very powerful, even though he was very small and gently the same way. The rotator cuff for me are the same. They're so powerful, but they're so small. So when you take three rotator cuff to, together, they're more powerful than pec, more powerful than lat, more powerful than lower trap. So the more you have muscle you have to replace, you're replacing almost additional muscle, muscle power, the strengths will not be the same. Uh, can you have a needle for me, please? Just once again, Arthur Care. So right now, my camera is in the lateral portal and my uh, the passport is the anterior portal. I always aim it in a way so that if I need to use, me and this is the anterior footprint of the Supra, if I need to use one anterior medial, one anterior lateral, it will be easy for me to do it without using two additional portals. Uh, an additional portal, okay? And the, the lateral portal for me is the key horse because you can go uh, look anterior, middle, and you can go all the way posterior when you pass your, your tendon, tendon. Now today, I'm doing something new I haven't done before, which is the Pyrenees Longest, but I'm very happy because I hear about it, and now I saw it live at least, which is great. <laughs> um, let me have a needle, please. Needle, yeah. So right now, how, how big is the tendon? Let me see. Yeah, it's like this. Can you put another uh, suture? This one, more suture? one more so that you can have two ends here, two ends here. Okay, okay so um, needle, please. I'm not very sure I'm going to use this one. I use this one mostly for the Achilles tendon, but I'm going to try to use it here. So if we try to put an anchor here. Can you open the medial anchor I told you about? Knife. Here you go. Puncher for the anchor, please. And let me have a lap, four by four. Thank you for pulling on the patient, by the way. You're working like a machine. <laughs> And uh, we can definitely try to repair part of this rotator cuff with advanced fatty atrophy, proximal migration. I've done this. I have a mini series where I compared trying to repair versus not repairing. Other than adding the anchors, there were not much difference between the two. The same outcome. Now, as shoulder surgeon, we like to do that. And I, I cannot blame you for trying, maybe, but I could not find much difference between that, between repairing it or not repairing it. So it's like surgeon preference, but I did not find difference at all. And I felt all the power is coming from, uh, from the trapezius transfer. Uh, okay. Bassem, this yes. is Alex. Hi, Alex. Hi, uh, congratulations until now, it's really nice. One question, if you would be able to repair completely the cuff, would you add the, uh, the transfer on top of this? Yes, I'm not sure in this patient who is uh, close to 70. Let me have the puncher for the medial anchor. I, uh, Alex, yes, in younger patient that I feel the cuff doesn't have advanced fatty atrophy, the tendon, especially of the supra, is still acceptable. I will try to, uh, to repair it. In older patient, advanced fatty atrophy, I used to repair them. I am not anymore because I'm not finding difference except adding anchors as we talk, you talked about yesterday about the expenses. So. Sure. Thank you. Puncher for the anchor. Do you have the medial anchor? Oh, it's cell punch. Okay, let's have it then. So again, I'm using striker anchors. Thank you for the company. Ashish, thank you. I've, I think we have a good team here to help me with it. Uh, it's my first time using it, but it seems very easy going. That's a medial. I'm going to use this one as a medial anchor. I'm not sure I'm going to use it, but I'm going to put it in. Hopefully, you'll be able to use it. 
and I'm going to go in. And if the attachment of the tendon is going to be here, I'm going to maybe put this anchor here. Go ahead. Just one second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just one second. Yep. Wh which line? Yeah, arthrocare, please. It's okay. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. Arthrocare? Okay, that's great. All right, needle, please. That's good. All right. Well, the team here said this is good. So I'm assuming this is going to be good. Knife, please. That's an advisor portal. Do you have a social grasper, please? <clears throat> I'm going to get these sutures out of my way. They are in the divisor portal this way. Whenever I pass the tendon, I don't have to worry about it. Arthur, care, please. And now we're ready to pass the tendon. Uh, do you have the long grasping instrument that I asked you about? Um, yeah, it's okay. I think it may work. Let's see. So this, this has to pass. Be careful. Because many times it wants to be medial to the sutures. We want to be lateral to the sutures. And we're going to follow, uh, follow the same trajectory as I opened before, all the way to come out uh, through this incision. Here you go. Can you hold the camera? Pick up. Here you go. Now, uh, can you mark it? Uh, no, this side. This side you want? Yes. Can you mark it for me? Yeah. This is medial. Just put it this way here, medial. Okay. So he's marking now the peroneus longus. And we're going to try to retrieve it. It's my first, but uh, okay. yes. So give me the four sutures. Yeah. Do you have a marking pen? I want to make sure. So with the Achilles tendon, always like the medial side, make sure you have the whole thing marked. And because different color suture, this is the same, let's make sure we color this one to make sure we don't twist the tendon. It doesn't matter even if you twist it, okay? Now, this is what we're gonna do. I'm gonna take the sutures and I'm going, keep the tendon with you if you could. All right, I'll give you this. And I will take the camera from you in one second. I take the camera from you. OK. Now, can you pull on these sutures, if you don't mind? Yeah. So I'm going to go slowly, slowly. And then here Hashem. you go. Yes. So Hashem. Hey, this, Hashem. This is my, my feeling is sometimes uh, you cannot introduce this first anchor from posterior lateral. And you should go, as we, we know, from the bicep to introduce this anchor. Uh, can you repeat again, uh, Hashem? I mean, Arthur, okay? uh, you put this anchor, first, first anchor posterior lateral? Yes. Posterior medial, sorry, from the lateral portal or from the visor portal? No, this one from the lateral portal, but you take the suture from the visor portal. Don't exactly. pull on it too hard. But sometimes the angle attack is then cut good from the posterior lateral and you should go through the visor. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. I agree. I agree. I know you have done a lot of this, uh, Hashem, so yeah, I agree 100%. So now this is what we're going to do. Give me a grasper, suture grasper. Okay. The, so the length of the graft, your minimum length that you'd accept? I would say around the 17 centimeter to 20. So now I'm going to take this one from you. OK, I'll give you this. And then if I'm pulling here, OK, do you have? This is correct. Oh, I like it. It's broad. OK, let's have the puncher that I told you, uh, uh, the anchor, the lateral anchor, the yellow one that I told you about. So right now, all what we're going to do, let me have the arthro care. What we're going to do is this. We're going to go. This is the tendon. This is medial. This is lateral. We're going to go anterior medial. We're going to go anterior lateral. 
And if we can grab any tissues on top of it, we will. If not, we will see. Okay? So, let's, do you know how to load this? Yeah. Do you have to take the sushes out? Yeah. Uh, any questions so far? So, you always use an Achilles tendon allograft, is that right? Absolutely, yes. I love the Achilles tendon. I'm sorry, I know you don't have it here, it's expensive, but it is such a powerful tendon, and I have a long-term outcome about it. I, told you, I showed you yesterday, of course, not every patient, but I have... Both in one, right? Yeah, yes. You know, yes. yes. Ah. So, can, can, we, um, can you show some details about how the peroneal tendon was actually prepared? It's doubled up, it's two-tailed. What's no, no, exactly no. being done? I, they told me... No, no, no. Another one? No. No, this is only this one. Okay? So... Yeah, uh, we, can, we can show. We can, let's, no problem. Do you want to sh show the video of the previous longest? or you want to comment about it? Uh, uh, see, it was totally 30 centimeter long. And we have made it about 19 centimeters. So one end, which was the broader end, we folded it on itself and took up uh, whip stitches all around to make it flat. Can, can uh, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. You do not have a mic. No problem. Just a minute. We'll no. just get a second mic on to you. No, sir. that's okay. I think we've got it. It's, a, uh, it's been a folded graft. Yeah, yeah, and they've got two ends, and you're seeing those two ends here. That's the anterior, that's the medial one, and the lateral one. Yep. So it's, it's been it's folded. Doubled up and then from yes. the yes. yes. Okay. So now, now, and we can show you the site of the harvest as well. Just one second, let me have it. Just one second. Myself, I, can I have my hand here? Yeah. Okay. So this one, I aim it here, exactly here. So you can pull slightly on the suture, not all the way, a little bit more. Pull on them. That's it. Go ahead. Punch. Go for it. You know what? I like these anchors for one reason, because you can push it all the way in, and then you can tension it after if you want to. Uh, just one second. And this one, the cannula. Yeah, you can tension a little bit more. I cannot see from your hand. <laughs> Oh, lovely, lovely, lovely. I love it. Perfect. Look at this. Great. Okay, that's good. That's it, right? I like that. I like that very much. Okay, why don't you... Let's cut this one. Dr. Yeah. Bassam. Yes. With respect to only fixation technique that you're showing us. Yes. Uh, compare this to the transosseous techniques where you drill a tunnel and then you use an endo button onto the anterior part of the humerus and you kind of dock the tendon within the bone. Grasper, grasper. Uh, so, do you feel the only only technique is as strong as the tra transosseous, uh, you know, tunnel technique? Well, I, honestly, I do. Like based on my experience with the lower uh, with the Achilles tendon, I do feel that the only is really very very strong. And uh, but I cannot justify it because I don't have a study to prove either. So, until a study is done, I can say speculating what can happen. I do like the broad attachment instead of like the hole. And sometimes when you make a tunnel with rotation, it can cause like a widening of the tunnel and sometimes it causes sometimes a guillotine type of effect. It can rub on the tendon. This one, it does not do it, you know? And this is how I do it for the uh, lower trapezius uh, Achilles tendon augmentation all the time. Okay. Yeah, try not to pull it all the way yet. Let me have the arthrocare before we put it in. Arthrocare, please. Pull on your tendon. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now we're going to go lateral. Pull, but not, don't pull too hard. Okay. Yeah. Is this correct? Okay, go, go, go. That's it, that's it, that's it. Let me, because when you pull on it, it pull on the, just one second, yeah. relax, yeah. yeah. Because otherwise it's gonna go through the plastic of the tendon, okay. So now, this one was here, and I like this one to be here. So, yeah, go ahead, you can punch now. With respect to the bicep no, no, groove, what is the location? Where do you, where this is can... just, uh, this is just posterior to the biceps groove. Okay. Which has the best bone. Yeah, just one second. This one is... 
Again. Yep, again. Okay, excellent. Now let's tension it. Very nice tendon, thank you. Honestly, I love it, it's great. Okay. And that is the tendon over. It looks really, this is why it looks, honestly, I'm very impressed by the pyramids longus. Yeah, I like cannot do it in the United States, unfortunately, because I end up in, in, in the prison maybe. But uh, it's really nice. Look at this draping, it's beautiful. It looks elegant. So thank you for uh, showing me this. I did not know this exists. Yeah, here you go. Okay, now, uh, give me uh, Arthrocare first. I will need the other, the other uh, passport, please. Are we okay on time? Yes, you are, no problem at all. Yeah, okay. So now, this is what we're gonna do. Uh, knife. And we're gonna slightly increase this incision. Okay, let me, can you hold the camera? So right now, we're gonna see if we'll be able to pass some of these sutures. Uh, okay, I got it. Slight pull on the tendon. Okay, Arthur Care, please. Do you have a, uh, like scorpion or pass something yes. to pass through the tendon? Yes, thank you. Okay, good. All right, now, uh, switch your passer, please. Can you hold the camera for me this way? Keep it this way. Grasper, suture, or the suture. And do you have the scorpion? Yeah. Can you show me the suture? Oh, oh, that's okay. No worries. I got it, okay? Here you go. It's slightly more posterior, okay? Mm -hmm. So when I ask you about it, like, just go more posterior. Hold the camera, please. All right, Scorpion, please. They're bringing it? Okay, so essentially what we're gonna do right now, because of the stiffness of the tendon, this is more medial, I'm gonna try to pass the suture through whatever remaining of the tendon. It will act as if you were gonna call it SCR, you wanna call it as a buttress, even though, in my opinion, it's not gonna make a big difference. And then we're gonna pass all the sutures on top of the tendon, we're gonna anchor them laterally, and this is a fixation. So two, anti two, med uh, two anterior anchor, one medial, one lateral, and then we're gonna go one posterior medial with the Achilles tendon, of course. You can put them from medial to lateral. Now, if you wanna do your technique where you make a hole, pass the tendon through it, if it works, why not? Okay, hold this one. So just let me know. So yeah. how you use this one? Just pass it yeah, through. Speed this or yeah. This, like this. Okay. That's it. Yeah. Then yeah. Then you can open once you go in. Okay. Can you show me medium? So I'm gonna go. And I'm gonna put. Uh, yeah, now push this one and then fire it. Can you fi fire it? Go just slightly more into here. Go fire. That's okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, perfect. Go back. Good. That's one. Okay. Give me, give me a uh, suture retrieval. Okay. Now we're gonna go to. Thank you. Can you pass more than one suture, or it's only one suture? Can you pass two? One, 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 okay. Why don't you come here? Pass, passing them through the rotator cuff, you know. Just gonna go from, the next one is gonna be slightly more posterior, okay. more posterior, more posterior. Since you know how to 
on top of the tendon. Be careful. Show him. It's always more. Yes, go superficial. Yeah, go ahead. Show him the camera. Yes, keep it on top. Yeah, go ahead. Open. Next. Just one second. Yeah, go ahead. Fire. Perfect. Go ahead. Out. Uh, do you want to? Yeah, get him a grasper. In fact, the grabber, take it from this portal. This okay. way you get it out of your way and go slightly more posterior. Yep, on top of the tendon, on top of the uh, back. Yep, on top of the tendon. Here you go. Okay, push in, push in, push in with the camera, push in with the camera. Yes, yes, here you go. Perfect, here you go. Again, suture retrieval. That's number two. Here you go. Go ahead. Again, slightly more posterior on superficial to the tendon. Here you go, perfect. Nice. So, uh, so far so good, any questions? So you're gonna repair no, that no, no, no. cuff to your No, 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 grasp. you're pushing too hard up. Excuse me? Are you gonna be repairing that, the remnant of the cuff to the graft? Yes, like it will be medial to close the, 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 the top of the shoulder. In my opinion, this is the one that if you try to repair only, most of the time without the tendon augmentation, you're going to come back. This is what Alex Sederman asked about. Uh, you're going to come back with, uh, with a tear. But if this one stayed and worked like a scar tissue on top, that's great. Is this okay? Yes, perfect. If it stayed and it healed because you have a medial anchor, then that's great. For me, I use it mostly to cover the space and to bring vascularized tissue to the rest of the allograft. And let's get it out of here. So, if the subscap is torn but it is uh, repairable, can we repair the subscap and attempt this procedure? Yes. 100 percent. Yes. Push, push in, push in, push in, push in. No, no, not, not lateral, not lateral. Slightly more medial. Go ahead. Again. Here you go. Yep. So total, how many anchors? So uh, the total are four. Four. Four anchors. One more. Hold it for him. Just keep it this way. Now I'll pull on the tendon. Here you go. Yep. Excellent. Go. Perfecto. So again, again, I think as many of you do lower trap, I know Ashish does. I know Shirish does. Uh, George Atwell does, like a lot of people in the audience, uh, Peter, uh, I know Le uh, uh, Alex Lederman is not going to do it, but maybe he will change his mind someday, he will do it. Uh, you can go slightly, yeah, pull on the switches for him. And uh, I think some of this technique can get modified once we get some prospective randomized study to show, that's great, to show what works better. So far, they have been working as probably some of you, if they do the lower trapezius, you know, how it is really working well. So I'm not very sure the technique exactly is going to change over time, you know? Yeah, but just keep it slightly this way for him. Yeah. Yeah, we're on the last suture, and then we're going to attach it laterally. Yeah. Wiggle it. Wiggle, wiggle. Yep. And if you want to come closer to this, the last suture you put, can you show it to him better? Yeah. That's good. That's good. All right, fire. Okay, good. Now, can I? Yeah, yeah. Can I have this? That's great. All right. Let me have the ice tongue. Oh, that's cool. You call it ice tongue as well. I like that. So we're gonna go in, and we're gonna co take all our sutures. And then, can you open another yellow lateral anchor? Yep. Arthrocare, please. We're going to do the same. Uh, I think with this, specifically, the peroneus longus, like if you work around it a lot, it gets slightly frayed. So it's not a bad idea to try to clean from time to time just to get the fraying off. And this is, if you look, this is my posterior lateral anchor is going to be. 
which is a lateral row. So we're going to go here. So there's never an indication for you to repair the remnant tendon back to bone? Yes, the, the, uh, Alex Ederman asked this question. I do. Uh, when the patient is younger, when there is less fatty atrophy, and maybe the tendon slightly longer, like has less, more flexibility. But again, remember, like this is one of those cases you can debate as much as, like we can debate a lot about it. This is why I liked a lot Alex uh, lecture from yesterday, because he was showing again, sometimes he does biceps for this patient to get better without the weakness, of course. So I'm not very sure about the value when you have proximal migration. I examined the patient before surgery. I came to examine him. And honestly, he was a, a, a great indication lot of crunching on top of the shoulder, proximal migration. He has every, for me, he has every factor that potentially lead to failure of the rotator cuff. Now, again, why I am seeing this? Because in my practice is all revisions, majority are revisions. And whenever there are revisions, they, uh, when they come from other, other places, this is what they've done. They try to repair the rotator cuff, they try to put the patch, they end up failing, now I have to do revision. So from the very beginning, I try not to do them. You can add, but I try not to do them. Go, go, go for it. So now we're going to go for the last anchor. Here you go. Your position of the arm when you're doing this. Uh, well, right now, we're going to show you the position of the arm after I finish this part. He putting tension on the tendon doesn't matter. Okay. And now, yeah, go ahead. Pull slightly on the sutures. Little bit. Just a little bit. That's it. That's it. No, no, you're gonna, you're gonna, it's going to fall off. See what happens. Yeah, just one second. No problem. Here you go. Keep it here. That's okay, you can look through the cannula. Here you go, go. Okay, here you go, what about now? Just one second, let me see it for you. Let me see. Yeah. Okay, go for it. Okay, see what I mean? Okay, that's okay. Yeah, go ahead. Go for it. Go. Hey, how are you? <laughs> Excellent. He has a good bone. That's good, that's good, that's good, that's good enough. Okay. Now pull on the sutures a little bit. Fantastic. That's great. Let me see. Yep, that's great. Basim, in your experience, the yes. weak point of the construct, is it the tendon to bone or is it the uh, trapezius to the tendon? Almost always uh, tendon to bone. Honestly, I haven't yet seen a failure at the level of, uh, at the, level of the muscle. It can happen, but I haven't seen it. Maybe it's seen me, I haven't seen it. So right now, look at this, it's all covered. Let me have an arthrocare. And you have a vascularis tissues on the tendinous tissues, and if you, a slight pull on the tendon. And you can see like the pulling on the tendon, go ahead, pull. And you can feel, the, you can, you can feel also the humerus moving. Okay, let's relax. Arthrocare. So right now, I'm gonna just clean a little bit, and that's it, we're gonna show you the open part, how we're gonna pass it through the tendon, the lower trapezius tendon. Perfect, thank you. No problem. Any questions? No, I think it's quite self-explanatory. You fix the graft on the bone, so we've finished that part. All we need to do now is to fix the graft to the lower trapezius in the correct position. Yes, correct. Okay, good. Sweet and sexy. You know what, if you don't want, like we're done essentially. I was gonna clean, that's it, we're done. Lights on, we're done. That's it, okay? That's okay, my friend, sorry. Yeah. Sorry about that, we're done. Okay, now light and zoom out. By the way, you can see the portals, if there's not as much repair, anterior portal, can you see it? Yes. And you have lateral portal and two percutaneous, one for an anchor, one for the divisor. But really, really, these are the working horse anchor. Mm -hmm. Of course, he can modify like Hashem. He does it in the lateral. He does different uh, 
uh, technique, but they're essentially, for me, I like this because it's a bird eye view. You can see front and back. You can fix the front. You can change your camera, choose back. So this is my, but of course, I, like you're, you're all skilled, you can use your own technique. Now I'm gonna keep this one here. This is what we're gonna do. Look at this, okay? Like, can I have the arm? Now, the arm on the side, external rotation. You can see the tendon is moving a little, get, sorry. Give me marking pen, marking pen. I wanna show this to show why I do this, okay? That is where the tendon here right now. Can you see it? Yes. Okay, okay. See what happened now, okay? If I do abduction, external rotation, it moved around a centimeter, right? Yes. Now let's do the same abduction, external rotation. See where the tendon now is? Yep. This is why I fix it in this position. Why? Because when we talk about how much you need to crank on it, it's always very tricky for me. So if I put them in this position, which shorten the distance between the humerus and the insertion side, then even if you don't pull too hard, after you put them in a deduction from this position, it's going to tension the tendon. You can see the difference between this and this and this. So how much flexion, how much abduction? I, I usually put them in around 60 or 70. And uh, like, uh, like right now, he's very flexible. This is almost like 70, 70. I don't have to put them all the way up. This is good enough. Around 70, 70 if I could. Otherwise, like 60, 60 is OK. I otherwise, if you want to tension it yourself without putting it this way, you can. But for me, this is a safer way. After you put your sutures uh, in this position, if it tension, it's not going to rip your tendon. That's what I'm trying to talk. All right, hold it this way right now. Now, uh, let me have a retaining, self-retaining retractor. But Basim, your post-op immobilization is not going to be in this position, right? No, 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 on the side. So do you think that that tension is going to be okay for healing? Absolutely. Absolutely, because again, I will show you in a second what I mean. Let me have a hemostat, curved hemostat. This is, this is what I want uh, a comment for this. It's very important to keep the arm six weeks in this position because some surgeon in Spain started to avoid to use immobilization in this position and keep the arm in this position. Can you give me the tension? So you will lose all the tension. And loses the tension, it doesn't work. This is what happened. It's very important to, to motivate the patient, Both to stretch the patient. Yes. If the patient suture. don't accept oh, okay. this position for six Thank weeks, <laughs> at least five weeks or four, five weeks, can do it because it's, it's going to be, don't work. So now, uh, this is my point. My point, if I want to tension it right now and pull on it, Look what happened. It's going to split sometime the tendon. So if I just put it in, give me a retractor, please, like this one. And we're going to pull here this way. So if I just, and I, can I give you this as well? So if I do this without too much, like see my finger, I'm just giving it a slight tug. That's all that I want to do in that position. Now, when you drop him slowly down, he's going to tension, but not going to rip your repair because everything is sutured, everything is in place. But at time zero, when you do this and you crank on it, you may get the problem. Okay? All right. Uh, suture? No, suture. Like orthocord. You have the orthocord suture? So right now, the, the repair, the way I always close this, this opening here, I always tell my fellow close it because it weakens the tendon interface. And I don't do a single suture or horizontal mattress. You're going to see right now, I'm going to run it. Tendon allograph, native tendon allograph. I'm going to go over and over and over. You're going to see it right now. OK. Hey, Basim, it's Peter Chalmers. This, it looks beautiful from our perspective. Tell us a little bit why the pulver taft, why can't we just put the, the tendons side to side and just do figure eights between the two? You can. I have done it before. It doesn't give you the same tension. I've done it before. I, I think Joaquin Sotelo at the Mayo Clinic is still doing it this way. Some people doing it this way. This one, I changed this technique so many times. This is the one that gives me the best uh, security of a nice tension on the repair. So it's, this is mostly for tensioning, not necessarily for fixation. This is mostly for tensioning. And I want to mention to you one more thing. Uh, do you have the, uh, um, I will show you something in one second. The problem, Peter, also, let me ask you here. Well, I'm going to ask you, where is the spinal accessory here? You already lateralized the tendon a couple of centimeters. So the nerve right now is here. When you drape the graft on top, it is some, I know you know your anatomy, but if you don't be careful, sometimes you can go through the spinal accessory nerve when you're draping on top of this muscular tendons unit. 
So this is safer, safer as well. Love it. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, one second. Let me have this one. So we're essentially finishing here. I'm going to suture the tendon, and then we're going to drop the arm in AD duction. Just one second, one second. AD duction. Yeah. And then uh, that's it. We'll start to close. OK? Now, one more thing here. Notice what I'm going to do. Very important. See this? Close it. Don't keep it open. This is essential. I feel it can weaken this interface, and it's nice to close. And if you notice, I did not do horizontal matters or figure eight. I'm keeping on suturing until I feel I'm happy with it. Then I stop. And this, and this opening is more or less at the muscle tendon junction there. This opening is closed. Yeah, this muscle tendon junction is somewhere here. That's correct. Here you go. The main reason I always want to see to make sure I'm not going into the infraspinatus fascia because this can affect your outcome. You do not want to go through the infraspinatus fascia. Okay. So this is good for now as a first suture. Okay, knife for suture. Knife, thank you. Okay, I'll give you this. Okay, now let me have see the arm. Let me relax now, these two, perfect. And I'm gonna check that I did not grasp the, the, the fascia here, which is not grasped, which is very important. And now I'll continue my suturing. I'll do it another time. Just one second. Can you give this electrocautery, please? I'm gonna slightly open the fascia more here. Okay, let me have a suture again. This way we can see everything. Here you go. Perfect. You can see allograft and an allograft. So I'm going to continue suturing it this way. And then that's it. I usually use three sutures, uh, four by four. Or, yeah, hold it, but not too much here this way. Okay. Four by four, like the lap, please. What do you call it? Mop. 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 Mop or sponge. Mock. Okay, mop, please. <laughs> I'm learning Indian here. And whenever you pass the suture, by the way, if you feel a lot of resistance, it means you are through your other suture. This is something you don't want to do because sometimes you cut it, you don't know, and eventually the patient can, can have a problem here. All right. Okay, I'm done. Let knife. We're going to do one more. So, Jirish, if you don't mind, just the last one. But I just want to show them this. Like, right now, if you notice, look what happened. If I go down, it's going to tension the tendon. And now, I get, let me have it. And you can see, look, with the rotation, how it is moving nicely with it. If you don't mind, just add one more here. And yes, we'll be done. OK? I think I poked myself. OK. Any question? That's very elegant, first of all. Congratulations. That's Thank wonderful. you. Thank you. Any questions from the hall? Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Ashish, thank you very much. A few Steve, questions. Uh, a few questions, Basim. OK. Bas this one? Basim, is Ram here? This one? Yes. <laughs> Basim, is Ram here? Excellent surgery. Thank you. And yes. uh, my question is, if you are routinely doing this lateral position, how do you get the tension? Do you remove the traction and do it, or is there any other? This is, this is why when they ask me about lateral. Lateral, the Take advantage, disadvantage. Advantage of lateral, you have a huge exposure. You have all the back. You don't have to worry about positioning what we were doing early on. Disadvantage is you need a helper all the time. Like if you have a dynamic arm holder, you can put it, you can position it in the beach chair, you're done. Yes. In the lateral, you're already in traction. 
You try to position now an external rotation, you have to take the arm completely out, have someone holding it for you, and eventually finishing it with you. So as long as you have that help in the OR, you can do it. Otherwise, there'll be more, more challenging because of that step, you're right. Okay. Okay? Any other question? We have one more. Okay. So do you normally uh, use a remnant tendon and weave it around the muscle just to strengthen the whole construct? With the, you mean the allograft or you mean the yeah, yeah, the remnant tendon which is still remaining. On the, on the trapezius side? On the trapezius side. Uh, yes, I do. This is the third suture. So, but do you, do you cut it off or do you use it and keep tightening the whole no, construct? No, no. The, the rest of the, you're going to see right now, he's going to cut the rest of the allograft. So this length. Okay. Whatever is on the trapezius is okay. The rest of it, you don't need it anymore. So you so, don't weave it around the muscle at all? No, there's, like, there's no reason for okay. me. If you, wanna, you can, but there's no reason for it. And okay. you will go close to the nerve then. You know, if you try and weave it more medially, exactly. you're go close that to the nerve. Exactly. That is my point with the draping. I have done the draping before. It does work. It does heal. However, you need to know the anatomy of the nerve because sometimes you're very close to the muscular tendon. If this is a tendon, the nerve is here away from you. Now you, later, you lateralize the tendon, now the nerve is here. When you put the allograft on top, sometimes the nerve is very close. And you know, like many times you just want to put the suture, you want to finish, you end up sometimes catching part of the lower trapezius, like the spinal accessory nerve. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, Sujit here. Uh, you said uh, you like the peroneus longus. So uh, would no, no, you, would no, no, you no. give it the chance? It's, it's the first time he's using it, come on. Please keep it this way. <laughs> Please, please don't move it anymore into rotation. It's very tight. Feel it. Feel it. It's very tight. If it's very tight, you don't want to push it. This is the question that was asked. Right now, we need to keep the patient in external rotation because the tendon is very tight. Internal rotation can damage the tendon. Yes, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. So about the, the, the graft. So yes. given, given the choice in U.S., would you use an Achilles tendon allograft or put, a peroneus put longus? Uh, put, I like Achilles. I, I like vancomycin in the wound. Because we, we were of the impression that we were using it out of necessity, the peroneus longus. So would you, would you uh, use a peroneus longus in lieu of uh, Achilles given the choice or would you still prefer the Achilles? Like, you know, if that's an excellent question. I really like this tendon. I'm very surprised. Thank you so much, Shirish, for doing it for me. Uh, it is broader than I thought. It is strong. It drapes very nicely. The only one caveat of it, well, the big ad the advantage is autograft. The only caveat though, the thickness of it, when you drape it, not as thick, even if you want to double it and you want to put it next to an Achilles tendon, the thickness of the Achilles tendon, it is not there. Will this make any difference? I'm not very sure. You're still like covering the top. SCR worked because of pain, even though the Arthrex one, they are very thin and the patient still have okay. Again, time will show. However, if I'm here or overseas, I'm, someone will do it for me. I will absolutely, this is much better than hamstring for me. Wonderful surgery. You made it look like uh, much simpler than an SCR. <laughs> well, it is much simpler <laughs> than an SCR. Last, last question, Basim. Um, okay. For the lat dorsalis, you need a special physio to recruit the muscle. I'm presuming this one doesn't need anything separate than you do standard. So we did a study at the Mayo Clinic, and we have a surface EMG study that I was telling George Athol about. If you flex your shoulder without even external rotation, the lower trapeze is fire. If you ex external rotate the shoulder, it fire. If you external uh, rotate the other shoulder, in 50% of patient lower trapeze is fire. Wow. This is a self-training muscle. You don't need to do anything for yeah. it. Super. Good job. Come and join us. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Basim. Love you. Thank you Just to my... Inside. Yeah. Thank you, guys. My, very... my OR team is there behind all the staff and my anesthetist and my assistants and my fellows. Thank you very much. You are the A team. Super. Those are my anesthetists in the background and my team. Thank you very much. Awesome. Star team. Cheers. So bang on time. So you maybe request uh, the next moderators. Uh, Sujit, up on stage, yeah? I request the panel members to come on to the stage, Dr. Peter Chalmers, Dr. Hachim, Dr. Dinsha Padiwala, Dr. Raghuvi Reddy, Dr. Nandan Anla, and Dr. Ram Chidambaram. Thank you. Take the mic. Show us what we got. Not this. The first line. Why you the third line? Yeah. Just talk to us about our post-op x-rays. This yeah. is a CT scan. 
this is this can this is uh, some do you have some slide a little bit lateral this is little yeah, bit we show you everything send in the next yeah it's yeah that's a movie play the movie Stop there, stop there, stop, stop. there, stop. Uh, yeah, this one, okay, perfect. Okay, no. the 3D, 3D, show the 3D. 3D. Yeah, 3D is better, yeah, stop. <clears throat> it's perfect. So, it's, it's 24 millimeters, look at the, the length, it's perfect. A uh, little bit, the... It's what happened here. Uh, I put the curvature in, in the up top because I prefer to put, to have bone, much bone, much bone thicker in the distal part because the, the shoulder pop up in this direction. So the loading zone is better to have much bone here than there. Than there. And at the end, uh, this is most important thing. Look at this. The diameter is here. So two o'clock is here from two to five o'clock. It's perfect for me. And the surface is restored. Restored, by the way, uh, the same shape. So. Don't, no, I don't feel proud graft. It, it, you fo if you follow the best fit circle, it's going to be there. And now we, we divide the graft in six zones. So this zone, the one, two, three, it's inside the best fit circle. This, uh, the f this is six, nine, number six. And number four is outside the best fit circle. It's going to be re removed with osteolysis and resorption. And the, the, the best fit circle is, for me, it's this. Let's see one year after, but this is perfect. This, I mean, I'm happy for if, the patient. If I was your examiner, to be honest, I would give you 11 out of 10. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. I told Hachem we are like Nescafe, instant. Thank you. Can I have my panel on board? So the last session, this is what you're waiting for. And uh, his discussion. Oh, this is Ashish Gupta. Ashish is not here to defend this. But uh, we've got a Siam pick for you. And uh, I think this one looks good. You can see that the glenosphere and the base plate inclination is perfect. Um, the stem is sitting well. Uh, I could have gone for a wider stem, but it's sitting flush. The humeral base plate is also perfectly recessed. It's the small size, nothing proud there. And if you look at the Gothic arch, nicely well restored. The GT is right there at position so it's not going to impinge i think and the outlet looks perfect even though the stem is uh, smaller in size there's a tendency to put it in varus this one is not and uh, on the lateral is straight down the fairway so that's not easy to do on a small stem to get it straight down the fairway is very very challenging that reflects his experience and the screws and the direction is is absolutely perfect now I request the panelists to come out to the stage, Dr. Peter Chalmers, Dr. A. Hachim, Dr. Dinsha Padiwala, Dr. Raghavir Reddy, Dr. Nandan Adla, and Dr. Ram Chidambaram. Thank you. We request our moderators for the next session, Dr. Sujit Jos and Dr. Shirish Patak, on stage, please. Thank you. Requesting Dr. Sujit Jos to come on stage for stemless shoulder arthroplasty. Picture of he. Baki. Yes, good afternoon. Uh, so, 
I've been given a difficult task by Dr. Ashish, uh, stemless shoulder arthroplasty. Yesterday we had uh, good deliberations by Dr. Deepthi Nandan uh, about the stemmed uh, total shoulder. So we'll be discussing about the, the stemless part of it. So how did the humeral component evolve? Uh, historically, uh, the shoulder was designed for management of infections, tumors, fractures. That is a um, um, uh, Emily, uh, Jules Ben uh, design in 1893, which is the first shoulder. The stem was needed as a scaffold. So designs and derivatives had a long stem in those designs. But the evolution of implants and techniques have led to a substantial increase in the number of shoulder arthroplasties, and the number of revisions are going up. In the last uh, 20 years, they have increased by 400%, and about 10% uh, is uh, the, the, uh, about plasties is um, uh, revision plasties. So the hip and shoulder are analogous joints, but uh, uh, do they work um, the same? No. Uh, the hip is a weight-bearing joint, but shoulder is a non-weight-bearing joint, and the focus is more on the range of motion than on the vertical stress uh, loading on the joint. So, yeah, uh, is a stem, uh, stem really required? Isolated humeral stem loosening is a rare complication, the absence of infection. That is a Berta Butch review of 2022, uh, where they boldly stated that only indications for a stemmed implant is four part fractures, and in those patients with severe destruction of the humeral head, where there, where there is no surface uh, um, remains to be replaced. Uh, that's another review by Gonzalez et al., uh, where the, uh, the many studies were uh, uh, taken into consideration and the humeral um, uh, loosening was less than uh, the, the glenoid loosening, which took almost 24%, uh, in, in addition to the un unreasons of glenoid erosion and stuff like that. So humeral complications were more on interop, 10% by interop uh, fractures or periprosthetic fractures, where they are all r related to the stem. So. The newest humeral innovations are um, uh, consisting of shorter stem or even eliminating the stem. That's what we are going to talk about now. So uh, the complications of revision, again, are mainly uh, 30 to 30, 36% are related to the diaphyseal component of the stem. That uh, Levio, uh, Levio, who said uh, cement is not required, and, and we, we shifted to uncement in 2001 after the study. In revisions, are, um, um, uh, uh, the more time, as we saw Dr. George Athwal perform the removal of the stem, that was the, uh, the time when we were holding our breath and uh, there was a huge clap when the stem came out. That is so difficult to get a stem out when you're doing a uh, revision, whether it be a hemi or a total shoulder in place. So you have to try the balance, uh, the need for a stable fixation of the humeral component with the potential need for revision by preserving bone stock, if possible, without uh, damaging the anatomy or the, uh, what is required from the, the total joint. Stemless is the answer. That's again a, a heavy study uh, from 2010 to 2016. He uh, did many studies and humeral component problems were much less than uh, the other, other complications reported. So what are the uh, stemless designs? That is a Copeland shoulder that was just a resurfacing. There was no uh, glenoid component. And the problems were more on the glenoid side, obviously, because it was not resurfaced and the arthritis progressed there. Then there was the eclipse, uh, eclipse of uh, arthrex, which is still available here in India. It preserves the bone stock. It is stronger than a, a resurfacing arthroplasty because there is a deeper fixation into the metaphysis. Uh, um, there, that is the uh, eclipse when it's compared with a conventional stem, where the stem goes deeper in. That's the total evolutive shoulder system tests of uh, Biomet. We don't have that in India. There's another design which is available here with the stemless, uh, the Mirai with an inverted bearing surface. The um, um, uh, glenoid component uh, was replaced with titanium and uh, vitamin E poly on the humeral side because on a metal back, there were problems with metal back. The uh, Boyle U study was there about the metal back, uh, the metal back uh, failures. But the metal backs failed because the total thickness that was uh, possible on the glenoid side was 7 mm, where 3 mm was taken by the base plate itself and the poly of 4 mm would wear off fast. So inver inversion of the bearing surface is giving metal on the glenoid side and polyethylene on the humeral side um, reverse, um, in, uh, um, ch change that problem. And it can be converted to the reverse system with these as well. So what are the advantages of a uh, stemless component? It preserves bone stock, there is less stretch shielding, less interoperative uh, fractures. Even, the, even if they occur, they, they occur as metaphyseal cracks, which can be easily dealt with, eliminates uh, diaphyseal stress riser, easier implant removal at uh, revision. And uh, the humeral component is independent of the stem, so you can more uh, accurately plan the, the placement of the humeral component. 
and it reduces the operating time by 15 to 20 minutes. And the accurate um, offset uh, can be uh, recreated since there is no, no stem. You can plan the cut accordingly. And uh, the correct head angulation and version and, uh, can be um, done perfectly as there is not constrained by the stem. So radiographic changes are seen, are reported around the implant and sequential follow-up, but many of which are asymptomatic. Uh, Habermeyer described three zones of loosening around a stemless implant, the ABC, and uh, around the base and the coring. There is a case example, a 63-year-old uh, female, osteoarthritis, retired telephone officer. The uh, uh, forward flexion was 80, abduction uh, 45, internal rotation was severely restricted, uh, external rotation was uh, only uh, 5 degrees. Those are the MRI images. You can see the rotator cuff is preserved. And there is not much of wasting there. So we went ahead with the total shoulder arthroplasty. That is a glenoid being prepared, the metal back and the titanium liner. And that's the humeral uh, component where um, uh, it's very easy. You just tap it in into the metaphyseal bone and it fixes well and the humeral component is placed. That's the results. Um, after six months, the patient is having good range of motion and she's happy with her shoulders. So uh, the radiographic changes, although they happen, they are always uh, mostly asymptomatic. And it's usually due to the adaptation and stress redistribution around the implant and wouldn't um, uh, influence the, uh, the final result. So is there a, a stemless reverse? Yes, uh, that's the first uh, stemless re reverse, which is the Verso 2005 by Biomet. And uh, it relies on the fixation uh, uh, on the cancellous bone without the need for a cortical fixation. There are fins with titanium porous coating and hydroxyapatite, which fixes well uh, onto the uh, metaphysis of the uh, um, uh, humerus. Uh, there, if there is osteoporosis or bone cysts, they have advised for impaction bone grafting there. There's a test reverse, uh, again from um, Biomet. And uh, the, the short stem, Ascent Flex, these are all the designs which have evolved over time. And that's another um, design, the Mirai, where again, uh, reverse uh, can be done with the, with the same, same components. That is a stemless reverse, 89 year old with cuff tear arthropathy. And uh, here, you have to be careful. Uh, if you want more offset on the humeral side, you have to add a stem and push it in or uh, cut the humeral component less. But the hold is much better than the, the, the resurfacing humeral arthroplasty. So in literature, the total complication rate for a stemless reverse was around 6.5 in the study published in uh, the review published in um, uh, 21. And the reoperant ra rate was uh, 1.4. Scapular notching uh, around the same as the stem reverse. Lucencies around the humeral component were reported, but uh, in 0.8 was in the shoulders of the humeral component. But in trauma scenario, never think about uh, stemless. You always need to have a stem to uh, support the humeral component uh, well. So take home, uh, the stemless shoulder arthroplasty preserves the bone stock. It saves operating time in interrupt blood loss. Uh, easier positioning of the head angulation and versions. Stems are required in fracture scenario or in severely compromised bone quality. And it makes revision much easier. So you should strongly consider stemless in total shoulder arthroplasty. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sujit. Uh, next, I would like to call Alexander Lederman for giving his talk on maximizing external rotation and forward flexion after RSA. Unfortunately, I don't understand. <laughs> so I think that a lot has already been said uh, during this Congress. I will try to, to summarize. OK. I, I, yeah, thank you. It's thank the previous you. one. I will try to, to summarize uh, what I learned and um, what is my philosophy regarding now planning and how to increase to improve the, the range of motion. So I have clearly conflict of interest regarding this presentation. So I would like to quickly to go over, um, over what the, the theory, what theoretically uh, we know regarding prosthetic design in bone. And we'll talk about the glenosphere eccentricity, the size and the lateralization, but also the neck shaft angle, the scapulothoracic joint and the soft tissue. And very quickly to uh, to try to remind you what we know practically. And you will see that it's, it's not so much. 
So regarding the, the prosthetic design and the bone, the first point is the, the glenos fag centricity. And uh, Mizuno uh, with the team uh, of Gilles Valch, and we, we also have been working about this topic, and we noticed that uh, an inferior eccentricity will reduce the severity of scapular notching. This is why we trend, the, the trend is to put your base plate quite low. And this will also maximize the range of motion by increasing the sub subacromal space. If you put your glenosphere lower, you will have, of course, more space above uh, for a free range of motion. And then you can play with the eccentricity of the, the glenosphere. Most of the system provide it now. And interestingly, an inferior eccentricity will increase extension. And we have been working uh, with Patrick Donard and also the, 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 the team of Patrick uh, on, on this topic and found that clinically the ideal ex, uh, of inferior overhanging should be at around 2.5 millimeters. And in a computer modeling, taking into account 10,000 scapula, we also show recently, it's not yet published, that theoretically five millimeters uh, is the ideal compromise to improve the global range of motion. However, I, my feeling is that um, uh, practically this is a little bit too much. So just remind this, inferior eccentricity, not more than 2.55 millimeters. And then this is something that I do systematically now. I, I play with the eccentricity and I never put my eccentricity inferior. Why? Because I want to increase extension. You see on this um, planification that if your eccentricity is inferior, you will have an extension of 52 degrees. And if it's posterior inferior, this will increase to 73 degrees. And why is it important? It's important because to do internal rotation hand in the back, you need posterior clearance, you need a good extension. Uh, it's a combined movement of extension, abduction, and internal rotation. So this is also why I really try today to put my, uh, my glenosphere in this position. So it's either posterior or posterior inferior. And another very important point is that you will put your humerus far away from the coaccurate process. And I'm deeply persuaded that the, the anterior impingement, it's an underreported complication. So advantage of putting your eccentricity posterior you increase extension, so potentially internal rotation and in the back, and you avoid the, post, the anterior impingement. Then what about the glenosphere size? So it, it, I think it's quite easy. To summarize, if you have a small glenosphere, you will have good range of motion with the hand above the head. Okay, you will increase abduction and you will increase external rotation elbow at side. So small glenosphere, good range of motion, of, uh, uh, with the hand above the head. Larger glenosphere, better reto rotation, elbow at side. Remember this. So it's also depending of your patient expectation. Uh, if, you, if your patient wants to throw or wants to have a nice haircut, think small. But you need to remind, you, you need to remember that larger glenosphere, it's more difficult to implant, you will limit abduction, why? Because you push the humerus superiorly, so you will impinge. Um, you will impinge with the acromion. It may lead to other stuffing, and we had some nice example during this congress. And you will have a greater polyethylene volume loss. So, in my practice, I, I, I rather aim for smaller glenosphere. What about lateralization? So, on the human side, and there are some bias because in these studies. The design were not always the same, but globally, if you want, if you don't have posterior cuff and you implant a reverse, you should, in theory, lateralize a little bit on the humerus, maybe using an only system. And how much you do, should, should we lateralize? And now I will mainly talk about the glenoid side. So we, we did a study and took 10,000 scapula. Why? Because we are all different, and. We transform these 10,000 scapula into seven models that represent all of them. 
And then we have been able to implant virtually prosthesis with various factors, glenosphere size, inferior eccentricity, and lateralization, okay? And you see that if you just look at one range of motion, whatever you do, whatever the combination you take, it doesn't change a lot. But if you take a deduction, the difference is absolutely dramatic. And then if you take everything, you don't understand anything. I, I'm not able to read this kind of graph. And this is probably why in the future AI will be uh, a solution. However, at the end, when we analyze the global range of motion, we observe that the most important factor was the lateralization, then the distalization, and finally the glenosphere size. As I said, probably that AI will help. Now regarding uh, the neck shaft angle, if you have a low neck shaft angle, you will increase dramatically extension, so potentially internal rotation and in the back. And if you have a low neck shaft angle, you will decrease abduction. Mark Frankel never admitted this, but if you read the two studies that he published in 2008 in the GBGSAM and in the GSES, he has with low neck shaft angle really bad uh, abduction compared to other design. Read again this study, it's quite interesting. And again, when he published his result, he has quite bad abduction. This is why, because he's just using a 135. Low neck shaft angle will increase external rotation elbow outside, and it will dramatically decrease, again, the abduction external rotation. So if you use uh, 135, you may have very rapidly, due to low abduction, a contact and in external rotation, and this will limit your, uh, your external rotation uh, at 90 degrees, and consequently this kind of movement that the ground motor that I operate wants to have. So this is one of the limits of the 135. So again, high neck shaft angle, it's going to be fine. You will increase the anterior forward flexion, the abduction, so hand in the, uh, above the head. Low neck shaft angle, it's better uh, elbow at side. Quite easy, rem uh, quite easy to remember. Um, scapular thoracic joint, Moroder has been working a lot about it, and the take home message is maybe in theory, if you have a patient that is a little bit kyphotic, you should increase the um, posterior, um, the, the rotation of your stem. You should increase the retroversion of your stem, excuse me. This is in theory, practically it has not been proved yet. Now, finally, for soft tissue, and again, you heard this during this Congress. This is really in theory. If you don't have cough, it's probably useless to lateralize too much because uh, you want to have more recruitment of the, of the deltoid. Um, and if you have a good cough, you want to uh, lateralize on the, uh, on the glenoid side because you will do a retentioning of, your re of the remnant of your rotator cuff. So think also about the, the soft tissue. And all this, in, this is in theory because practically there is almost no difference, okay? So in theory it's great, practically in the series that has been published, most of the time it doesn't change anything. So do we have golden rules? And the golden rules, they don't exist because most of the data uh, are been, uh, have been made with very few scapula and we are different, okay? This is two scapula of human living today on Earth. And if you think about one design, it will be completely different for the other scapula because these people are not made the, the same. So is there a best compromise? I think that in life, extremes are really good. So in Switzerland, we love to adopt compromise. And this is also maybe the case in India. So for me, and also maybe for you, because we have, or you have almost the same morphology than Europeans, uh, think that, remember that the glenoid lateralization is probably the most important, and you should aim to have at least five millimeters, and a small inferior eccentricity, 
and the glenosphere size in my hand is not really important. I will use only a large glenosphere in a B's patient that may have a risk of dislocation. You need to think bone and soft tissue, and typically for an Indian patient, you could recommend an intermediate glenoid, so five millimeters, an intermediate humerus, something that could be between onlay and uh, inlay, like a flush lay, with a low neck shaft angle, and I typically use a 145 with a small glenosphere. And as I said before, uh, this is going to change because obviously in the few next year, we will have dramatic change with really uh, more guidance thanks to AI. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Uh, any questions? Okay, we'll invite uh, Peter to give his uh, talk on subscapularis sparing total shoulder orthoplasty. Thank you, Peter. Kisi Mahapurush ne kaha hai ki kamyab hone ke liye nahi, kabil hone ke liye padho. Success ki piche mat bhago. Excellence, excellence ka picha karo. Success jhak maar ke tumhare piche aayegi. Kis Mahapurush ne kaha hai? Baba Ran Chhod Das. Okay, um, so um, it's really an honor to be here. This is my last talk, and I have a huge thanks to Ashish for the invitation. It's an amazing Congress, and a huge congratulations to you for, and your team for pulling it off. So um, this is my talk on subscap sparing total charlotoplasty. Um, I'd um, like to present first the reason why I think this makes sense. So I think if you look critically in the literature, the, the, the authors that have really analyzed their failure rates um, with total shoulder arthroplasty, the failure rate of the subscapularis is somewhere between 10 and 25% in the studies that have looked carefully. And if it fails, you really can't successfully re-repair it. So this is a patient of my own where you can see the LTO pulled off. I tried to repair it again. I pulled it back down and the shoulder is still anteriorly subluxated. Even if you repair the subscapularis and it heals, there is muscle atrophy that occurs. And this is from a study that George did that shows that quite nicely, that in, with you an LTO or a peel, there's clearly progression of fatty infiltration of the subscapularis postoperatively. The reason why that matters is because then you lose the balance of your transverse force couple. If you don't have as much subscapularis, then the axial force is no longer balanced on the glenoid, and there's clearly an association between muscle, rotator cuff muscle volume and balance and subluxation in research that we've done. The other issue, and we've talked about this, is the subscapularis pulls down on the humerus, so this is the subscapularis that I've dissected out. Everyone's heard of the lateral tendon of the subscapularis. You may not know that it also has a medial tendon. The medial tendon of the subscapularis is inferior, again, because the muscle is pulling inferiorly while it pulls medially. And so as a result, if you lose the subscapularis, you very clearly have decentering in both the coronal and the axial planes. And the result then is that you have the rocking horse phenomenon and you have accelerated glenoid loosening. And this is the study John Levy did that showed again if you have subscap failure, there's quite accelerated glenoid loosening rates. There's also a change in the patient's function. So this is another study John Levy did that showed in his subset of patients that has subscapularis dysfunction, there's quite worse outcomes on basically every single scale that he looked at. So the question then becomes is, would it be possible for us to do the arthroplasty without cutting this tendon? Um, so this is a cadaver I've dissected out, and you can see it's quite challenging. The subscapularis is very much in the way. It's really the entirety of it. And this is the entirety of the view that you get through the interval. Um, so I'm going to show you the technique that I've been working on to do the arthroplasty through the interval. I've been working on this now for about eight years. This is the first notes that I took on it when I was a fellow in 2016. And I think there's some specific challenges associated with the procedure. These are the challenges, and these are the specific solutions I've come up with as I've gone through my learning curve to try and get through it. So number one is it's challenging to move the osteophytes. I think that creating a window below the subscapularis or what I call the sub-subscapularis window is extremely important for that. That also allows you to do your capsular release on the humeral side. I think for the head cut, you don't want to do the head cut freehand here. You definitely want to use some kind of guide. I'm using an extramedullary guide. There's others in the US using an intramedullary guide. I think both can work and I'll show that to you. Glenoid access can be a challenge. That's, the glenoid is actually not the hard side here, it's the humerus, but I'm using a circular component on the glenoid that's inlaid that I think drastically improves your ability to get the surgery done. For humor preparation, I think a stem component is critical. It's very, very difficult for you to get an on foss view of the cut surface, so a stemless component really so, thus far with today's instrumentation does not work. Getting the humerus in the right position is obviously very critical, so I'm using fluoroscopy, and then there is a neurovascular risk here, and I'm using neuromonitoring, 
And the one place where I think the nerve is really at risk is during the head cut. So I think you don't want to complete the head cut with the saw. You want to complete it with an osteotome, and that's a position, part of the operation you want to be particularly careful about. So this is one of the first um, that I did. I think this is the third one that I did. I've done about 40 at this point. Um, and these are the x-rays that I think are achievable with this, com with this technique. And this is my patient at three weeks. So this is three weeks after his anatomic total strathoplasty, and you see he has basically full range of motion. The challenge I have is at the beginning, I told the patients, there's no restrictions. I didn't cut your subscapularis, so you can do what you want. So this same patient, he came in at three weeks, he said, I have no pain, I have full range of motion. I said, great, do what you'd like. And then he was hanging drywall a week later, using his operative arm to pound in a nail to hang the drywall, and he pounded harder on his stem than I'd pounded on it during surgery and drove his stem down a little bit. So I still think you need some restrictions. So definitely I've modulated here to a place where I say, you don't need a sling and you can have full range of motion from the beginning, but I don't want you to use that arm to push or pull with more than a couple pounds of force for six weeks while we wait for the components to ingrow to avoid this. The other thing that I'll, I'll show you, and this is the ugliest x-ray that I have of the ones that I've done, so this is as bad as it gets, is that a valgus head cut is very problematic. So I think it's really important when you do this that you need to get the inclination of the head cut right. If you don't, then you'll end up placing the glenoid component high, which you can see here, and then you'll place the humeral component in a malpositioned place. So this is my ugliest x-ray, but this is the patient's function, and it's actually pretty good. This patient now is five years out um, and has been, remained quite happy with his arthroplasty, even though he has an x-ray that does not look very good to me. So this is my current technique. Hopefully we can get this video to play. Um, so it's my patient. He has a little bit of a B2. You can see this is our pre amplification. Uh, I plan the humerus and the glenoid to get, the, to get this right. So I've already done a tilt pectoral release. I do a double ligation of the three sisters, and our subscapularis window is between the two ligation sites. So two ligations work between them. This allows us to get to the osteophyte. This allows us to do our, humeral, our, our capsular release on the humerus. So I'm removing here osteophytes with um, a, um, an osteotome. As you can see, we can bring those out through that inferior window. Then from there, we're going to open the rotator interval. And for me, um, in addition to a biceps tenodesis, we're going to actually excise the interval. So you can see here I'm excising a triangle of tissue. So this is not just a release along the side of the subscapularis. We're going to excise the entirety of the interval. So you have to feel the leading edge of the supra, excise this triangle, and then this is going to be our, our guide. So you see that's our guide for the inclination. I've got that lined up with the forearm. I usually will pin this and then I'll disassemble it, and then I'll move it up the pin so that I can make the pin, the, the cut through the interval. So these are the only current instruments that are specific to this. These are these twisted homans that are very useful for protecting the cuff when you make the cut. So I'll place these twisted homans. We've got our gut guide in place, and then you have to trust the guide. And again, don't complete the cut. I usually will feel and make sure I know where the medial border is, because again, I think that's a place of risk, and you want to make sure that's reasonable. Then we're going to take the cut, complete the cut with an osteotome, and take it out through the interval. So you can see here's the cut coming out. We've planned already, so I'm going to bring out the cut and then measure and make sure it looks like what I've planned, make sure that I've gotten the entire of the head out. So we'll measure our height and our width. Now we're going to come back, and if there's a little bit of a rim remaining, you can notice I've got a dare there to protect the nerve. Now we're going to work on our glenoid exposure here. So I place retractors here, posterior superiorly, and then we're going to work on removing all of the labrum, removing, basically skeletonizing all the way to the base of the coracoid so that we can get the subscapularis. Here's our glenoid exposure. You see it's not bad. We'll get our pin centered, and then from there, once I've got the pin in, I'm going to make sure, double check with the trial, make sure it's in the right place. So trial goes in. That looks like it's pretty well centered to me. From there, we'll get our reamer in do our reaming and make sure that we've got this all the way down. And then from there, we're gonna be ready. So I'll check this again. Again, that looks relatively well centered. Um, and this is, a, this is a component where you cement both the locking ring and the central aspect of it. They have released very recently a hybrid component, which I haven't used yet, but that's the one with a metal post in the middle. Then we'll get our component to come in through the interval. We're gonna impact that and then we'll check it. And I'm gonna pause the video here for just a second so you can see it's actually in pretty good position. You know, you can get all the way around. From there, we're going to find the humeral canal. So this is me cannulating the canal. And then this is a brooch-based system that allows us to get our version right. And then this, again, is kind of a trial. We're going to put in our trial, and then we're going to check it on fluoroscopy. Again, we'll get the head size right, make sure that's going to fit. We'll get this in through the interval. And then this is the final component. So this is, um, this is my patient six weeks later. Um, you can see that's I've you recorded our perfect circle here, I think pretty well. I think this is a relatively well-sized component. 
And then this is him at six weeks. This is his strength and motion. So you see his motion is coming back. He's not quite as far along as the other patient that I showed you, but for six weeks, I think he has pretty, pretty accelerated range of motion. But I would challenge anyone else in this room to have that subscapularis strength at six weeks out from taking the subscapularis down and repairing it. He has basically normal strength of the subscapularis at six weeks. These are my outcomes thus far. Um, as I mentioned, I've done about 40 of them. I have 20 that are, about, that are at two years. I have 95% follow-up on those, and you see their SSV scores are 90, and their SC scores are 94, and pain scores are less than one. I've compared these to a control group of lesser tuberosity osteotomy patients, and you'll see the outcomes are comparable. So I don't think this procedure necessarily is gonna be better in the short term than the traditional way that you do it, but it avoids the compl complication of losing the subscap and hopefully avoids those patients where the glenoid comes loose and allows you to have a patient with no restrictions, so hopefully it's a quicker recovery. Thank you. Can we have some questions? Oh, yeah, yeah. Dr. Shirish is here. Let me invite Dr. Shirish Patak uh, for his talk on RSA, notching, and base plate loosening. Good afternoon. I think I just made it in time. Yeah. Insan ka emotion, uska motion ka saath jura hua hai. Kamal hai. Aap har baat ko pet se kaise jura dete hai? Okay, so I'm going to speak about a very relevant topic, uh, scapular notching and base plate loosening. So what is scapular notching? Scapular notching refers to the erosion of inferior scapular neck just below the glenoid implant, which is caused by physical impingement and contact made from the medial humeral socket poly in adduction movement. We all know the scapular notching. Servo has classified into four grades, and we just need a true AP X-ray for that. And three and four are the severe ones, which can potentially destabilize the base plate. If you look at the incidence of scapular notching, first generation Gramo design, medialized glenoid and numerous, almost 90% of these reverses had scapular notching. Here, the next shaft angle was 155. Now, if we look at this systematic review about complications of reverse, 113 studies included, and they have looked at the different parameters, like designs before 2015, after 2015, the effect of follow-up less than five years, more than five years, comparison between primary versus reverse, uh, revision, reverse, and medialized or lateralized center of rotation. I look at the graphical presentation. The incidence was quite high in the range of 40% before 15, which has come down significantly to 23. If you look at the progression of scapular notching, with longer follow-ups, it has definitely gone up. So it is progressive and evolutive. If we look at the revision reverse, it is definitely more than 50%. And with lateralized center of rotation, the scapular notching has definitely reduced from 33 to 22%. Now, severity of notching. If you look at the severity, luckily, almost 80% of the scapular notching was type 1 and type 2. And 20% was 3 and 4. So, scapular notching, is it, a, is it innocent radiological finding? Does scapular notching lead to inferior clinical outcomes? And most importantly, does it lead to loosening of glenoid? I think potential effect or impact of severe scapular notching is quite logical. You can have a polyparticle disease, synovitis, inflammation, leading to glenoid erosion, and probably glenoid loosening, needing revision and surgery. This is a nice paper about impact of scapular notching of reverse shoulder in midterm outcomes, five year minimum follow up. If we look at the incidence, it was 14%. And at the latest follow up, they concluded patients with scapular notching had significant worse clinical outcomes, less abduction, less forward flexion, strength, 
and it leads to more complications and revisions and radiologically radiolucent lines. This is another systematic review and meta-analysis where they have studied two level three and nine level four studies. The current literature suggests that scapular notching definitely leads to reduced uh, functional scores, either ACS or constant, and reduced abduction and flexion over the period. Now we should look at the what is the percentage of aseptic glenoid loosening in reverse shoulder. So if you look at this paper, almost more than 7,000 patients studied by Friedman, the incidence of glenoid loosening was less than 1%. And the risk factors identified were either rheumatoid, diabetics, B2, B3 glenoids, or expanded lateralized glenosphere. And there was no role of scapular notching for aseptic glenoid loosening. What is the incidence and risk of loosening in reverse shoulder? Another paper, scapular notching, glenosphere center of rotation offset, patient age and sex. They were not associated with glenoid loosening. So although we do see a lot of scapular notching, but it is not potentially giving rise to loosening of glenoid. So what are strategies to reduce scapular notching? Because we know it is causing inferior outcomes clinically, although it is not causing glenoid loosening. So neck shaft angle reduction from 155 to 145 or 135, lateralized glenosphere, inferiorly inclined glenosphere, and inferior overhang of the glenosphere. These are the by and large good strategies in the design to reduce the scapular notching. This is a nice paper by Anthony Romeo, where they have studied more than 2,000 shoulders. 80% were 155 neck shaft angle, 20 were with 135. And look at the incidence of scapular notching. The scapular notching reduced from 18 to 3. So just change in the neck shaft angle is going to reduce scapular notching significantly. As I discussed in my first talk, you can see just lateralized humerus the polymetaphyseal tray is far away from the medial side of the glenoid and you reduce adduction deficit and potential complication of scapular notching. Now does lateralization of glenosphere reduce the scapular notching? So this is a nice paper where they have, they have concluded that the incidence of scapular notching was almost same even if you lateralize glenosphere up to 4 millimeter and if you lateralized beyond 4 millimeter, it reduces scapular notching, but it has got certain other disadvantages like increase in the scapular strain. So this is about bio-RSA, yes, about 10 millimeter of bony lateralization. Yes, scapular notching was quite high, but yes, it was less than generation one Gramo design. It reduced from 75 to 40%. So glenoid lateralization from zero to five, won't give you much benefit for scapular notching and if you go beyond five then it causes a lot of strain on the scapular spine leading to probably stress fractures as scapula at longer term follow-up. So probably scapular notching should be reduced more at a humeral level than glenoid level. This is a nice paper by George where they have studied 40 patients and they have compared the incidence of loosening as well as uh, scapular notching between Bone, bone, bone RSA, lateralized bio RSA, and metal augmented RSA. It was hardly 7% with both series, no difference. And there was no glenoid loosening, either with metal or bio RSA. And clinical outcomes were comparable. This is another systematic review. You can look at the newer studies, recent studies. The scapular notching has almost gone down to 12 to 13%. That is a good news. Now there is another concept where they have inverted bearing, like you have put a ceramic or a poly on the glenosphere side uh, and metal on the metaphyseal side and they have said that's a different pattern of scapular notching. You do get scapular notching but there is no polyparticle disease. So it is just a radiological finding but no effect on the clinical functional outcome. Of course stainless RSA. Uh, again, it's almost same and as the follow-up duration goes up, the scapular 
uh, notching goes up and of course there is no glenoid lateralization possible in this series so in summary scapular notching is significantly reduced with overall lateralization of center of rotation more than 5 years the incidence is going to go up and it is definitely progressive severe scapular notching causes deterioration in clinical and functional outcome scorings but by and large there is no association of scapular notching with a septic glenoid loosening thank you thank you very much uh, uh, dr shirish please stay back for a couple of questions yeah questions uh, for the last session speakers question please peter question for you very elegant technique i have flirted with that technique for stemless but it's very brave and uh, it's an amazing job because you've taken the soft tissue management to a next level because arthroplasty is soft tissue and soft tissue will survive uh, the, my uh, concern and let me know your experience on this by using an extra medial guide you can get away with uh, the cut and the limited exposure is there any chance of uh, version errors on that because the intramedial guide is much more has a high fidelity towards getting the correct version that you want have you looked into that yeah i think that's a great question i'll say i've been um, as i mentioned i've been iterating around the technique for a while for a long time i was using just pins placed under fluoroscopy and the version pin it's nice because then you can modulate it very well I know there are, as I mentioned, people using intramedullary guides in the United States. Um, and the challenge I have with that is that if you project the line of the middle of the abscess up, it goes through the supraspinatus. Yeah. Um, and we know that well from people that are nailing the humerus. So um, to me, you really can't get the intramedullary guide where you need and have the supraspinatus be intact. So I, I, like everything else in life, it's a compromise, you know? Yeah. So to me, that's part of the reason why I think to do this technique, prevent planning is critical and you know for I'm planning the humerus as you saw and putting the humeral plan and say okay if I put my version in 30 30 um, you know 30 degrees which is what I'm usually using what does that look like on my plan does that look crazy and if not saying okay then maybe that'll be reasonable sure. and are you against stemless because um, it eliminate that problem for you completely <laughs> Uh, I, I can tease for you that that will be possible in the next couple of years once we're done developing instrumentation, but that's not done yet. Yeah, yeah. My two? Yes, sir. Since uh, Shirish has been saying that uh, longer follow-up has a high incidence of notching, are there no designs that are coming up uh, which can uh, change the shape of the humor tray and maybe have a cutout something like this? Yes, Shirish. We, if we see the literature, the scapular notching has gone down from 96% to probably 10 in certain series is 3%. So I think it has significantly reduced. And any change in the humor tray would probably eliminate the No, I think they have worked on that. We have lateralized humerus, tray. we have lateralized lenosphere. Yeah, but I think by default, if you look at the design, some amount of scapular notching is still there. But as we discussed, if we try to lateralize glenosphere more, there is no added advantage. But I think... Any cutout in the humor trail, something like this. Yeah, so, see, over <laughs> the, the 10 years, the definitely there is poly wear. But that is bound to happen with poly. But yes, it has come down significantly. I think the uh, notching is multifactorial, but from the humeral side, most of the uh, designs are now 140, 145, like that. So it has uh, significantly come down. Any other questions? A uh, question, Dr. Peter. Um, yeah. uh, in, in this technique, it's like the direct anterior approach for the hip joint, where you're not violating the soft tissues, you're going into the joint through two windows, isn't it? So you are approaching the glenoid uh, from, uh, in, through the subscap window, that's what I understood. And uh, uh, what are the challenges you face? Because the head is there and the subscap is tying the head forwards. So what are the challenges and how to get around it? Yeah, so I think that's part of the reason, as I, I tried to mention, you have to skeletonize down to the base of the coracoid. Once you release the connections between the subscapularis and the coracoid and the supraspinatus of the coracoid, then the two muscles can come away from one another. Um, and that, um, that for me, has been the critical aspect of being able to get the humerus to subscale a little bit down and out of the way so that you can access the glenoid. I think one of the critical things that at least I, I, has been part of my experience is 
you know, traditionally, when you do an anatomic shoreloplasty or a reverse shoreloplasty, a lot of the operations performed with the arm in external rotation to try and get the humerus out of the way. And that's completely different from sub for subscapularing. For subscapularing, when you turn the arm in external rotation, you tension the subscapularis and you, you make your exposure much worse. So a lot of, it's taken a lot of retraining my brain to form the operation in more neutral rotation and more extension, um, which is, it's, that's a lesson. I wish I could say that I invented that lesson, but it's a lesson from uh, Richard Berger in the United States, who was a mentor of mine in residency, who did um, his knee arthroplasties through this little one-inch incision because he would do the entire operation with the knee in extension. Um, so it's basically the exact same concept. Yes, Dinsha? Peter, one more. Is there anything extra that you need to do for the axillary nerve with this subscap sparing? So I, um, I, I, I do think that you always have to be cautious about the axillary nerve. You may have noticed in the video I, I am neuromonitoring them because I'm uh, nervous. Um, and um, I do think that if you, if you are interested in the technique that it's not a bad thing to do at first to run motors at regular intervals to be confident the axillary nerve is okay. Thank you. No more questions. We can go to the next session. Thank you. I request for the panelists to come on stage. Dr. Basim Al Hassan, Dr. Peter Chamas, Dr. A. Hachim, Dr. Dinsha Padiwala, Dr. Raghuvir Reddy, Dr. Nandan Adla, Dr. Ram Chidambaram, please. So while the faculty are assembling, I would uh, prematurely like to thank all the people who are involved in this uh, successful conclave and that laundry list is exhausting so I don't think I can name everybody individually but without doubt my A team, my shoulder department, my secretary Mrs. Kala, all my fellows, uh, champions, you've seen they've been active behind my scenes. I've had to do very little although I take the credit, uh, these guys do all the hard work. You see the instant execution of x-rays and CT scans, you see the pictures and all the uh, collages and the uh, promotions uh, that our team has done. So they are unmatched and I think they make me look good. So thank you very much. It really is impressive. My foreign faculty has been top notch. All eight of them have been absolutely brilliant. These are difficult cases and it's very, you might think the arthrology went well, but I'm operating in my home ground with my own team. These guys are working in another uh, city where they're not used to a new team. Patient has not been seen. They don't have the same instruments. We try to give them the best. So these were excellent and that reflects on your presence all the way till the end. So that's incredibly good. My local faculty also has been committed. They have been doing exceedingly well. They've been here. They've sacrificed their work and Ashish come in. Welcome back. You did a swell job. We just trying to praise you before you came in along with all our faculty. So thank you for your commitment. The management of the hospital has been supreme. They have been absolutely top class. The OR staff, the administration staff, getting eight rooms for our eight patients. Uh, to be honest, seven of those eight patients have been treated completely free, including implant, including every charges. And that's only because Dinanath Mangeshkar management is unmatched across the world. They will do this. I don't have to plead them, I don't have to go on my knees. They will do this just like that. And I think it's a big relief to me that by virtue, we are also educating you. I'm also getting administrative experience, but the patients are benefiting out of this. So we are not exploiting them. So they also get their bucks worth. So the big bang for their buck. So that's very impressive. Uh, Vama unmatched. Rucha has been absolutely number one. She's flittering somewhere here. She's always on the job. There you are. Rucha, thank you very much. I mean, this is the second time with me and uh, she has been, I mean, they, they find flaws and they fill in where I'm uh, missing out and it's impossible to tick all the check boxes. So they do this very well. Uh, Vikram, thank you very much for your support. The JW team, JW Manage has been the best. I think the food was fantastic. And uh, the arrangements have been top class. So uh, we've been doing very well so far. Everything finishing on time and we'll finish on time today as well. The delegates, awesome stuff. You guys sitting there watching us, your attention and your interaction is getting better and better every year. So thank you. Keep coming. We love you.
Um, along with that, uh, the industry has been, of course, full of support. This, none of this would happen without the industry, and uh, they allow us to carry with our whims. Uh, we don't let them dictate the agenda, and we try to keep this agenda completely unbiased, unprejudiced, so that we give you the actual evidence-based research stuff. So thank you, everybody. The family, of course, uh, you've seen most of them. They were here on the banquet day. They sacrifice a lot. More than that, uh, I think they put up with my idiosyncrasy. And that's impossible. Trust me, you guys see the good side of me. Uh, it, it's a big compromise that I'm not there and I'm here. But uh, no complaints. They are here and they support us brilliantly. And there are tons of invisible people apart from all this. Uh, so if I have not acknowledged you, sorry, forgive me, because it's getting late in the day. Okay, so love you for your unstinted effort and uh, keep coming back. I can only say that this is endearing and I promise we'll come back with bigger strength. Give us your feedback, it is important. You're receiving emails. Every time you give us suggestions, we are improving on that. And that's why every conclave tries to get better and better. So I promise you that uh, we will do even better next time. Thank you very much, appreciate it. Right, let's get going. Now we start with a bang. Uh, guys, uh, this is a 56-year-old surgeon, uh, senior guy, accomplished person, no com comorbidities, no injuries. He's a gym guy. He's an absolute nutter. Gym guy, he's claim to fame, 120 kg bench on the trot. And that's all he does. He does bungee jumping, scuba diving, all sorts of things. So I'm just trying to build up his mental makeup here. December 2020, he had a left shoulder cuff tear, 14 mm, and uh, he, so this is of course much later. As a colleague, um, right hand dominant, how would you address him? Rag Raghu? Mind you, he's not your neighborhood fellow who can be conserved in the sense that he's a complete gym guy. You tell him, don't go to the gym, I'll conserve you, he'll change the surgeon. Can just previous slide? Go back again, there you go. He also has a right side cuff tear, but he doesn't know about this yet. He's 56. Very good, 56. Ashish, he's weak on the left side. Yes, yes, How painful is he? So left side is symptomatic, right side is asymptomatic. Both sides are weak. Cuff. Yeah, I will uh, I repair it. Okay, good. There should have been no hesitation. This Raghu was the easiest part of the question. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so he had his first surgery, 5th of April, 2021. Being gung-ho, like you and me, we are all surgeons, we have our own trip. He told the surgeon, boss, six weeks, I don't believe in physio, I'm going to do my own physio. Took some, downloaded some stuff, went and did physio at home. And then on the 10th week, posted on Facebook, he lifted 100 kg. Within two weeks or three weeks, he had done 120 kg, again on Facebook. Doing well, asymptomatic, very happy, and he was doing his own thing. He went to Rishikesh in April, came back on the trip, tried to take off his luggage, had a complete drop arm. Had a complete drop arm. I'm going to make this easy, and because we have to come to the main gist of it, we don't want to be here all day. This guy can take the whole day off for us. And so, this time MRI was done, he had a 20 mm tear, 14 mm first, now 20 mm tear. So this is a failed cuff, supraspinatus essentially. And so he has a revision cuff repair in May 2020. He realizes that he's not ticked the check boxes, he's not followed the post-op orders. So this time he goes to a shoulder therapist and he goes to her like diligently, initially every day, then alternate day, and for a good three, three and a half months, achieves his function, good movement, and November, the therapist coaxes him, go have your MRI done. He's not in need of it, he's not been advised, 
So he says, okay, let me do an MRI. Because he, his, his undying question, his interminable question, I need to go to the gym, when do I go? And because once bitten, twice shy, he's a little hesitant, and the MRI in November 22 comes back with an even bigger tear, 22 mm. So now the question starts. Ram, so this is after two repairs. This is his T1 sag, you see the tear. So can you talk us through this now? Uh, it's just the diagnostic part. Is a, a re-tear, I think it's a medial tear. It, it looks like there is some uh, cuff component laterally with the lateral row anchor. Type uh, two. Type two yep. tear. Uh, quite retracted. We need to see the muscle fatty infiltration. There isn't any. There isn't any. Um, and he has no symptoms, you're saying? He just went for the MRI. He, he just no went for an MRI. No symptoms, no, no symptoms. pain, functionally he's no, fine. No, okay. no, no. And was any augmentation done during the revision? Not that I know of. Not that. Not that I know of. Well, this, this is more difficult now. <laughs> Bonjour, Take Alex. I was searching for you. Bonjour, Ashish. So those are the videos of the, for the sake of Alex, uh, twice rotator cuff tear. And from December onwards, he starts getting symptomatic. He, he stops uh, his rehab. He's having problems now from his surgery. Uh, oops, sorry. Let me get you this video as well, because that's a better depiction of his rather than static images. So this is we December 2021 or something, 22, I think, December 22. I see him in April. And now he's symptomatic, he's stiff on the left side, and it's affecting his ADLs. Uh, he has pain at night, can't sleep left lateral. He's, the first reading that I gave you is about 140, 140, 30, and buttocks. Yes, Alex. So, to have pain at night, uh, to be stiff after two, two surgeries, it's never a good sign. So, one of the first things will be to rule out an infection. And then it's a B2 lesion, so it's a mid-substance lesion with a very small stump. Um, but he's young, so I think that you need to have a very strong discussion. It, if you go, this is clearly the last time, otherwise the next... And this is one of the rare situations where I could, I could think about using a patch to try to reinforce. And I would not hesitate to do uh, maybe an open surgery to, um, to make the, the reinforcement even stronger. So, Do you really think open is going to be better than arthroscopic? I think that for this kind of lesion, uh, I will not hesitate, so I would want the patient that if at some point I have any doubt, I will, I guess, I will, I will and I will keep the, the medial stump. So typically I would uh, put some anchor at the musculotoninous junction and use them and even try to, to do some side to side. Mm -hmm. I, I would just, this may be more common in the United States than it is. Sorry, your white. This, this may be more common in the United States than it is in India, but many of the mid-50s males in the United States that are um, frequent gym goers are taking uh, supplements. Many of those supplements contain testosterone in various forms, um, which dramatically increases the risk of a C-actinase infection. So I, before I put a patch in, I would definitely go back to the operating room and take biopsies and probably do a bicep stenodesis. Right, let me give it to you. There's no infection, for sure, because okay. I know in retrospect, but I get your point, and if you looked at him, he looks like the testosterone guy, but I asked him point blank. He is taking no supplements. Uh, just a spoiler alert, this patient was made for Alex Lazarman. I should have sent him to you because both his surgeries. Now, I'm trying to get you the psychological makeup of this patient. Biceps was untouched in both his surgeries because this patient threatened his surgeon, don't touch my biceps. To the extent, both his surgeries were done under block. He was in beach chair, awake. He was watching his surgery because he said, I want to see my biceps, and then you may proceed. It's true. Biceps I'm not lower. making any of this. This is true. 
and awake and asleep. Is he a smoker? No, no, he's not a smoker. Very naive guy, very well built, fit. Uh, I have taken his permission to include every didactic detail with you. Okay, so Ashish, if I was to treat this patient, he has a type 2 re tear. Yes. I think probably in the second surgery, it's a revision. You're trying to get a repair that's gone into too much tension and that's why it's torn. He doesn't have an external lag sign. No. He's not that weak. He's primarily got pain. Yeah. For me, this is a straightforward indication for a superior capsular reconstruction. I will try and retain whatever remnant is there and try and repair that yeah. on the cuff like yeah. what I showed. Yeah. And I would tell him, be extremely slow Correct. with your entire process yeah. of rehab. And if he does that well, then I think that should be fine. I would warn him that under, in all probability, I'm going to sacrifice his biceps because I think that might be one of the pain generators there. But actually, Whether the pain did not, not come through both his surgeries. It came much later as the proximal migration started coming in. True, but as that's happened, I think yeah. that that biceps has taken some amount of that load yeah. and is not likely to be healthy anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Or you can also consider option of biceps SCR now. Okay. Explain to him. Possible. I think one important point we have, when you told the history that when he went in for a proper rehab, his pain was better. So he's able to get his force couple to work properly. And once he stopped his rehab, he started getting pain. So the supraspinatus may not be the direct <laughs> you know, pain generator. So if you even repair it and put a patch on top to help the repair, should be good enough so that at least the muscle tendon unit is in continuity, is loaded. Hmm. So Ashish, uh, during the surgery, I got asked whether I repair sometimes the rotator cuff when I do lower trapezius. This will be the one I will try to repair at the time, but I will medialize up to centimeter. So this patient does have still tendon. This tendon, I, I will have to evaluate. I will sign him up for lower trapezius, but I will tell him I'm gonna see that, like what tendon do you have? And if I can repair it, hopefully be able to get you better. I'm not sure I'll be able to make you normal, but I will aim to medialize up to a centimeter. I will yes. not try to bring the supraspinatus yes. all the way. And augmentation, if at the time of surgery, I was not satisfied with how it went. This is good. Collectively, all the information that you're giving you is very, very pertinent. But on the lower trapezius, his infra is not torn. He's, there's no wasting. Uh, uh, yeah, so, sorry. For this one, only as a form of augmentation. So right. you can use your, he, this is the only part because I am comfortable with it, but you yeah. can do patch, you can do SCR, you can do whatever you want in this one. Yes. Okay, Basil, when you've got a type two retear, you know, it often happens at the muscle, muscle tendon junction. And there's hardly any tendon there. So how do you get your sutures in that muscle, muscle tendon? Do you think that that might retear even if you medialize? This is why I want to do it a lower trap on him. This patient already having proximal migration. He has great muscles. In my practice, I would say this is only my practice. I will add it as a backup if at the time of surgery I was not satisfied. But SCR, biceps, patch, in my opinion, can give him good results. So why do you say that there is a proximal migration? Yes. Maybe. Ashish. Ashish. And then Hachim. Is there a proximal migration? Proximal migration? No. No, no. no I misunderstood. I thought you were saying progressive. No, no, no. No proximal migration. Yeah. Did, could you see again the MRI? Exactly. For, for me, uh, uh, I, 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 I like lower trapezius, but in this case, I would not do uh, lower trapezius. But definitely, I have experience with medial uh, disruption of uh, tear, I mean in infalid. I used uh, to use tapes, not sutures, and horizontal mattress, and to reinforce it with rip stop. And then I try to these tapes pass through the remnant. Yes. And put the second anchor outside to the- To decompress your exactly. medial, yes. I mean, I try to pass the tapes inside or, or inside or lower the lower, uh, the lateral remanent uh, tear yes. without any tension, yes. without, I mean, was like, like a single row. Yes. And then in this case, I definitely use the biceps at reinforcement and a CR in the middle, middle, middle row. Yes. But I, 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 I don't think this, this patient has uh, super immigration. A little bit, little bit in the MRI, little bit, the distance is a little bit low, but maybe this is in, 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 in yeah. reset, not in, in. Yeah, few things I'd like to share with you. Number one, all these thoughts are, 
are resonating in my mind preoperatively. I was thinking on this because this guy is a challenge and he's from another city. He's going to come here and do the surgery and go back and knowing with his mental setup. When I went through deeply, I kept calling him back uh, every time. So when he said that the second surgery, he was very, very compliant and did all the physio. And I said, you didn't go to the gym. No, I didn't. But I did. But I didn't do anything with the left hand. But I did everything with the right hand. <laughs> so, you understand? So, this guy, uh, this I is the kind of makeup. But it's important because this is the third surgery. We have to be very particular in what we're doing. And uh, so, clearly, we need to offer him a repair. Maybe the last time we need some augmentation there in some form or the other. And can I be Sir, the, Ashish, can I get it is the open with craft jacket, maybe ideal. Yeah, so this was the uh, this was a case that was just before the patch was launched in India, and so it was just a couple of months. It was still coming in, so we didn't have the opportunity for a patch, and so it's not available. So we don't, we're not doing the patch now. Can I be the devil's advocate here? So, so for the audience, this is not a muscle advancement case because the <coughs> stump length is less than 15 millimeters. You can't advance this. So that's number one. The second thing is, in my experience, a patch and an SCR doesn't fix a patient who's mad. This guy is psychotic. Like, you keep doing an operation, it doesn't matter. Like, you keep going to the gym, you keep rupturing it. The chance of him doing that again is very high. So, I agree with the thing about the debridement and the biopsy. And in some patients like this, I just say, I want to biopsy it. I go and debride everything. I do a bicep stenodesis. We do a suprascapular nerve release, and you just let them be. So in some of the cases which I've had type two ruptures where the subscap and infra is intact, and the biceps has been tenodized, if you rehab them for six to nine months, they actually improve. So I, in my hands, I'm not gonna go back and do strike three, because if the patient's non-compliant, you'll have a dead patch which might get infected with almost the same result. So for me, I'm not operating on these guys. I'll send it to all my other colleagues here. Ashish, Ashish you are just jealous because he's going more than you to the gym. Yeah. This is the point, you are jealous. <laughs> guys, we need to move but on. So Ashish, there, is, there are know. more cases to discuss can, here. Can, can I just say, so could you just come back on the previous? Because Ashish, you said that there was a huge retraction and this, what you say is interesting because we, we just, we, it's an article that is in press in asthma. There, there is, it's a five millimeters retraction. It's nothing. Uh, because you don't want to bring, you don't want to bring the, the, the stump back to the lateral part of the greater tuberosity. Traction here. All I said is I agree with, I, I, if you scope this patient, in my experience, and I would scope him, rule out an infection, and you pull it. I think I agree with what Dinshaw is saying. The stump length will be so small, and it's muscular tenderness. And Christian Gerber has shown this, and there's a lot of people who've shown this. If your stump length is less than one and a half centimeter, your retail rate's almost 90%. Yes, but the, Dominic Meyer, but in the study of Dominic Meyer and Christian Gerber, they were studying a reattachment of the tendon on the bone. And this is not the case. You will do side to side. So this do not apply to this particular situation. What you probably have a one centimeter length stump. We're just trying to do, make an MRI look better for pain, right? 